Hi guys, I want to invite you to join the Patreon where you will get some benefits as well as audiobooks that will not be uploaded on YouTube. Chapter 1. Line up boys. For the last five years we have trained and trained and trained. Now is the time for you all to put this training in a trial of fire. The one talking was a clone in a set of armor. The armor had dark red and brown patterns on the chest and arms, with strips of it covering the middle section of the hand. However, the clone's most distinguishing feature was his helmet. It was covered with brown panting on top, and there were two stylized ox horns on the front. Although the armor was as shiny as the one any other clone was wearing, it gave off a strong and dignified vibe. Before he was twenty-five rows, each one with twenty clones. The clone took a step to the side and said. Now pay attention to General D. He wants to say a few things before we set off. A man with orange skin came from behind the clone talking. He had small thorns all over his face and his skin looked cracked. The man, Anikto, wore brown robes with a black belt. Hanging on the belt was a metallic stick, carefully crafted to fit his hand. The Nikto looked at the clones and presented himself. Thank you Commander Keeley. I am Jedi Master Imagun D. You can call me General D, as Keeley here seems to like. General D paused for a moment and looked at the clones in the first row. Men, you are clones and you were breed for battle. You were breed to fight for the Republic. However, you are also a person. You have desires and emotions like anyone else. So, if you want to let those emotions out and become true citizens of the Republic we have to finish this war as soon as possible. Understood? Hundreds of voices replied at the same time. Sir, yes sir. After the small presentation General Dean Commander Keeley walked along the rows of men, doing some small talk with them. Suddenly an officer ran to General D and said something to him. Sir, Admiral Dow just received the order. We are ready to go. General D thanked the officer before turning and saying something to Commander Keeley. Keeley listened and went back to the front. Attention. All right boys, we are good to go. Everyone check your weapons and get on the lot gunships. Now. Commander Keeley, together with General D and twenty or so troopers. With a low sound, the doors of the lower hangar of the destroyer they were opened and the lot started pouring down. Chapter 2 CT-4063 could hear laser shots and explosions all around him, but inside the lot and with the doors closed he could only imagine what was happening outside. As for now the only thing he knew was for whose side he was fighting for. He looked down to his weapon, a DC-15A long blaster rifle, the clone army standard weapon. During his training he was told countless times that his weapon is his life. That a clone without his weapon is a dead clone. Moving his eyes up he saw a clone helmet, identical to his. He could not see the face under the helmet, but he didn't need to. It was the same face he saw every day after he woke up for the last five years. He, like the other twenty-nine clones on the lot, and also like the millions of clones that were taking part on the war, was a clone. Breed on Kamino, clones were copies of the bounty hunter Django Fett. Ten years before Jedi Master Xiphovias has gone to Kamino and paid the Kaminoans to make the strongest army the galaxy have ever seen. This way the clones were born. The clone in front of CT-4063, CT-4198 punched him on the shoulder. Hey brother. What are you thinking so much for? All we have to do is destroy some droids and then we are done here. Yeah, yeah. Let's make it quick. I don't want to waste too much time here and lose everything General D talked about. This got a few laughs from the surrounding clones, but after that they stood quiet. Jokes apart, they were going to their first combat, and they weren't sure if they would make it out. Or if their brothers would. Every time CT-4063 looked at his brothers a strong feeling of belonging took over him. He would give his life for them, and he was sure that they would hive theirs for him. This feeling wasn't just the camaraderie of brothers who spent their whole life together, there was also an even bigger loyalty to his commanders and the Jedi. But stronger than anything was his loyalty to a figure in his mind. 
although he couldn't see it clearly, he would do anything to this person. Sometimes he had dreams about it. More like nightmares. That image would ask him to do something terrible, like killing his brothers, but in the dreams he did it with a smile. The communication device on the surgeon's wrist whistled, taking him all away from his thoughts. From it the voice of Commander Keeley come. Surgeon, we are under heavy fire. Land your lot now or you will be blown to pieces. Right away sir. Pilot, get us to the ground. Chapter 3 CT-4063 could feel the lot turning to the left and the going down. He braced himself using the sides of the lot. The noise of the explosions was getting louder by the second. Now it was almost impossible to distinguish between each of them. There was a big explosion and the thought he heard a scream. Probably his imagination. The red lights of the lot painted everything on a shade of red. The surgeon was barking orders, but CT-4063 couldn't hear them. Realizing his men weren't listening to him the surgeon left his station. He started making his way throughout the clones, patting one here and there and saying something to calm them. There was another explosion, this one louder than the others. CT-4063 felt a gust of hot wind on his face. And then the surgeon was gone. I took a few seconds for him to realize that a rocket or a laser beam had hit the right side of the lot, blasting it into pieces. The surgeon, together with five or six clones has been thrown throughout the hole. CT-4063 barely had time to react before the pilot voice sounded on the speakers. We are hit. I repeat, we are hit. Squad leader, we are going down. Everyone, hold on to something. Looking throughout the whole CT-4063 could see hundreds, maybe thousands, of lots flying. Big explosions were going on everywhere, and the green lasers from the lots and the red ones from the droids were obstructing the sky. He saw lots blowing up, hit by ground-to-air rockets, some even hitting others. In the middle of the mess he saw some ships shaped as half cones, with a round cabin between the halves. They were called solar sailors, used by the native Geonosians. The planet of Geonosis was where the invasion was taking place. When Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi discovered a massive number of Separatist ships and droid factories he reported to the Jedi Council. However, before he could return he, together with Jedi Padwan Anakin Skywalker and Senator Amidala, were captured. The Jedi mobilized a big number of Jedi Masters, but they were surrounded by droids. Master Yoda rescued them at the last second with the first batch of clones that arrived on Geonosis. That was all that CT-4063 and the other clones were told by Commander Keeley just before they entered the planet airspace. If they were able to conquer Geonosis before the Separatists' leaders could flee then the first battle of the war might be the last one. All of this came back to his head in a moment, just before their lot gunship hit the ground hard. Chapter 4 the lot landed on Geonosian ground belly first. The lot bounced on the ground like a rock thrown on a lake. One unlucky trooper flew out the hole on the side, and hit the ground at a speed of more than 400 kilometers. CT-4063 didn't want to know what happened to him. Finally they stopped. CT-4063 only felt a slight pain on his left ribs, besides this he was fine. Many of his brothers weren't so lucky. He could hear many painful moans. If not for the hole on the side, which let a little light in the lot would be totally dark. He tried standing up and hit his head hard on what looked like a box of supplies that was hanging over. Since he knew those boxes were supposed to be locked on the side of the ship, he thought they were most probably leaning on the side. There was some movement on the other end of the gunship, and a voice he recognized as his squad leader called. Who is able to walk? CT-4063 answered promptly. CT-4063 reporting sir. I am. Good, I need you to go check the pilots and take a look outside. See if there is any immediate danger. The rest of you check who is still alive, take the injured and get ready to go as soon as CT-4063 gives the clear signal. Making his way over the bodies of dead and injured clones, CT-4063 arrived at the cockpit. He first checked the pilots, one was still alive, and then looked over the shattered window. There were no droids in sight, but
but about three clicks west he saw what he identified as a destroyed ATE. Putting the injured pilot arm over his shoulders he made his way back to the cargo compartment. There were five or so troopers up and another seven leaning on the walls. CT-4099, the squad leader was giving orders. CT-4063 dropped the pilot with another clone and walked over to him. Sir, no droids in a five clicks radius, but three clicks west there is a burning ATE. It's too far away to see if there are any clones. Good job. All right, we need to go now. Those who can walk help the injureds and let's go. CT-4063 picked up his DC-15A and crawled through the hole that was half buried in the soil. Putting his weapon out first, he waited a few seconds. Although he had not seen any droid, the planet was under their rule, at least for now. He wouldn't joke with his life or his brother's lives. Chapter 5 Another clone crawled through the hole. Have you seen anything CT-4063? Not yet, but we better have a look around before we tell the others to come out. He and the other clones spent ten minutes looking for any hiding droids, and after founding none they told the other clones to come out. There were sixteen of them, five uninjured or almost, eight suffered light injuries, but were still able to walk. The other three had fainted due to heavy injuries. Squad leader CT-4099 took out a binocular and looked the way the fallen at TE was. I can't see anyone, clones or droids. CT-4063, you and CT-4087 go ahead and make sure everything is clear. Yes sir. CT-4063 and the other clone, CT-4087 were zero. Two clicks away from the at TE. They were advancing carefully going from cover to cover. Now they could see the whole at TE. It was turned sideways to them and destroyed. There were many craters around it. On the ground near it there was a clone, probably thrown from the top cannon after it exploded. CT-4063 went to check on him. He is dead. CT-4087 go check inside the at TE. I will keep watch outside and see what I can find. While CT-4087 went inside he started making his way around the ATE. Now he could see that at least six rocket shots have hit it, one of them directly hitting the top cannon and killing the poor clone. All dead here CT-4063. From the looks of it the droids came in to finish the job. The voice of CT-4087 came through the shattered front window, but CT-4063 was paying more attention to what was in front of him they've put up a good fight. There are at least 40 of those droids, as well as two of the Geonosians. It was a shocking scene, although he had been trained to cope with much worse. The droids were in pieces, blown by the cannon, or shot with the laser cannons, in which case there was a hole on them. Man, those bugs are disgusting. CT-4087 complained about the two Geonosians' bodies, so torn apart that there was green blood all over the dead droids. He was about to talk more, but CT-4063 made him shut up with a hand sign. Pointing ahead, he and CT-4087 hid behind a rock. Coming out of somewhere was a squad of ten droids, and leading them was a B-2 super battle droid. Gray and way bigger than the other droids, he was quiet, while the others were talking in their mechanical voice. R1, P3, why are we back here? We have already eliminated all the clones here. R1-J4, the commander received an order to investigate a crashed Republic gunship. Finally the super battle droid spoke. Shut up you idiots. Itch itch. Itch itch. There are clones ahead. Prepare. Itch itch. For battle. Chapter 6. CT-4063 and CT-4087 looked at each other. The droids could only be talking about one group of clones. CT-4087 wanted to fire the moment he heard them, but CT-4063 pulled him. Wait. There are too many for just us two. Let them pass, then we shoot. That way we should be able to take out three or four before they turn. After explaining his plans to CT-4087, CT-4087 took out his communicator. Squad leader, there is a bunch of droids going your way. They have already seen you. 
you need to find some cover now. CT-4087 and I will shoot them from behind as soon as they start firing. Okay then. I hope you and CT-4087 have good aim, otherwise we are dead. CT-4063 could hear him barking orders Eben before he switched off the communicator. Making a sign to CT-4087, both started to rotate around the rock they were hitting. As the droids passed through their left they crouched to the right. After they passed CT-4063 and CT-4087 showed their heads over the rock. Both were using the clone's army trusted weapon, the long version of DC-15A. The droids marched for 400 meters before the B-2 super battle droid gave the firing order. Instantly red lasers started hitting the rocks where squad leader CT-4099 and the other clones were. Luckily, thanks to CT-4063 timely warning they were already crouching behind rocks. Although CT-4063 was almost one kilometer away from the clone's position he could clearly see that only one of the clones was hit. CT-4087, now. The moment he gave the order he himself started shooting. Blue laser fire left his weapon, hitting the back of the leftmost B-1 battle droid. Without even waiting he fired on the next one, this time he was too anxious and his shot grazed the side of the droid. Although the DC-15A had a 5 km range, the majority of the clones were accurate at most in a 350 to 400 meters range. CT-4063 being able to hit a droid on his first try was thanks to 5 years of training and him being on a stable position. On his side CT-4087 have hit another two. Now the droids had turned and started firing. CT-4063 dropped to the ground, rock shards and dust flying around him. He crawled to the right side, exchanging positions with CT-4087. They waited for five seconds and then appeared on the side of the rock. The droids were firing at the top, so they had a small window to shoot, which they used. In less than three seconds three droids have fallen, but they were forced back to cover before they could fire again, by a huge amount of red lasers. At this moment squad leader CT-4099 and the other six clones who were able to shoot started doing it, and the remaining four B-1 droids plus the B-2 super battle droid were caught in a crossfire. Chapter 7 The battle that followed lasted for no more than 20 seconds, but it was intense. First the droids, stupid as ever, spent a moment figuring out where to shoot. That was enough for one of the B-1 get obliterated. Deciding that CT-4063 side was the weaker one they started marching and firing his way. The E-5 that the droids used were able to rapid fire, losing on accuracy but gaining on damage. Plus the fact that droids usually win by overwhelming their enemies with numbers, the E-5 and them were a perfect combination. The B-2 super battle droid was also a big problem. His double wrist laser blasters and thick armor made him equal to three B-1 droids. CT-4063 and CT-4087 were only able to stay hidden, but the squad leader was doing a good job, directing his men to pick the droids one by one. The lasers coming from the droids lessened considerably, and they judged safe to come out. The only droid left was the B-2 unit. CT-4087 took aim and fired, his shot hitting the target. Seeing this he came out of cover, his hands already up in commemoration. Only to be hit ten by a rocket directly on the face. CT-4087. No oh. CT-4063, who just saw one of his brothers die, jumped out and fired a stream of lasers on the B-2, melting part of his metallic face. He only stopped when he was sure it was dead. On his feet was a deformed clone helmet. Squad leader CT-4099, who had seen everything consoled him. He was a good soldier. But he was also overconfident. Those wrist rockets are deadly even to the ATS. Don't let his courage be in vain by dying here. Two hours later they finally saw the big battle. For the next few kilometers there were hundreds of clone and droids corpses. Fallen ATS, lots, dwarf spider droids, hailfer and AATs were everywhere. There were shells holes everywhere, and on the places where the hailfire volleys had hit the clone death toll was in the dozens. For any other person it would have been as terrifying as hell, 
but for the genetically modified clones it was normal, even though they haven't seen such a scene before. Even so, walking amid the cold corpses of their fallen brothers wasn't a good feeling. Thankfully there was a clone command center not too far away. Fourteen surviving clones, CT-4087 and a trooper by the number CT-4298 had died, made their way to there. The closer they got the louder it was. By the time they arrived they could already see the fight. The droids were on full retreat, but the clones were taking heavy casualties. Every second clones were falling. CT-4099 left his subordinates with a medic clone and ordered CT-4063 to go with him to the command plotiform. On the plotiform were two clone surgeons and one lieutenant. Squad leader CT-4099 and CT-4063 saluted. Squad leader CT-4099 reporting sir. The lieutenant glanced at him and turned back to the battle ahead. Good to see you CT-4099, but I need you to talk fast. We are in the middle of a war. You and your squad, together with another two squads should have been here long ago. We thought you were dead. What happened? Chapter 8 We were shot down as soon as we left the cruiser. After we crashed CT-4063 here found an ATE. We made our way there, but they were already dead. Unluckily for us, or for them, we found the droid squad who eliminated them. We eliminated them, but lost two men. The squad leader reported, and that took the lieutenant attention. You only lost two men to eliminate 10B1 and 1B2. That's impressive. CT-4099, there was a surgeon and two squad leaders in your lot. I assume they are dead. Yes. We lost the surgeon and 18 others, including one pilot. Honestly, if it wasn't for CT-4063 we would have lost more. The lieutenant looked at CT-4063 after hearing that. A clone killing a bunch of droids wasn't surprising, but being praised as the reason the others were alive is unusual. Seems like we have a good soldier here. CT-4063 right. As you have noticed we have a big battle going on. From what CT-4099 said you have some skills. Congratulations, you are now a squad leader. That really came as a surprise to CT-4063, but he was fast in thanking the lieutenant. The lieutenant sent CT-4099 away to take care of his men. Next he turned to CT-4063. CT-4063, you will take command of Hell Squad. They lost their leader on the last push we did. Pick them up and go to the left flank. Lieutenant Thayer could use help there. Go now. Yes sir. Thank you sir. It was easy to find his new squad. They were already waiting for him, weapons loaded. As soon as he arrived they saluted him. We are ready for battle sir. It was quite strange for CT-4063 to receive such respect. Just a few minutes before he was on the same place as those clones. There were ten clones, making up a normal squad. They stood tall, with their DC-15A leaning on their shoulder, helmets off, in the standard ready position. Their haircuts were different, some with short military style, others totally shaved. But their features were the same. I was impossible to look at them and think they were anything other than clones. CT-4063 took off his helmet. He thought it would be good that his men knew his face, even if it was the same as theirs. I would like to make a speech here, but Lieutenant Thayer is in trouble. I know you just lost your squad leader, but now is not the time to mourn. I want each of you to get at least five droid kills for him. The last one to do so cleans the weapons after the battle. Any questions? With a grin a clone numbered CT-2891 raised his hand. It is a competition then. Are you also participating sir? I sure am. All right hell squad. It's time to eliminate some droids. Chapter 9 If one looked the battlefield from the air the first thing he would see was a mess of laser fire and explosions. The battle on the skies was as intense as the one on the ground. Many of the lots were shot down as soon as they left the cruisers. Geonosian solar sailors and separatist vulture droids were targeting the newly departed lots. 
That way they would be able to take out dozens of clones each time they hit one. Knowing that they couldn't let their fully boarded gunships fall as the droids pleased, all of the empty lot and acclimator class cruisers were focusing their laser fire and missiles on the nearest separatist fighters. Now, if the person looked through the sky battle, to the ground, they would see the same amount of laser fire and explosions, but this time there were also many small black dots, with a few larger ones mixed. Looking even closer one would notice that the black dots were divided. The two sides looked as if they were playing a game, one side running and the other chasing. The big dots were now all kinds of tanks, shooting, exploding and burning. Now, after another look the person would notice that the running dots were thousands of robots. With a red-brown camouflage, the B-1 droids would be almost inconspicuous on Geonosian ground if it wasn't for all the fire their E-5 were letting off. On the other hand, the chasing black dots were not black anymore. White armors marching forward, at least in this battlefield the clones were overpowering the droid army. Part of it was the surprise element the clones had. Droid leaders didn't know about them until they were attacked. However, even though the droids were on full retreat, their mechanic minds knew no fear, so every inch they fell backwards was paid on clone blood. Zooming in one last time one is able to see that in the back of the clones lines a new group, of about 300 fresh and well-rested clones was forming up. Those clones were separated in 30 smaller groups, of 11 each, one leader and 10 soldiers. Grabbing their blasters nervously, they put on their white helmets and under some soundless order started marching forward. The march soon turned to running as they entered the outskirts of the battle. It didn't take long for the battle droids to notice them. Lasers started coming, and the clones were quick to respond. Thanks to the longer range of the DC-15 as droids started falling first. Until one of the AAT turned in the clone's direction. The first shot missed. The second shot landed a few meters to the right. The third shot hit bullseye. Sand and soil flew everywhere. One of the clone squads was lying on the ground. Many of them were groaning, but some were totally still. The A-8 fired a fourth time. Chapter 10 The A-8 shot one more time, making another group of clones scatter. CT-4063 took cover behind the flaming remains of a dwarf spider droid. We need to take that thing down or it will eliminate us all. Where is the bazooka? One of the clones gestured backwards. On the sand 40 meters away was an RPS-6 rocket launcher. On the middle of the battle it was impossible to get to it. There is no way we can get that back sir. Anyone who tries will become a sieve. CT-4063 had to think fast. His men lives were depending on him coming up with a plan. His head was buzzing. There was too much noise for him to think. Ah! One of Hell Squad men was down. On the middle of the white helmet was a hole. Even through his own helmet CT-4063 could smell the scent of cauterized flesh. That clicked something on his mind. Seeing one of the clones under his command, one of his brothers, die because he could not think fast enough was brutal. He had to do something. And he did. CT-2981, contact the leaders of Onyx and Melt squads. They are closer to our position. We will need their cover fire if we want my plan to work. And what plan is that sir? You will know. Now do it. Fast. CCT-2981 took out his communicator. Even under his helmet he could sense that CT-4063 was about to do something crazy. This is CT-2981 from Hell Squad. We need support now. We are going to take down this AAT. Through the communicator came a doubtful voice. Do you have a plan Hell Squad? CT-2981 looked at his commander, who gave him affirmative nod. He hesitated a little before answering. We do. But we need your help now. We are going. CT-4063 looked to the AAT. It was a hundred or so meters away, ahead of the droid's line. There were some B-1 battle droids and four B-2 super battle droids around it. He needed to clear those first if he wanted to be alive after his plan. While he was looking the AAT fired again, this time somewhere to his left and behind. 
from the screams it had gotten another hit. Fifteen meters to his right and about twelve to his left the members of Onyx and Melt squads arrived, not without losing one or two members. Their leaders noted at him and started in ganging the droids. He looked around. Eight members of Hell Squad were there. They have lost two before even making it to their objective. That was not a good start. He beckoned to CT-2981. Start with the cover fire as soon as I go. Those droids need to be dead before I get to the AAT. Sir, what are you thinking? Let me go with you. Wait. CT-2981 couldn't even finish before CT-4063 jumped over the dead dwarf spider droid and started running to the AAT. Chapter 11 CT-4063 jumped over his cover and immediately started sprinting. Behind him CT-2981 stopped cursing his craziness and ordered the others to fire. Blue laser flashing by him, he himself firing, it didn't take long for the droids protecting the AAT to fall. The droid lines were too far to get accurate shots, so the only danger he was facing at the moment was the AAT. Not that it was little danger. The cannon of the AAT aimed at him. Through the black hole on the tip of the cannon barrel he could see a red glow building. He waited to the last second before making a sharp turn right and diving behind a boulder. Bam! On the place he was before there was now scorched earth. He had escaped this time, but now the AAT knew where he was. He had few seconds before it fired again, and this time he wouldn't be able to dodge. He sneaked a glance over the boulder. The cannon was aimed at him. To make things worse there was a droid squadron, about a hundred of them, coming to support it. Laser fire was pouring on the AAT, doing little to no damage to it. There was nothing his brothers could do to help him. He had two options now. Continue charging, maybe taking out the AAT and most probably dying. Or he could try to make his way back, and most probably die together with his brothers. Others might have chosen the second option, but not he. He was a clone, sacrificing his life for the greater good was his nature. If he could do that without endangering any of his brothers it was even better. So he charged. Firing like crazy he run the last 30 meters. Although he was zigzagging to dodge the shots, the AAT followed him like an insistent bug. But it was another bug saved his life. From one of the many natural towers on the battlefield a green halo flew. It was one of the Geonosian's weapons, a LR-1K sonic cannon. Its shots exploded on contact. Normally it would have been devastating, damaging everything around. But this time, as the sonic blast hit the ground near him he was thrown out of the way of the AAT shot. His body was launched over five meters, and he landed on his side. His left shoulder made a sickening crack sound. His head was buzzing and his vision turbid, but he knew that if he stayed there either LR-1K or the AAT would fire again. Bidding his lips in pain he got up, his left arm hanging on the side. The AAT was now less than 10 meters from him. He left his DC-15A on the ground, he couldn't fire anyway, and reached for a V-1 thermal detonator. With the AAT recharging it was easy to reach it. He jumped on the front of part of the AAT and stretched for the cannon barrel. With a soft click the thermal detonator was activated. He put it inside the barrel and let it roll down on its own. CT-4063 jumped from the AAT and run as far as possible while counting the seconds. One. Two. Three. Bomb. Like the most fascinating of fireworks the AAT exploded from the inside. A heat wave passed by him. He had done what he needed to do. But he didn't have the time to celebrate, as the squadron of droids he had seen before was already in front of him. Their weapons clicked as they prepared to shoot. CT-4063 picked the nearest weapon, a Geonosian sonic blaster and aimed as well as he could with one broken arm. Chapter 12 CT-4063 was looking up tight to the droids. He squeezed the sonic blaster, although he probably wouldn't be able to pull the trigger before becoming a pile of carbonized clone. Suddenly an lot flew above them at neck-breaking speed. The lot fired all its missiles at the tower where the LR-1K was. The over 30 meters tall tower was instantly reduced to rubble. 
A cloud of dust rose, and CT-4063 couldn't see a thing. Somewhere above him the noise of the lot appeared again. He should have run at this moment, taking advantage of the distraction to run. But a feeling of calm washed over him, as if he couldn't be harmed at that moment. He only had that feeling once before, earlier that day, when Commander Keeley and General D were talking. Up on the cloud of dust, where he thought the lot was, a glowing green stick lit up. He thought it was a strange action, as the glowing stick would become a beacon to where the droids could direct their fire. Until he heard the droids screaming. Jedi. There is a Jedi. All units, fire on him. Eliminate the Jedi scam. The green light, or rather, the lightsaber seemed to drop down from the lot, more than twenty meters above the ground. Droid screams sounded as the lightsaber danced in the middle of the dust. Where is he? Oh, found him. Ah. R1, W3, where are yo? Arg. Don't panic. It's just a Jedi. If. Just. He. Stopped. So. I. Can. Shoot. Him. As the dust settled, all that was left from more than a hundred droids was scrap metal. The only droid left fired a few times before the green lightsaber trespassed him and ripped to the right, almost cutting it in two. As the droid fell a figure no more than one and a half meters stood on it place. The lightsaber disappeared with a buzz and the face of the figure was totally revealed. He had big pointed ears and a hard look on his face. The most eye-catching of all was the scar crossing from his forehead to his cheek, and over where his left eye should have been. The lot landed on the ground, and before long many more arrived. The clones on them swiftly made a defensive perimeter, making sure every droid on 300 meters was either dead or running. A lieutenant jumped of the latest arrived lot and went to the small Jedi, who started giving orders. Lieutenant, move your command center to here, and make sure that no droids are left behind us. I want a list with every high-value target near here and our casualties. I need to know how many men we can send without risking a counterattack. Hey! You trooper! Yes you! Where do you think you are putting those detonators? Distribute them! The Jedi was really rigid, making CT-4063 think that anyone under his command probably lived trying to avoid him. The lieutenant left the Jedi's side and went in CT-4063 direction. I am Lieutenant Thayer. I saw what you did to that AAT trooper. Very bold. And very brave but I doubt that was your target. What are you doing here? Actually, my squad and another ten were sent here to give you support, but that AAT gave us quite a headache. In the end you saved us. It doesn't matter. You did a really good job. And you had it hard, I see. Later you go find someone to take a look at that arm of yours. But now prepare yourself. General Peel wishes to speak with you. That can be worse than fighting a thousand droids. Chapter 13 Talking with General Peel can be worse than fighting a thousand droids. Lieutenant Thayer patted CT-4063 on his good shoulder and walked away. CT-4063 made his way to where the Master Jedi was. The small lawn Nick was still giving orders and butchering any distracted clone with his words. Lieutenant Thayer said you wanted to talk with me General. Yes. I am Master Even Peel. We received word from the command center that your group seemed to be stuck with problems. That droid tank I presume. I have to say you were very. Creative. I like it, but I like it even better when you don't die while you are at it. From this CT-4063 could see that although General Peel was very serious he was still a Jedi, caring for the others. Now go find someone to heal that arm of yours. I can't let such a fine soldier become handicapped. Yes sir. CT-4063 turned and left, but General Peel called him once again. Trooper. Do you have a name? I mean a real name, not a bunch of numbers. No I don't sir. Hum. And under who you are serving? Commander Keeley and General D sir. That old man. Ha. He and I are good friends, I'm sure he won't mind that I do him a little favor. 
When you meet him again say that Master Peel gave you a real name. And which name is this sir? From now on you are no longer CT 4063, the squad leader, but Hell Squad leader Dager. 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 Thank you sir. I will be sure to tell him. CT 4063, Dager now, first went to find his squad. He talked to CT 2891, who had become something like a deputy to him. CT 2981, what are Hell Squad casualties? We lost CT 2976 and CT 2894, sir. Also, CT 2876, CT 2893, and CT 2845 will be out of the battlefield for some time, sir. They got hit pretty hard, especially CT 2845. The doctors aren't sure he will survive. I also will be out of the battle for a few days. Meanwhile you are in command of Hell Squad, unless command send someone to take my place. Yes sir. Good recovery sir. Thanks. Also, before I forget, my name now is Dager. CT 2981 smiled. Okay sir. After that he went to talk with the rest of his squad, and bid his farewell. He and the other wounded clones would take a gunship to one of the cruisers, where they would be immersed a few days on a Bacta tank, accelerating their recover. Of course he didn't forget to tell them his new name. He was quite proud to be named by a Master Jedi. His time on the Bacta tank passed in torpor. Before long he was on back on a lot, descending to Geonosis. The invasion had progressed really well. On the entirety of the planet Republic forces were advancing. However, it was said that Count Dooku and Poggle escaped, together with many other important CIS leaders. If this was true Dager could predict that the war would go on for a lot more than expected. Now, holding on the loops of the lot, Dager looked through the contents of a tablet. According to it, there was now only one massive droid factory on the south hemisphere of Geonosis that was still holding on. The clone army wasn't able to invade it because of the huge number of droids and narrow chalk points. They also couldn't bomb it, because the chief of the factory, a Geonosian bug called Tharg sent a hologram of two captured Jedis. They were identified as Jin Altus and Depa Balaba. Hell Squad was part of a massive offense mounted to cover the operations of a so-called Delta Squad that had already destroyed three droid factories with minimum casualties. Chapter 14 Dajer Lot landed on the command center. There were dozens of thousands of clones joining this last attack. If they won this battle it would signify the capture of Geonosis and the first victory of the Grand Army of the Republic. The place they were attacking was gigantic. The factory occupied dozens of square kilometers, but the only place the clones could attack was the front gate. The whole factory was protected by an energy shield, so unless someone from inside took out the shield generator, it would be a massacre for the clone infantry to take it. An orbital strike would be able to easily, destroy the shield, but they could only fire after the Jedis were rescued. Dajer was informed that he was to find the general in command of the attack, Jedi Master Mace Windu. He found Mace Windu looking at a hologram table, in which the factory and the clones surrounding it were represented on 3D. Around the table were five other people wearing long brown robes. Jedi Masters. There was also a number of clones, all of them lieutenants or higher ranked. Dajer wasn't sure why he, a mere squad leader was called to this meeting. He stood at the back. Mace Windu acknowledged his arrival with a nod, but kept quiet. Not much later a group of four clone arrived. They were different from the other clones. Their armor was much bigger and looked much heavier. Their armor was also full of blaster marks, as if they were shoot but kept going. Probably the armor was too thick, so normal blasters couldn't drill their way through. Another difference was the color of their armor. From everything Dajer knew, all clones, be it soldiers, squad leaders, sergeants, lieutenants, or captains should have the same white armor, with small differences depending on the rank. The only exception was the commanders. And now those clones. The armor of the one leading them was orange on the upper part of his right chest and on his right shoulder. His helmet had a vertical orange strip in the middle. The clone on the left had an almost entirely green armor, and on his back was a mechanical bag of sorts. 
On the middle was a clone with a black armor, with yellow patches on the arms and legs. His chest was white, but full of scorched marks. The last clone had random blood-red splashes of paint. All of them were using different variations of the DC-17 MICWS, the best weapon any clone could dream of. The orange clone was using the dual pistol variation, the green one using the blaster rifle variation, the black and yellow with the grenade launcher variation and finally the red one with the sniper variation. All about them, be it their armors, their weapons, or the way they walked showed they were no common squad. Mace Windu started the meeting asking a question to the newly arrived squad. Delta Squad. How did the last mission go? There was a lot of fire, many dead droids and Scorch got the chance to blow a lot of things. All in all it was very good. The orange clone didn't have much courtesy while speaking. Not that he didn't respect the Jedi, but the lack of sirs showed that his position was much higher than the others around the hologram table. Master Windu didn't seem phased by it. Good, because I need you in your best state for your next assignment. Our objective is to take down Tharg, destroy his factory and rescue his Jedi captives. We have already sent a few hundred clones, but their defenses are too thick, and they had to retrat. Boss, you and Delta Squad are to go and save Masters Jin and Depa. Chapter 15 I got it, but how are we supposed to make it past their defenses? The orange clone, boss, didn't look surprised that he was assigned such a dangerous and seemingly impossible task. Opposite to that, he asked for more details, for what Master Windu showed the big army behind him. We are going to do a frontal attack. The only entry point is the front gate. Our army will eliminate the first defenses, after that fixer should be able to open the gate. If he can't then you get Scorch to blow it up. After that Delta Squad go rescue the prisoners. When they are out we blow the factory to pieces. This time the one who asked a question was the black and yellow one, Scorch. And how are you going to blow it? Unless we take that shield generator out, but we can't do that and save the prisoners. You have to choose one sir. And I know which one it is. And if we save the prisoners, but don't destroy the shield generator then your only option is an orbital strike, but that could take days to prepare. Yeah. That is where my other squad enters. General Windu looked at Dager. He beckoned him, and as Dager walked to the front every eye was on him. Yes General. Dager, even in the time you were recovering Hell Squad have distinguished themselves. I can only imagine how they will perform with their leader back. Master Peel and Lieutenant Thayer speak highly of the way you took out an AAT. I hope you can live up to my expectations. I will do my best sir. I know. If you don't you won't be able to make it out of the factory. Fixer, the Delta Squad member with green armor rummaged impatiently. Sir, it's not that I am looking down on Hell Squad, but they aren't clone commandos like us. Are you sure they are up to the task? This strike a nerve on Dager. It might not have been the best choice, but he answered without wanting for General Wind to answer. Fixer right? My squad might not be clone commandos or whatever you are, but General Windu wouldn't have chosen us if we weren't good. Every Jedi and clone on the vicinity was looking at him. Suddenly a loud laughter rang out. It was Sev, the sniper of Delta Squad. Ha 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 ha. I think you got your answer and more fixer. Let's give them a shot. Maybe they will surprise us. Suddenly his tone changed to a serious one. But be warned. If you destroy the shield generator but don't go out in ten minutes we will consider you dead and detonate that factory. General Windu decided it was time to put out the fire. Alrighty, Dager, go find your men. Delta Squad go prepare yourselves. When it is time I will give you the order to go. Let our troops soften them first. Any more questions? Boss had one. As a matter of fact I do sir. Pardon me if I am being disrespectful, but there are six Jedi here. Why send us and Hell Squad on such an important mission? Good question boss. But if Tharg see any Jedi inside the factory chances are that he will eliminate Jin and Depa. Now, Captain Rigger, you and your men. Dager went to find his men. 
What General Windu said about them distinguishing themselves while he was out of action had got him curious. Even though he tried to track them after he got out of the Bacta tank, he didn't have much time before he was called to the meeting. Chapter 16 Hey! CT 2981 Sir! It's good to see you. How is the arm? It's good. How is Hell Squad doing? I heard you have made a name for us. CT 2981 scratched his chin. He looked pensive. Actually sir, I am not sure of what is going on. After we captured that bug I thought we would receive some kind of praise, but command transferred four of our members to other squads. Now there are just you, me, CT, 3004, CT, 2798 and two new troopers, Cell and Dab. I will tell you what is going on later when we meet the rest of the squad. Now tell me about that bug you captured. Turned out that as CT, 2981 and the rest of Hell Squad, still with ten members at the time, were returning from another day of battle on the left flank together with the other clones, they found a semi-destroyed tactical droid. One of the clones from another squad analyzed the information that the tactical droid carried, and discovered that not too far away there was an underground base, where the Geonosian separatist leader Klorkakun was hiding. After informing command they were ordered to go capture Klorkakun if possible, otherwise they were to take him down. However, as they arrived above the droid base they couldn't enter because the three entry points were rigged with bombs. It took one clone life to find that out. They didn't know what to do, until CT-2981 went back to the information the tactical droid provided and found the base plant. Using this information he ordered that detonators were prepared above where Klorkakun was most likely to be. CT-2981 calculations hit jackpot, and Klorkakun didn't have a chance to react before his guards were shot down and he was rendered at gunpoint. Dager was impressed. That was very intelligent of you. You know, I think we should call you Brain. Do you agree? I sure do. Thank you sir. The other four members of the squad were CT-3444 and CT-2798, who were good soldiers, good at following orders, and original members of Hell Squad, and Cell and Dab, the new members. Cell and Dab were transferred from Mace Windu Command. Cell was a specialized scout, while Dab was a sniper, using a DC-15X, one of the most powerful weapons the Republic had. Together they made a pretty good team. It was Dager's job to take all of them and transform them in a flawless group, able to take part on all kinds of missions. That was a process that would take time and lots of battles to work. They were all excited to know their mission, as it showed that command thought they were able to become more than just normal soldiers. Before long the army of clones was called to start the attack. It was an impacting sign, dozens of thousands of clones on white armor marching together. Leading them were six Jedi Masters. Hell Squad was placed not far from the front lines, but also not too near. They wouldn't be the first clones to attack, but it wouldn't look strange when they entered the factory after the gate was broken. All of General Windu plan depended on Tharg not finding out that there were two squads with special missions. Not far from them was Delta Squad, their colorful armor making them stand out. Hopefully that wouldn't get them eliminated. Dager and Boss exchanged nods, and as the army started walking forward, Dager caught himself excited about the battle to come. The Jedi Masters were the first to cross the blue energy shield. Their lightsabers zoomed to life. Windu purple lightsaber was especially eye-catching, but no enemy fire come, contrary to their expectations. It wasn't until more than 2,000 clones have entered the shield that the factory first defensive line came to life. Chapter 17 The first defense of the factory wasn't droids, but Geonosians. They flew out from the factory and from the towers outside it, at the hundreds. During their conquest of Geonosis the clone army have already learned that the bugs like to hide in those towers, so the clones have the towers under their aim the moment they stepped inside the shield. When the Geonosians flew out and the LR-1K started firing, more than a hundred clones shot theirs RPS-6. The rockets hit the nearest towers, bringing them down before the LR-1KS could fire a second time. However, there were many cannons on the towers out of range, so the clone army was still taking losses. But what worried them even more were the Geonosians. 
Their sonic blasters weren't that good of a weapon, and they needed to get really close to use it. But they were able to fly, and hitting them was as difficult as cashing a fly. However, they were still getting kills, and Geonosians were dropping from the sky. Dajer had his DC-15A anchored on his shoulder, and he was firing. He was trying to catch one Geonosian, but he kept dodging his shots, flying in an irregular pattern. Brain. Help me catch that bug. Brain joined him, and another clone from other squad also started shooting. Pinned between three clones the Geonosian couldn't resist much longer, and Dajer finally got him. They continued their advance, and at least for this moment everything seemed to be going according to the plan. They were no more than 400 meters away from the gates, and about 5,000 more clones have penetrated the shield. The Jedi lead by General Windu were absolutely crushing the Geonosian force. Even though there were only six or seven of them, the enemy couldn't take them down. All their shots were reflected or absorbed, and any Geonosian that got too close was pulled using the powers the Jedi had, directly to their lightsabers. Seeing that they wouldn't be able to stop the clone army, the Geonosians started their most terrifying attack method, although it wasn't the most effective. Alone or in pairs, the Geonosians started descending and grabbing clones. Any clone that wasn't fast enough to escape would face one of two outcomes. They were either dropped from a big height, dying instantly, or even worse, they were carried to the factory. On the whole Geonosis battle up to now, none of those captured clones have been found. Even when the separatist bases were cleared, there was no trace of them. Between the clones rumors said that the bugs had a queen, and the captured clones were her food. Ah! Help me! Don't drop me you disgusting B.U. On the whole battlefield screams from the clones could be heard, some stopping abruptly. Dajer was firing, trying to save one of his brothers who was being carried, but he was too late, and the Geonosians took him. To his left he heard someone giving a muffled shout, and then the clone seemed to start arguing with the Geonosians trying to lift him. He turned and saw Boss, the leader of Delta Squad. Ouch! Put me down you little bug. Oh, no you don't. Dajer was about to help, but somehow Boss freed his left arm and grabbed his pistol. He was now being carried by only one Geonosian, who seemed to be struggling with his weight. Boss putted his DC-17M against the Geonosian head and pulled the trigger. The bug head exploded, and Boss dropped and rolled on the ground. Getting up on one fluid movement he picked up his other DC-17M pistol and shot the bug he had shaken off. He looked at Dajer, who was still aiming his weapon at the second Geonosian. Thanks for the good intentions, but it takes more than one or two bugs to take care of me. Chapter 18 If you say so. Dajer wouldn't ever see a clone get hurt or eliminated without doing anything, but that didn't mean that he was a close friend of Delta Squad. The way that Fixer talked about Hell Squad on the meeting had annoyed him quite a bit. Although it wasn't Boss who did it, he as the squad leader had to take responsibility for what his men said, the same way Dajer had with Hell Squad. Apart from that the invasion proceed as normal as an invasion can. They still lost a lot of troopers, but the Jedi were giving a beating on the Geonosians. Dajer risked to say that each Jedi was equal to a hundred men on combat ability alone, but their powers made them worth a lot more. Towers were falling from time to time, the LR-1K sonic cannons on them given quite a headache to the clones. Since Dajer was in the middle of the action he couldn't see all, but from what was happening around him he calculated that the clone army have suffered a thousand or so casualties, between dead and wounded. It took the clones half an hour to advance two hundred more meters. It was at that time that the droid's second defense line came into action. On the factory dozens of what before looked like mud walls broke down to show more LR-1KS. They all pointed to the front lines of the clone force, and fired their green and deadly halos. An entire section of clones was thrown in the air, and amidst them was a Jedi. The deafening noise of the explosions, screams and shots being fired enclosed the whole battlefield. Dajer could see the LR-1KS recharging. In a few seconds they would fire another time. Dab. On it sir. Dab dropped to the ground, using a Geonosian body to support his DC-15X. Cell laid on the ground next to him, and adjusted his binoculars. 296 meters. 
37 degrees. Dab adjusted his aim, took a deep breath and squeezed the trigger. One of the LR-1K had its gunner shot down. However, another Geonosian quickly moved up to take his position. Suddenly one of the other LR-1K exploded. Sev voice came from their left. Aim for their ammunition stock brother. Following Sev tip, Dab fired again, getting an explosion as reward. Before long the other snipers on the battlefield learned the trick, and in a few minutes all the LR-1KS were gone. Tharg probably wasn't expecting his cannons to be destroyed so fast, as there was no response from his side for some time. Seeing that the battle has calmed down, General Windu came to Dajer position. Dajer, boss, now is the time. Go. Delta Squad, let's go. Brain, Hell Squad, come on. Both squads raced the last few hundred meters to the gate with almost no opposition. As soon as they got to the big gate fixer went to the panel and started messing with it. Boss and the rest of his squad took position around fixer, in case anyone tried to stop him. Dajer ordered Hell Squad to do the same, but nothing came. Boss was starting to get impatient. Come on fixer. It is taking too much time. It's not my fault. It will take time. Better let Scorch do it. Scorch you are up. Scorch and Fixer changed positions. From his backpack Scorch took out handful of thermal detonators. He placed them around a smaller door on the left gate. Everyone get away. Ha. Scorch made it sound like it would be a good explosion, but in reality it just made a muffled sound. The gate fell to the inside, revealing a group of surprised droids. Before they could react, Scorch, the closest to the gate, activated another detonator and throwed it in. Ha ha ha, now the fun begins. Chapter 19 Delta Squad entered the factory under the lead of Boss. Behind them was Hell Squad. The detonator that Scorch throwed have destroyed almost all the droids. The few who air left were dealt quickly. The factory corridors were almost entirely dark. The only light was from holes in the ceiling and walls. The walls had many carved entrances on them, that Dager deduced were the Geonosian's sleeping place. They kept walking until Boss ordered stop. He pointed at a hole on the floor. We are going down here. The Jedi prisoners should be at one of the dungeons. Hell Squad, if our information is right the shield generator should be somewhere in front. Good luck. Good luck to you too. Delta Squad members descended on the hole one by one. Now the only thing Hell Squad could do for them was wish good luck and take down the shield. Hell Squad moved on. The corridors were all the same, splitting left, right, up and down. Thanks to the map Delta Squad got who knows where, they didn't get lost. However, something was wrong, and the others knew that. CT 3444 was the first to speak. There is something wrong sir. There were hundreds of bugs out there, but since we got inside we haven't seen either them or the droids, beside those on the gate. I know 3-4. But there is no coming back now. Everyone open your eyes and stay sharp. They walked for ten more minutes, but still there was no sign of any enemy. Cell, who was walking at the front, called. Sir, look at this. The shield generator room was supposed to be here, but instead there is a door. A metal door. A metal door on a Geonosian nest was weird to say the least. Dajer sent CT-2798, who they have started calling Tech as he was good with mechanics. Tech, see if you can open that door. Everyone else, prepare for battle. We don't know what is behind this. There was nothing deadly behind the door, just corridors, this time modern ones, much like the ones on spaceships. Hell Squad looked at each other. The first to break the silence was Brain. Sir, is this what I think it is? Brain, contact General Windu. He needs to know what is in here. However, Brain wasn't able to make the call. All they could hear by the communicator was static. They are jamming our communications sir. Do you think they know we are here? I don't think so. Most probably they are doing that just in case that someone, like us, gets here. But that mean we will have to send someone back. Dab and 3-4, you go back. 
Tell General Windu about this. The rest of Hell Squad come with me. We still have to destroy the shield generator. Yes sir. Dab and 3-4 turned and went back the way they have come. Dager, Brain, Tech and Cell started making their way on the new corridor. There were many doors on the side, leading to rooms or more corridors. They stopped by a panel on the wall. Tech, see if you can get us the path to the shield generator room. I don't want to run aimless here. Who knows how many droids there are here. Dejer words soon proved right, as the sound of metallic feet marching echoed. Silence. Cell, give me one of those droid poppers. You take another one. We have to take them quietly, otherwise a whole army will be on to us. Dejer and Cell made their way to the turn the corridor made. The sound of the droid patrol got closer. Dejer counted to three on his fingers and throwed the electromagnetic pulse grenade, EMP, on the middle of the unsuspecting droids. Cell did the same. Whoa. What is this? Auk. Chapter 20. Six deactivated B1 droids were lying on the floor. Hell Squad have taken care of those quietly, but they might not be so lucky the next time, or maybe another patrol would find them. There were too many variables, so Hell Squad had to do their job fast. Got it sir. According to the plant the shield generator room is 12 floors above us. Tech had a hologram projecting from the panel. On the spherical image he pointed their position and the shield generator room. Also sir, their jammer is on the same floor. We can take care of it on the way. We have to take the first elevator we find. I only don't know how are we going to stay undercover. There must by thousands of droids. You are right. But they don't know that we are here yet. There is an entire clone army out there. If I were on command I would mobilize all of the droids and prepare for attack, even more if this really is what we think it is. Dejer was right. They only encountered one more patrol during their way to the shield generator room. The droid poppers took care of them nicely. Problem only arrived when they got to their objective. Guarding the shield generator room were 6B2 super battle droids and 10B1 battle droids. Brain looked over the corner to them. We don't have that much EMP sir. The only way to get there is battle. But we have to make sure the Jedi are out before we do that. I suggest we deactivate their jammer, contact Delta Squad. When they are ready we blast those droids. That would work, but how do we get out before they are on to us? Maybe we won't sell. Now let's do as Brain said. Deactivating the jammer was easy. Tech just used two minutes to put it out, and another two to put their communicators back on motion. Dager contacted Boss. Boss. Do you hear me? I do Dager. What is it? We are almost out of the factory. Good. Did the rescue work? Yes. We have the Jedi although they are pretty hurt. Okay. Boss, you probably already discovered, but this is no Geonosian factory. We are going to take out the shield, and the moment we do that Tharg will try to escape. When this thing go up we need the general to destroy it, otherwise Tharg is gone. What about Hell Squad? We will go to the lower hangar on floor 27. From there we will take a ship or something. I see. Good luck Hell Squad. Dejer deactivated the communicator and turned to Hell Squad. Alright boyos, we are going to eliminate those droids, then we destroy the shield generator and last we run like there are a thousand droids on our tail. Because there will be. They split in two groups, Dejer and Tech on the left, Brain and Cell on the right. On Dejer signal Hell Squad opened fire. At such a close range there wasn't even need to aim. Seven of the B-1 droids on the front fell full of holes. Only then did the droids return fire. But they were out in the open protecting the door, while the clones used the junctions and doors as cover. Alarms started going off, but the last B-2 droid felt before any reinforcement arrived. Tech opened the door and they quickly entered, Cell and Brain stayed to guard the door. Dejer pulled out a bunch of thermal detonators. They already know we are here Tech. Let's just blow this thing up and go. They put the detonators on the shield generator, 
but before they got out two rolling droids appeared on the end of the corridor. Cell screamed a warning. Destroyers. Chapter 21. The two droidikas or destroyers stopped rolling to reveal one meter droids. Their deflector shield came to life, blocking the shots that Cell and Brain had fired. Also, their twin blaster cannons started firing at amazing speeds. Oh. My leg. Before they could retreat Cell was shot in the leg. Brain saved his life by pushing him out of the way of the following lasers. However, they were now trapped inside the room. As soon as the destroyers appeared Dager and Tech had jumped out of the door frame. Laser shots were hitting the wall behind them and reflecting a little bit, almost catching them. Dager attention was now fixed over Cell and his injured leg. Brain was taking a look at it. I wish we hadn't sent 3-4 back. He had way more medic training than I did. But don't worry Cell, it's going to be okay. Then Brain looked at Dager and pointed to the door, where the destroyers were still pouring fire. We have to do something about them sir. If more droids arrive then we are doomed. I know. Luckily they are dumb. Can you hear it? They are approaching. Wait for them to pass through the door and stick your guns in their shield. The droid did exactly what Dager said they would. As the first destroyer crossed the door, before he could turn and fire, Dager put his weapon through the shield and blew his circuits. The second destroyer, however, took the chance to fire a Dager arm, that could be seen through the door. Instead of retracting his arm, Dager dropped to the ground. As the destroyer turned down to shoot at him, Brain jumped through the door directly on the droid. The destroyer tried to shook him off, but Brain shot his head. Dager took the lead once again. Brain and Tech helped sell. Come on. Tech already armed the detonators. We need to get to the hangar on floor 27. Meanwhile, in the factory command center. A Geonosian, Tharg, was talking to some droids and watching the battle outside on some screens when suddenly the alarms went off. What? Kikui. Happened? Shots were fired on level 42 sir. It appears a group of clones have infiltrated our defenses. I have already sent two droidica units to take care of it, and another two patrols who were near are going too. Quickly, check the. Kiki. Jedi. Sir, the Jedi are gone. Somehow the clones have hacked our cameras and put it on a loop. I am sorry sir. Tharg went mad, but at this moment another droid, who was working on some panels, called him. Sir. The shield is down. The clone army is beginning their bombing. The factory shook. Some droids and Geonosians on the command center fell. Tharg fell on his chair and started screaming orders in Geonosian translated for your better understanding. Launch the ship. Take off now. Outside the factory, front lines of the clone army. General Windu was talking to 3-4 and Dab. Are you saying that there is a droid ship buried underneath the factory? We have. Sir. Delta Squad is getting out of the factory. General Windu looked at the gate. There were six people leaving the factory. Four of them were Delta Squad members, and the other two were being carried. However, at this moment the gates of the factory totally opened. From it a droid army started marching. There were B-1 and B-2 droids at the thousands, and destroyers and AATs were also following them. Windu ordered all his troops to fire, but once again he was surprised. First the shield was gone and the ground shook. Debris started falling from the factory. Then it was the towers falling as an enormous spherical spaceship started getting out of the ground. A battle sphere. That's not good. Everyone focus fire on that thing. Chapter 22 The battle sphere destroyed the whole factory. The debris that were falling smashed the droid army getting out of the factory. It seemed that those droids were just eye attack, meant to distract the clones. However, thanks to Hell Squad actions of deactivating the shield, Tharg had destroyed almost all of his own troops. General Windu gave the fire order. At TS, LOTS and SPHATS, focus all your fire on this battle sphere. Lasers, missiles and cannon shots were hitting the battle sphere repeatedly. 
explosions were going of on it, and pieces of its exterior shell were falling. It was clear it wouldn't be able to make it. General Windu turned to Dab. Where is the rest of Hell Squad? We. Don't know sir. The last time we talked with Leader Dager he was about to enter the ship to find the shield generator. Then may the force be with them. Dager braced himself on the sides of the corridor. Cell, who was hurt, was asking them to leave. I am only delaying you all sir. Leave me and go. You don't give orders here trooper. Either we all get out or none of us do. He is right Cell. All we have to do is find a ship, hijack it and get out. Nice and easy. You know brain, this is not helping. It almost make leave Cell behind a good opti. Careful. Droids. One of the patrols sent after them have caught up and started shooting. Thanks to danger warning they were able to dodge the first shots. They responded to fire but this time the ones caught in the open were them. Dager took out his last droid popper. Tech. At the same time. One. Two. Three. Now. Their grenades hit the middle of the droid patrol, and the electric currents they let out deactivated four or five droids. However, there were still ten more, including three B-2 super battle droids. Hell Squad was out of options. With the droids outnumbering them it was just a matter of time before someone died. Dager fired his DC-15A and hit one of the droids on the head, severing it from his body. It was at this moment that one of the missiles the Republic Army was firing hit the battle sphere, opening a hole on it. The vacuum sucked everything, including the unprepared droids. Dager grabbed a control panel with everything he could muster. Tech couldn't grab anything, and was sent flying in the whole direction. Letting one of his hands go, Dager grabbed Tech arm, barely catching him. Brain and Cell have secured themselves onto some protuberances on the sides of the corridor. After Tech had grabbed on something, Dager climbed up the control panel. The droid ship had energy walls that could be activated for situations like this. After the situation was solved the clones sat on the floor for a little rest. Uff, that was close. Thank you for catching me sir. The clone group couldn't rest much however, as they had to get to the hangar. Fortunately, this time they didn't encounter any more droids. Not alive ones at least. There were droids that got crushed by something, droids that hit the wall too hard and broke and also there were many more holes covered by energy shields. They got to the hangar area without any more problems, but when they got there they found at least 30 droids guarding the ships. Tech pointed to the nearest ship, a maxillipede shuttle. That is our best option. The droids are scattered. If we can make to that ship before they group up we got some chance. Everybody check your weapons. I am the best shooter, so you too carry cell. Everyone ready? Go. Dager fired at the two droids guarding the door from where they came, catching them off guard. Then he, Cell, Brain and Tech started running the fastest they could without leaving Cell behind. Chapter 23 Since he wasn't carrying anyone Dager was the first on to arrive at the shuttle. By the time he arrived the droids on the hangar were already coming his way, and the nearest ones were firing. Dager secured the shuttle entrance just enough for the other three to arrive, and then closed the door. Lasers hit the shuttle, and the attack from the clone army outside was making everything shake. Dager took Cell from Tech Arms and ordered him to go pilot the shuttle. We need to go. Get us out of here Tech. On it. Tech went to the cockpit, but he didn't have time to do anything as the floor tilted sideways. Boxes, ships and droids slipped on the hangar. The maxillipede shuttle they were taking was no exception. Dager knew that the clone army have destroyed one of the stabilizers of the battle sphere. It was going down. And when it did everything and everyone inside it would be utterly destroyed. But Tech didn't plan on waiting to die. Somehow he turned on the shuttle, and made it to the hangar door. Not without hitting quite a few things, and droids, on the way. As they made it out, Dager looked behind them to the battle sphere. It was crashing down quickly then it went up. Escape pods and other ships were flying out of it, but Dager could tell that the majority of the droids would die. The clone fire was still hitting it though. 
Dager hoped that no clone would fire at them thinking they were enemies. Finally, the battle sphere smashed on the ground. A dust cloud of dozens of square kilometers large covered the sky. Thanks to the shuttle sensors they didn't crash on anything. Dager went to the cockpit and turned on the shuttle communicator. Republic Army, this is Dager of Hell Squad. We are approaching on a droid maxillipede shuttle. Don't fire. I repeat, this is. On the Clone Army Command Center. As soon as the battle sphere started to fall, General Windu have ordered his troops to retreat. The dust cloud still enveloped them, but he and the other Jedi used their powers to create a bubble around the command center, on which the dust couldn't penetrate. 3-4, who was around him turned to face the clone on the radar. But the clone just shook his head. Several droid ships and escape pods left the battle sphere before it hit the ground, but we don't have confirmation that any of them carried Hell Squad. Sorry brother. 3-4 and Dab stood quiet, and General Windu shook his head. He turned to the same clone. What about Delta Squad? Our scouts already found them. They are all good. Generals Jin and Depa are injured, but not dead. On. We are receiving a transmission from a droid shuttle. Um. Play it. One hear me. I repeat, don't fire. This is Dager and Hell Squad. Can anyone hear us? Don't fire. Dab and 3-4 were relieved. General Windu smiled and nodded to the clone. We hear you Hell Squad. You can land, nobody will shoot you. Thanks brother. I started to think you were ignoring us on purpose. After the shuttle landed, the first to talk with them were Dab and 3-4. This doesn't look good Cell. You should find a medical droid after you report. Yeah Dab, I will. Next time you and 3-4 come with us. Brain laughed. They do have to come. I am not sure Tech and I would have been able to carry you much longer. You need to stop eating those cakes at the canteen man. Ha 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 ha. Dager put order in Hell Squad, and went to the command center with them. They all formed a line, Dab supporting Cell, and saluted General Windu. Mission accomplished sir. Chapter 24 At ease. Hell Squad, you did a great job today. With the fall of this battle sphere we can almost wrap up the Battle of Geonosis. However, there are still some loose ends. Trooper, show the projection. One of the clones on took out a hologram projector. The hologram showed Geonosis, and there were twelve red dots and an yellow Republic symbol on it. General Windu pointed to the Republic symbol. We are here. When the battle sphere fell quite a number of escape pods and ships flew from it. Some were destroyed and the majority of them landed close, so our troops have already searched and destroyed the droids on them. He paused and looked up. The clones looked back, already understanding what he wanted. However, we don't have anyone near those twelve areas. We can't risk Tharg escaping and started some kind of rebellion. Hell Squad have already proved themselves over and over again, so I need you to go to those places and look for the fugitives. Just give us the time to drop Cell with a medical droid and we are ready to go sir. I know you have been through all of this recently, but now that the Clone Wars have begun the Separatists have come out of hiding and dominated almost 300 star systems. We are leaving a fleet here, but we can't spend much efforts on finding Tharg. There will be some other squads looking for him, but I hope he have gone down with his ship. There is no problem sir. It is our job. But I have to ask a question sir. Do it then. Hell Squad only have six members. Before I thought it was because we couldn't be too big of a group to invade the factory. Now I am not so sure. Hell Squad is being changed in a special unit. You will still follow under Master D lead, but be prepared for lots of challenges. Sir, yes sir. Hell Squad left cell on and lot directed to the fleet above Geonosis. Now Dager, Brain, 3-4, Dab and Tech were on other lot going to one of the locations on the map General Windu gave them. They didn't even got out of the lot. The escape pod has blown up, and there was no chance anyone could have survived. It was on the second location that they found something. The escape pod was opened, and there were droid footprints going south. 
it didn't take long for them to find the droids. Their mechanical minds couldn't process anything before the laser cannons on the lot cut them into pieces. The other squads have already checked six other locations, founding and destroying some droids. The third and fourth places they stopped was the same, the droids returned a little bit of fire before they died. Finally there was some response from another squad. Danger, we found a shuttle. From the footprints it could be Tharg. We are in pursuit. Copy that men's. We are going to meet you. Call us if you need any help. Deja was expecting Tharg to give them some trouble, but before long men's contacted him again saying that Tharg had surrendered as soon as their lot approached. To make sure there was nothing wrong Hell Squad went to escort men's squad. They arrived at their base without any problems. Men's pushed a Geonosian out of their lot, and passed the keys of his chains to Dajer. He is all yours. We will stay here with the Geonosis garrison force Dajer. Good luck out there. By Men's. We will send you a hologram when we capture Count Dooku. Now come on you bug. Hell Squad lot soared into space. With this their battle on Geonosis was over. Chapter 25 what will change is who take part on the battles and how they happen. Like the next battle, General D wasn't supposed to take part on it but he will. If I were only to follow what happens in the series there would be no reason to write. One of the reasons I have chosen Hell Squad and Dager to be under Commander Keeley and General D is because there is very little about them known, so I have bigger flexibility. I hope you all can understand that, and thank you all for your support so far. I am really enjoying writing this. Ren Var. Hell Squad was on the Republic Venator class Star Destroyer Sincerity. The capital ship of Jedi Master Imagun D Fleet, it was one of the biggest starships on the Republic Navy, although there were bigger cruisers being built. They were going to the outer rim system of Tobali, on the Thanium sector. The Separatists have invaded and conquered the planet of Ren Var. The system was at the time defended only by the Jedi General Obi-Wan Kenobi and his Padawan Anakin Skywalker. Tobali system was an unimportant system, so the defending troops only had an acclimator class cruiser, which was patrolling at the time. As soon as General Kenobi's ship detected the invading force, that was composed of three Lukahol class battleships and several smaller ships, he ordered his forces on the planet, already under siege, to retreat. He sent his Padawan to pick them up on RTTs and after they were safe he himself descended with lots to bring them to his ship. General Kenobi retreated to the nearest Republic-controlled system. His forces have suffered heavy losses while boarding the lots, he himself was injured. After that, he could only report to the Galaxy Senate and the Jedi Council that the system had been lost. As a response General Imagun D and his troops have been sent to retake the system. Besides Sincerity they were also taking two acclimator class cruisers. Deja was on the command center of the Sincerity, together with Commander Keeley and General D. They were talking to General Kenobi, his Padawan Anakin Skywalker and Kenobi Commander Cody, in the hologram table. Good to see you Master Kenobi, and you young Skywalker. We should arrive in one or two days. We have to take a detour around a nebula. After we reunite our troops we shall take Renvar back. As Dajer have already noticed, General D liked to get straight to the point. General Kenobi, on the other hand, seemed to enjoy doing small talk. Master D, it's good to see you. I am afraid that we have to ask for your help. However, I don't think we should focus our efforts on Renvar. We have seen a large number of Separatist ships landing on a nearby planet called Raxus Prime. We think their attack on Renvar was just so our base there couldn't keep an eye on them. Hum. I think I have heard of Raxus Prime somewhere. There is more than what we can see to this separatist invasion. I agree. I and my Padawan will go to Raxus Prime see if we can discover what is going on. Don't worry, we won't make a move before you arrive. Then I shall see you soon Master Kenobi. I am going to consult our records and see if I can find out about Raxus Prime. General D closed the transmission and turned to Dajer and Commander Keeley. Keeley, go check our troops, I want the 303rd ready to anything. We are entering enemy territory. Dajer, I have never seen you in actual combat, 
but if Master Windu transformed Hell Squad on a special unit you should be good. I looked at your records and you received just the normal training. I want you to follow Commander Keeley until we disembark. See what you can learn. Dismissed. Dajer and Commander Kelly walked out of the bridge. Keeley seemed very interested on Hell Squad stories, according to him he would be able to learn how to best deploy them. So, Dajer. Tell me more about Hell Squad operations. General D and I found quite strange when he asked for one of our squads. You lost a lot of fun out here. I guarantee that we had more than enough fun on the factory sir. From what I have heard the separatists couldn't even broke through our blockade on Geonosis. Yeah. They tried to counterattack. I say it is stupidity of them. Almost all of our army and navy was there. They weren't expecting us. Now they are. We have to be more careful. Come on, enough about us, tell me about Hell Squad. Well, brain is. Chapter 26 Dajer was looking to the windows. Continuous white and light blue stripes of light were passing outside. They were on light speed, going to Raxus Prime. Dajer was on the Thames, how clones called the canteen, with Hell Squad. He have accompanied Commander Keeley for over three hours, learning how a commander should, well, command. Although it was little time, he have learned much, including the experiences that Keeley had when he himself was being trained. Now, Cell, recovering from his leg injury was describing to 3-4 and Dab how he got hurt, but they weren't buying it. And I was like, destroyers. And everyone jumped out of the way. If I wasn't so close I would have been able to destroy those clankers before they could even shoot. Yeah, yeah. All I remember was he crying for my help. Brain, save me please. Ha 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 ha. Ha 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 ha. At that moment Commander Keeley entered the mess. One of the clones near the entrance saw him, got up and said. Commander on sight. Every clone stopped talking, got up, and stood upright. Some, as Cell, struggled a little from their injuries before they got up. At ease. Dagger, General D wants you on the bridge. Everyone else, keep eating. Dajer was surprised, as it hadn't passed much time since he left the bridge. Cell looked at him as if he was going to martial court, but said something totally different. Ah, the price of fame. Can't even eat with us normal clones anymore. This got a round of laughter not only from Hell Squad but also the surrounding clones. Dajer caught up with Keeley and tried to catch the situation. What happened Commander? General Kenobi and his Padawan were scouting Raxus Prime, but apparently his Padawan was captured. You will understand better when General D talks to you. General D and General Kenobi were discussing something through the hologram table. General D welcomed Dajer and went straight to the point. Dajer, Master Kenobi's Padawan, Skywalker was captured by Count Dooku and a bounty hunter named Sidon Prax. Master Kenobi's forces are severely depleted. I'm sending Hell Squad and an Steel Company to replenish his troops. He has some ideas about young Skywalker situation. You are to follow his orders. What about the ground invasion general? Will we be able to handle it without a battalion? Let me worry about that Commander Keeley. I have already asked for help from Master Windu. He will be coming to support us. Now I need to debate with Master Kenobi. You are dismissed. Dajer left the bridge, thoughts spinning in his mind. On one side he wasn't happy leaving his general side, on the other he could see the importance of reinforcing General Kenobi. He didn't return to the canteen, but went to his quarters. He needed to rest before they arrived, as he would have a lot of work. Another few hours passed and they arrived at Zorda system, near Tobali system. Kenobi fleet was there. Hell Squad and Steel Battalion took the transports to Kenobi ship. Dajer, together with Steel Company Captain, Captain Rosal, went to see General Kenobi. General Kenobi had a cordial air around him. It wasn't the first time Dajer experienced the calming effects that being around a Jedi had. Maybe it was what they called the Force. However, even if he looked calm on the outside, Dajer was certain that he was really worried about his Padawan. He was right, as Kenobi's words proved. Captain Rosal, 
Dejer, as you already know my reckless Padawan was captured. He kind of deserved it, but is my duty as his master to save him. I, together with Commander Cody and General D will go stop Count Dooku plans on Raxus Prime and save Anakin, although I believe he is already devising a plan to escape by himself. Chapter 27 You two will stay here, defend the ship and stop any Separatist ship who tries to escape. My pilots were almost all shot down on Ren Var. Dager had an objection, as he couldn't see a reason why he should stay on the ship. Sir, I understand why Steel Company stays here, as they are an air force. However, Hell Squad is an infantry unit. We will be of no help up here. Are you sure? Six men would not make any difference down there, but here, if we discover that the Separatists are escaping with prisoners you are the best choice to board the enemy ship. But. Okay sir. While you are here you are under Admiral Yazeb. General Kenobi left, and went to tell Hell Squad their new orders. On a closed, dark room, General Kenobi was facing an hologram of General D. Obi-Wan, what I am about to tell you can be known to you and by you only. You can't tell anyone, not even your Padawan. All right Master D, don't keep me anxious. Many years ago, as a Padawan I came across a piece of information. This information was so terrifying that I told my master, and he decided to tell only Master Yoda and Master Windu. He gave me repeated warnings not to tell anyone. Not too much later he died, and Master Yoda called me to make sure I wouldn't say it to my own Padawan. The information is about a Sith weapon, known as the Dark Reaper. Kenobi felt a chill when he heard the name. It seemed as if the Force got disturbed only by mentioning the weapon. This weapon is capable of harnessing the Force inside living beings and turning it onto rays of energy able to destroy everything. However, this weapon needs a core component to work, known as Force Harvester. It was about this component that I learned. It is, or was, in a Sith temple on Raxus Prime. I believe that is the reason Count Dooku attacked the Tobali system. But, if this weapon is so dangerous, why leave it there? Why not destroy it? Only a Sith Lord is able to penetrate the temple's defenses. Many Jedi lost their lives or fell to the dark side trying to do what you say. So, since we know that Dooku is trying to get, or already got, this Force Harvester, we have to stop him from collecting the other parts of it at all costs. You are right. However, I believe that since he went to get the Force Harvester he already has the other components, as this is the core one. But for the Dark Reaper to work it has to first collect the Force inside beings, killing them on the process. I think that he will try to escape and use it on a nearby planet. That is the reason I was so insistent on leaving my fleet in standby. Then we have to make sure that Count Dooku don't escape us, and that this weapon is destroyed before it is even constructed. Admiral Yazeb was on the bridge of General Kenobi capital ship. The battle on the planet below, Raxus Prime, was on full motion. However, in space everything was quiet, as the Separatists seemed to have no intention of supporting their forces. Before he left General Kenobi was very specific that the fleet should not move, even if the whole Separatists navy came after them. Admiral Yazeb looked through the windows, but one of the deck officers called him. Several ships coming out of hyperspace. One, two, five, at least twenty. Admiral Yazeb was really calm as he gave the orders. Everyone to battle stations. Tell the steel company to get on air. I want every pilot we can scrap. Any other troops stand in standby to provide medical assistance and to defend against any droid that board us. Also, get me General D's special unit squad leader. Chapter 28 Alarms sounded all over the Acclimator class ship. Thousands of clones were moving to the fighters and turrets, or just taking defensive positions. Hell Squad was left on the hangar, near an ETA class shuttle. If any ship suspected of taking prisoners was detected, they were the boarding crew. Dager was walking fast towards the bridge. It was at this moment that twenty or so Separatist ships came out of hyperspace, including the three Lukahol class battleships that were supposed to be on Ren Varius. Immediately after, a dozen thousand or so vulture droids started flying at their direction. Dejer could see less than half that number of Republic Arc 170 going to meet them. 
For a time there was nothing, as the two massive groups flew directly to each other. Then there was laser fire being shot and explosions started going off. It was impossible to tell which side was winning, but the Republic seemed to be on the losing side, as their opponents overpowered them almost three to one. For Dager, who was inside the ship, the explosions and shots didn't have any sound, it was like mute fireworks. However, as some pilots have already told him, for those inside the battle the noise was overwhelming, not from the outside, but from their own ships and the others. Every time someone died they were able to hear as if it was at their side. Dejer shook his head and took his eyes out of the battle. He had orders to obey, and he needed to get back to Hell Squad as soon as he has finished his talk with Admiral Yezeb. Yezeb was up in the bridge giving orders to everyone. One of the Republic Acclimator class cruisers was damaged, and he had to coordination with the ship's commander to evacuate everyone possible. Admiral, Sir. Dejer, General Kenobi contacted us from the surface. Count Dooku Bounty Hunter, Sidon Cracks have escaped in a shuttle. He is taking General Skywalker and another prisoner with him. Your mission is to board them and retake the prisoners. He also said that there is a special cargo. If possible take it with you. Yes sir. Dejer made his way back to the hangar. His men have already been warned, and were waiting inside the ship. Only Cell would not go, because of his leg wound. Dejer entered the ship, and the pilot took off. They were heading to a hexagonal ship that Dejer didn't recognize. The ship was flying from the planet below, and it was gaining speed. The pilot looked to the panel in front of him. They are entering light speed, sir. We are not gonna make it. Go as fast as you can. We have to try. The ETA accelerated, and for a moment it seemed as they would be able to catch up and interrupt the light speed jump. But a group of four vulture droids came into their sight and attacked them. The pilot took evasive maneuvers, and Sidon Prax's ship disappeared, taking the prisoners and whatever General Kenobi wanted. Dang! We need somebody on the guns. Those Voltira droids are coming for another round. Dejer went to the top laser turret, and sent Dab to the back turret. The vulture droids were on their tail. Luckily Dab wasn't good only with rifles, any weapon looked alive on his hands. One of the vulture droids exploded. Dejer swinged his turret around, aiming for the vulture droid on the back of the group. He spawned fire, and the droid was sent spinning on the void. The pilot started making back for the cruiser, and as they got close the turbo lasers on it sent the remaining two vulture droids away. A dejected group of clones left the ETA. With the escape of the hexagonal ship, the droid forces on Raxus Prime quickly retreated. The ships on space also left. It seemed that everything valuable for them on the planet left with the escaping ship. Chapter 29 Hell Squad returned to their quarters, thinking about what would happen next. Dejer had to report the failure of their mission, although he was sure the command already knew. He walked slowly since there was no immediate threat as the Separatists have left. The hangar doors opened again, and this time a group of lots landed. From them walked General Kenobi and General D. Dejer stood waiting as the wounded were taken to the medical center. After that was over he went to talk to the Jedi. They escaped generals. Hell Squad have failed. Don't worry, there wasn't much you could do on a space battle. Go back to your quarters Dejer. I will contact you when we find them. General Kenobi didn't seem too worried about the kidnapping of his Padawan. General D also wasn't angry, however he looked pensive. For the next few days it was quiet. The clones entered on a kind of routine similar to the one they had on Kamino. They woke up, went to the mess for breakfast and after that went to training. After lunch they were free, unless they were sorted to guard duty. Each clone went his own way, and the commanders went to a small briefing before going back to what they were doing. Dejer already passed his daily briefing, and was playing some kind of card game with Brain and Tech when his comlink bipped. He told the other two to keep playing, and went outside the room. At some moment they have entered hyperspace, and Dejer reckoned that this had something to do with the message he was receiving. The voice of Captain Rosal passed through the comlink. Dejer, we have found General Skywalker. Come to the bridge for briefing. 
On the bridge were Admiral Yazeb, Captain Rosal, Commander Cody and General Kenobi. Not much later another clone captain, under Commander Cody arrived. Flip. General, Commander. The captain, Flip, nodded to Dager and Rosal. Commander Cody started the meeting. We received a signal from General Skywalker. According to it, he is on Alaris Prime, a moon on the Kashyyyk system. It is a colonized moon, inhabited by a group of Wookiees. General Kenobi took over. The rest of our fleet have to defend the system at least until Master Windu arrives with his fleet. We are going to Alaris Prime and we will rescue my Padawan, but don't expect reinforcements. Yes, General. They spent the next two hours making the battle plans. When they arrived there was no separatist blockade. The green moon under them looked peaceful. However, when the lots landed they saw that things weren't that calm. They have landed near the place from where they received the signal. It was droid base, however it was very damaged. There was a hole on the wall, buildings were in flames and half fallen, and there were dead droids everywhere. Well, it looks like my Padawan passed here. Cody, keep going this direction, and be careful of the droids. What about you General? I am going to take a look in front. General Kenobi took a speeder and went looking for his Padawan. Before long the clone forces encountered more dead droids, some cut with a lightsaber and the cuts were still glowing. Cody analyzed them and ordered all troops to stay sharp. Come on lads, careful. There are still droids here. They advanced carefully, but when they finally found droids they still took losses. It was another droid base, also with a hole on the wall, but this time not all the droids were dead. Two or three dozens of droids on the walls started shooting at them, killing a ten or so clones. Thanks to the dense vegetation they weren't able to get many clear shots, and the clones had plenty of cover. Chapter 30 Dager advanced through the trees. The droid fire was concentrated on the middle of the clone positions. One clone fell on Dager right. He leaned to the side and shot his DC-15A at one of the droids, getting the eliminate. This, however, attracted the attention of the other droids. Laser fire hit the tree he was hidden behind, forcing him to abandon it for other one, as it started to fell. Fortunately, the droids were soon distracted by other clones, giving him the chance to fire again, killing another droid. This way they advanced, and Dager got the members of Hell Squad to stay together with him. There was a 30 meters long clear area between the droid base and the trees. Dager turned to Commander Cody and asked for cover fire. A barrage of lasers hit the droid defenses, forcing them to stay quiet. Hell Squad took the chance to run, and arrived safely at the base of the walls. They run sticking to the wall to the hole on it. The droids guarding it were among the first that the clones have taken down, so they entered the base undetected. Dab, Cell and Tech, take the right side. Go up the ramp and fire as soon as you have a clear shot. Brain, 3-4, we will do the same on the left. Also, Dab, why don't you take the chance to test your new toy? Dab chuckled. With pleasure sir. The two groups went separate ways. Dager went up the left ramp, and looked. There were about twelve droids, and from there he could also see the right side. Dab, Tech and Cell were ready, Dab was fixing something on his DC-15X. Dager took out a thermal detonator, pressed the button and waited two seconds before tossing it out. The explosion destroyed four or five of the unsuspecting battle droids. At Dager's side, Brain and 344 also opened fire. Bang! A big explosion shook the air. Although they were in the middle of a combat, Dager could not help but turn and look. Dab has fired his weapon, and about seven droids were dead, and another three or four have been thrown to the ground. Dab was an weapon expert, and on the few days they didn't have nothing to do on the ship he had made some modifications on his DC-15X. He installed some sort of charging component on it, so when he activated it, his shot would become explosive rounds. He could switch between that and the normal sniper shots. Of course this also had his downside, as he had to wait a long time to fire again, and lost some range. For that reason he started carrying with him a DC-15S. Dager started firing again, 
and some of the droid laser fire hit the ground next to him. However, the droids were surprised, and were also getting fired from the clones on the forest. As on of the droids turned to fire at Dager Group his head was shot off by someone outside. This distracted the droids once again, as their dumb AI couldn't decide what to do. The clones have already discovered that taking out the droid commander was the same as cutting their brain off. Without someone giving orders they would shoot the person that was shooting them, not the ones close to them. The clone forces only took about 20 or 30 casualties to take the droid base, which was pretty good. If there wasn't a hole in the walls for Hell Squad to enter, the death toll would have been much bigger. They encountered another two droid bases on the way, all of them semi-destroyed. Only after them did they find General Kenobi. He was spying on a Wookiee village, where combat seemed to be going on. Chapter 31 Cody, good of you to join me. From the big battle down there I deduce my Padawan is here. Are the men ready? Always sir. Then let's attack. Commander Cody got the clones prepared, and under General Kenobi lead they attacked. There were about two to three hundred droids assaulting the village. The village only had about thirty or so Wookiees defending it, so the droids were getting an easy win. However, being attacked from behind by about the same amount as they had, the droids were soon being wiped out. The backlands of the droids were totally destroyed, but for those droids who have already entered the village, the clones were forced to go to close combat. General Kenobi was the first to enter the village, his lightsaber cutting the droids in pieces. Dajer and Cody were just after him. Dajer walked alongside the Wookiees' huts, paying attention to any movement that could be a droid. Hell Squad was behind him, and they started cleaning the village of any droids. A group of three droids was assaulting one of the clone huts, but as soon as the first entered in it he was thrown back by a green flash. A Wookiee carrying some kind of crossbow blaster came out. Before he shot again Dajer, Tech and 3-4 had already got the two remaining droids. The Wookiee looked at them, and a smaller version of him, presumably his daughter or son, run out of the house and hugged his leg. Warg. Dajer nodded at the Wookiee and Cell said lightly. You are welcomed. I guess. Their advance didn't stop because of it, and before long they arrived at the center of the village. There, General Kenobi's Padawan and twenty Wookiees have built some kind of last stance defense. Thankfully the clone army arrived, and General Kenobi himself was the first to enter the battle, cutting down droids left and right. Hell Squad took cover on the corners of the huts, and picked the droids one by one. The village was soon clean, and Dajer, Commander Cody, General Kenobi, General Skywalker and the village chief entered a hut to talk. The Wookiee, a tall creature, totally covered in fur, and with many animal bones hanging on his locks, was the fist to talk. Warg. Arg. Anakin, I believe you do speak Wookiee right. Can you translate what he is saying please? Yes master. He is thanking us for our help, and saying that we are welcome to stay if we want. I am sorry chief, but we can't stay here. I am sure more droids are coming. We would only put you in more danger if we stayed. Warg. Warg, Warg Erg. He said, don't worry, there are no more droids on this planet, only a small group in the forest to the south. General Kenobi tensed up. Commander Cody and General Skywalker saw it too. General Skywalker asked what was wrong, but his master ignored him and turned to the Wookiee. What did you say? We need to get everyone out of the village now. Anakin, Cody, I want every troop and every Wookiee on the lots as soon as possible. Worf. Aark. He is asking why. At this moment another Wookiee entered the hut and started discussing with the chief. Wyrf. Arg Arg. Worg Arg. What is he saying Anakin? That there is an enormous black aura coming from the south, and that everything that touches it dies. And many more words I have never heard. They all got outside the hut, and saw the black aura the Wookiee was talking about. A giant black bubble was expanding, and Dajer saw with his own eyes as birds and other flying creatures that touched it fell to the ground instantly. Trees turned black and fell, and animals were running away. Kenobi turned and screamed. Everyone run. To the lots now. 
Chapter 32 The clone army was instantly thrown in disarray. Wookies were roaring, but the chief quickly got them to move. Many of the Wookies seemed unhappy, but the scene of everything dying as the black bubble passed convinced them. The delay, however, was enough for the bubble reached the outskirts of the village. The clone army, trained to follow orders, was already a few hundred meters away. However, the Wookiees took a lot more time to run, and this cost them a lot. One of the Wookiee families who took the most to leave was encompassed by the black bubble. They screamed and fell to the ground. Their bodies started widering away. The Wookiees cried. Deja was running at full speed, Hell Squad, and the rest of the clone army too. The bubble caught up with some more Wookiees, but they finally saw the lots which were flying towards them. Dajer switched his comlink on to talk to the pilots. Don't land. Just get ready to pick us up. The lots hovered above the ground, and the clones started to climb in. Commander Cody and the Jedi stayed just outside the lots, helping the wounded and the Wookiee children. However, as the black bubble approached they were forced to get on the gunships. Dajer looked at the elderly Wookiees and the injured clones who didn't make to the gunships yet, and closed his eyes. Without opening them he ordered the pilots. Go. Now. The lot flew as the black bubble engulfed those left behind. A track of death and destruction was left on its path. The gunships flew as fast as their engines permitted, but two of them who took too long to depart were still caught by the bubble. The gunships were still working, but with their pilots dead they fell to the ground with explosions. Dajer talked in his comlink. General, with all due respect, but what was that? We just lost over 50 clones and another 20 Wookiees. This isn't something we have to worry about right now Dajer. We have to make sure that this thing does not get to separatist hands. On General Kenobi capital ship. Commander Cody, Dajer, General Kenobi, General D and Commander Keeley were discussing. General Kenobi's Padawan was recovering from the battle. Commander Keeley was giving them their intel on the separatist movement. Generals, our intelligence report that whatever generated that black thing you all confronted was taken by the separatists back to Renvar. Then all our forces shall move there too. Master Kenobi, do you agree? We can't let them use it again. Cody, prepare every clone. Defeat is not an option. Dajer, you are returning with me and Keeley. I am sure we can find something for Hell Squad to do. The fleet of Mace Windu have arrived, and the three Jedi generals started a joint attack. The Separatist blockade didn't last long before several gunships, starfighters and two Aclameter class cruisers broke through it. The clones braved through the anti-aircraft fire and landed on the barren planet. Many clones were taken down by the droids on the ground, but their sheer numbers won them a foothold. Hell Squad was amongst the first to get out of the lots. Their cohesion as a special unit showed up as they took out droid after droid. Their primary targets were the E-Web, on which Dab used his charged shot to make sure the droids wouldn't be able to use them again. There wasn't much cover on the barren land, and Hell Squad used the droid barricades they have just took out to their own defense. Suddenly the battlefield stopped. Droids and clones alike stopped firing and looked at the sky. On the green sky one Republic cruiser was on fire as it entered the atmosphere and crashed down on some distant mountains. Chapter 33 Dajer was one of the first to recover from the incredible and at the same time depressing sight. Keep going. Destroy those clankers. The clones resumed their shooting, but witnessing one of their ships being shot down obviously affected their moral. Seeing this General D jumped out of his lot and went to the front lines, hacking at the droids. With their commander leading them the clones finally awakened their fighting spirit, and took out the droid outpost. General D went to Dajer. We can't stop now. Don't worry about the cruiser, Obi-Wan is already on his way. There is a sensor station that we need to take out. It is the station coordinating all the droid units. Let's move out. The clones embarked on at TES or went by foot, fighting every step of the way. As a planetary-wide invasion, although a small one, there were at least a hundred thousand clones taking part on it. As they fought the losses amounted, but they kept going. Dajer thought that General D and Commander Keeley were a sight to behold. 
They were fighting side by side, the Jedi deflecting lasers and cutting through droids and turrets alike, while the clone commander used his two DC-17 pistols to crush the droids. The barren land slowly turned to snowy hills and mountains as they got closer and closer to the sensor station. Taking the station, however, wasn't going to be an easy feat. On the rocky walls on which the station was built there were four particle cannon turrets. Those turrets were able to destroy even the ATES the Republic brought. To make things worse there were only two paths to the sensor station. The first was through the mountain and under the fire of all the droid defenses, and entering through the main gate. The second was a sewer path, on which a couple of droids would be able to hold against a force twenty times their own. Of course Hell Squad was taking the sewer route. But they wouldn't be alone, as General D was going with them. They would take a small force of a hundred clones and their mission was to clear a path to the interior of the sensor station. If they were able to do that a major force would then enter after them. Commander Keeley would be left to command the main force over the main path. They had fifteen at TES and a huge amount of clones, but they would still suffer severe losses if they didn't take the turrets out. The sewers smelled surprisingly normal, most probably because the droids didn't have an use for them. However, their defenses were quite good. The sewer was only big enough for three clones to pass side by side, and it was full of droid barricades and e-web turrets. Deja was sure that if it wasn't for General D fighting at the front they could have lost thousands and still not take the sewers. But that wasn't the case. The narrowness of the sewer was actually helping them, as General D didn't have to worry about side attacks and could deflect almost all lasers. The clones didn't do almost anything as they went through the sewers. Dager checked on the situation outside, and it did seem much rougher. Dager. Tell the general we are making progress, albeit slow. We already lost four at TES to those particle cannon turrets. But we will make it. Those clankers don't have what it takes to stop us. But it would be good if you could catch the from behind. Keely out. Deja went to General D and repeated what Commander Keeley said. The Jedi flashed him the first smile Deja ever seen he gave and yelled. All right 303. Let's get them. Chapter 34. Go, go, go. The clones broke through the end of the sewers, and a good number of barricades was waiting for them. During the weeks he battled in Geonosis and on Alaris Prime Deja senses have sharpened, and his battle abilities have become much better. So has his aim. Dager exited the sewers and immediately dropped to the ground. A volley of laser fire flew over him. Some clones who weren't as fast as him fell, their armor melted and the flesh beneath it carbonized. Dager quickly aimed and shot three times. Three droids fell. Besides himself through a thermal detonator. The metallic ball landed near an e-web turret. Eat this clankers. Clones started pouring out of the sewers and spreading out. They fell one after another, some hurt and some dead. However their sacrifice wasn't in vain as their brothers pushed the droids back more and more. They were now inside the building the end of the sewers was on an open area, and this gave the droids less maneuverability. General D went to Dager's side, still waving his blue lightsaber. Dager. I am taking some men to the control room. You take the rest and and go to the main path. Open the gate and catch the droids from behind. Yes General. General D took a group of twenty clones and turned left on the next junction. Dager, now commanding the rest of the clones, went on a straight path, sending small groups when they faced a junction to make sure they wouldn't be flanked. The sensor station wasn't that big, so it didn't take long for them to arrive at the gate control room. The problem was that there was a few hundreds of droids between them. Dager didn't have any other option besides ordering a frontal attack. He positioned his DC-15A and changed it to automatic fire mode. Blue laser absolutely crushed the nearest droids as more than a hundred clones fired. Red laser was returned, and clones started to fall. Dager would pop out every now and then, killing one or two droids each time, however the battle was entering on a stalemate. It was at this moment that one clone went up to him. I have an idea, but I need your support. What is it trooper? If I have one or two clones help me, I can get. Dager approved the idea, 
sending a group of clones to help. The battle extended for a few more minutes before the clone returned. He was carrying, with the help of two other clones, one of the e-webs, now out of its tripod. The heavy turret weighted so much that the three clones were actually struggling and shaking to carry it. Deja ordered the clones to give some cover fire, and when the time was right he gave the clone a signal. The clone stepped on the middle of the path and warmed up the e-web. Knock, knock. Broom. The laser the turret spammed was so concentrated that it actually turned on a continuous red flow. The droid defenses and themselves were literally torn it apart. The clone was laughing maniacally as he fired, but at such a firing rate the barrel of the e-web turned orange and them red, and the clones were forced to leave it before it blew up. After the mad barrage of laser the few dozen remaining droids weren't able to put up a fight and were quickly destroyed. Deja went to the clone, who was being complimented by the others. What is your name trooper? Metal, sir. Welcome to Hell Squad Metal. Come on lads. We still have brothers fighting outside. Commander Keeley invited us to the party. What? Sir, I already have a... Deja ignored him, and fired at the control panel. It sparked and the main gate started to open. The clones lined up, Hell Squad on the front, weapons ready to give the droids hell. Chapter 35 Outside the sensor station the clones lead by Commander Keeley were facing a tough battle. They have already taken out two of the particle cannon turrets, but there were still two more. The path leading to the station was packed with bodies of clones and droids. Flaming remains let smoke on the sky. Commander Keeley was having a hard time pushing forward. Half the ATES were down, and the remaining ones wouldn't last much longer. Keeley was almost giving up hope when the gate started to open by itself. The droids turned, not really understanding why the gate they were supposed to hold was opening. As the gate went up smoke billowed under it, and the ones behind it were slowly revealed. White armor, followed by a variety of weapons and finally the characteristic clone helmets. The armor was charred and full of scars, and the clones wearing it were visibly exhausted. But for Commander Keeley and the clones outside they weren't just help, but a sign they have captured the station. The clone leading them, Dager, didn't give any order, just shot. An all-out war broke out. As the gate opened Dager could see the clones on the outside. Seeing so many of his brothers on the ground pained him. Commander Keeley was on the front lines, using 2 DC-17 and leading the 303rd. As he absorbed more and more of the vision before him, Dager didn't even give any orders, and just fired at the nearest droid. This initiated a chain reaction, and every clone and droid started shooting. The first targets for Hell Squad were the two remaining particle cannon turrets. Their gunners were taken out before they could turn and fire, giving the clones on the path some time to prepare. On the path, Commander Keeley gave the total attack order. Blue laser fire started hitting the droids from two sides, and they were torn apart in the crossfire. The ATES weren't able to fire their top cannons, as Hell Squad clones were too close, but the smaller laser cannons still made quite a mess on the droid lines. The clones lead by Dager were the ones facing the biggest amount of pressure, as their numbers were a lot less than the droid numbers. Dager was taking cover behind some boxes, together with Brain. Cell and 3-4 were hidden on the sides of the main gate. Dab, Tech and Metal, the newest addition to Hell Squad, with the majority of the clones, were out in the open, receiving most of the enemy fire. Zung. Dagger looked upward. The gigantic antenna above the sensor station have stopped. For floors above where they were a window broke and a tactical droid smashed on the ground. A blur of movement followed it, and before anyone could do anything, General D landed and rotated, slicing three droids cleanly in half. Without saying a word, the Nikto Jedi ran to the middle of the surprised droids, jumping over their barricades and swinging his lightsaber faster than eyes could see. Sliced pieces of B-1 battle droids fell as the Jedi continued unstoppable. The general is here. You don't want to look bad, am I right boys? Get up and fire. Commander Keeley fired his pistols repeatedly, and droid heads jumped out of its notches. Dejo joined the battle, laser fire leaving his DC-15A and stoping at some droid back or chest. 
a group of AT XT walkers neared the sensor station. In the night, their lights shone upon the remains of the battle that took place there. The clone bodies have been moved to the sides, so they wouldn't be crushed by the walkers, but the droids didn't receive such treatment. As the walkers came closer to the main gate groups of clones on the barricades checked them. The gate opened, and a Jedi, together with two clones, went out. Chapter 36 A hatch on top of the AT XT opened, and General Kenobi got out. He looked really serious, very different from what Dager considered his normal. The Jedi jumped out of the walker and started talking with General D. Master D, there is no need to make a secret out of it anymore. The Separatists took the weapon to Thule, and Master Windu already requested help from Luminara. I see. Thule is a Republic planet isn't it? Since they took the Harvester to Thule that means they are ready to use it. We have to stop them at all costs. Deja was lost in the conversation, as Commander Keeley seemed to be, but he was able to put together that the black bubble that eliminated so many clones in Alaris Prime was going to Thule. General D turned to them. Keeley, prepare to move out. We are going to Thule. Deja was looking through the window of the Sincerity, to the planet of Thule. Thule was small, almost entirely made of water, and the few Earth spots that Dager could see on the planet were green. Encompassing the planet was a pale blue shield. Republic forces had been able to arrive before the majority of the Separatist ships, but Count Dooku had set up a planetary shield, stopping the Republic fleet. For now Dager was just waiting. According to General D, Anakin Skywalker was sent to deal with the shield generator, located on a small moon. The clone forces were composed of the 303rd commanded by General D, the 41st commanded by Jedi Master Luminara Undulai, the 212th commanded by General Kenobi and finally the 187th under General Windu. The Jedi have taken to themselves the mission of destroying the new Separatist weapon. The clones were told that their mission was to fight the droids, locate the weapon and stay away. During the meeting one clone commander with purple markings on his armor asked why. He was Vant, the commander of the 187th. The answer he received was that it wasn't for them to worry about. So now Dager was waiting for the shields to come down. He made his way to the officer's canteen, where he saw commanders Keeley, Vant, Gree and Cody. There was also a number of lieutenants and captains. If it wasn't for his position as leader of a special squad he wouldn't have the permission to be there. Of course he wouldn't sit on the same table as the commanders, since his rank was lower. It was his first time there, so he decided that he would sit alone. He grabbed his food, a green paste, and went to an empty table. Dager took of his helmet and put it down beside him. While the sincerity was on its way to Thule he had shaved his head, so he could be even a little bit different from the other clones. He loved his brothers, but he wanted to have an identity of his own. Dager started eating his food, and another clone came to his side. From his armor he was probably a lieutenant. The lieutenant putted his hand on Dager's shoulder. Hey brother, don't sit there all alone. Dager got up and looked at the clone. He wasn't wearing his helmet, and had an horizontal scar about five centimeters long on his forehead. He stretched his hand, and Dager shocked it. I am Dager. The lieutenant pointed to the scar on his forehead. My men nicknamed me Scar. Very imaginative. Ha ha ha. Come, sit with us brother. Scar lead Dager to a table where two more lieutenants and one captain were sitting. Scar presented them. Dager, those two are lieutenants Guard and Fonder. They are from the 303rd, as are you, I believe. The captain here is Cedar, and he is, as am I, from the 41st. Chapter 37 Dager greeted each of the clones. It appeared that most of them had the same idea as Dager, since, with the exception of Guard, all of them had different haircuts and tattoos. Fonder, one of the lieutenants of the 303rd looked at Dager and said with a surprised voice. I don't believe you are a lieutenant. How did you got into the officer's canteen? I am just asking, don't be mad at me. Since you are here you must have authorization. Actually I am not sure what my rank is now. However, I have been given the same privileges as officers. Let me present myself. 
I am Dager, leader of a special unit called Hell Squad. Scar and Cedar didn't have any reaction when he told his name, but as members of the 303rd, Fonder and Guard had obviously heard of him. Guard, who appeared to be a stern type, talked for the first time. So you are Dager. The men on on my platoon have been talking about you. I heard you had a tough time on that battle sphere on Geonosis. It was fun. At least it sharpened my squad. They were much better on Alaris Prime than on Geonosis. Since you mentioned it, what was that on Alaris Prime? Guard and Fonder platoons stayed on the ship. They could only tell us what they had heard. The one who asked the question was Cedar. The captain was the most serious of the batch, maybe because of his responsibilities. Dager frowned when he asked about what the Jedi called Harvester. It was. Disturbing. On this month or so of war I have seen many men die. But not the way it happened on Alaris Prime. Everyone that touched that thing simply. Fell and died. It was as if everything inside them was sucked away, and only skin remained. I'm sorry. Dager, do you already know what is your mission when we disembark? Not yet Captain. Hell Squad will follow the 303rd and act according to the situation. Dager talked to the clones a little more, then went to Hell Squad quarters. All of Hell Squad was there at the moment, which was a surprise, as the clones usually eat at this time, Hell Squad was no exception. Brain and Tech were playing some game on a hologram table. Dab was cleaning his DC-15X, and Cell was sleeping. 3-4 and Metal were discussing something on one of the corners. Metal seemed to have accepted his transfer to Hell Squad, although he complained quite a bit. When Dager stepped inside the room they all stopped what they were doing and saluted him. He dispensed them, told them to get back to what they were doing and went to sleep himself. When Dager woke up the shield was still on. Now there was only Metal on the room with him, playing with his weapon. Dager sat on his bed and called him. Metal. I know you are not happy with being taken out of your squad, but Hell Squad is in dire need of a heavy gunner like you. It is not that sir. I don't care with being transferred. I was surprised at most. It is just that. Uff. All my old squad members are dead. Some died on Alaris Prime, and others on Ren Var. In the end only I survived. I am sorry to hear that. No need to be sir. We are soldiers, this is normal. Even so, when I am alone I can't stop thinking that I could have done something. Maybe if I have grabbed that e-web earlier. Or if I have entered the sewers first. Or if I had waited more on Alaris Prime. Maybe. Metal. I know how you are feeling. I lost as many brothers as you did. And for that reason that we have to keep fighting. So we can end this war earlier and make sure that we all can go home as soon as possible. Chapter 38 That is why I need you to stop thinking about those who fell, and stay here on the present. As a member of Hell Squad your mission is bigger than most of the clones. We are a special unit, prepared to take high-value targets. We will face more danger than most clones, all to make sure that they face less perils than us. Metal was staring blankly at Dager. He probably wasn't expecting such an emotional speech from Dager. To tell the truth, Dager also wasn't. It was just that when he heard Metal talking, memories started to float his mind. He remembered the brothers with who he spent his training. Some, like CT-4087, were dead. Others he didn't know if were dead or alive. He remembered his squad leader, who used to be harsh, but was the first to jump into battle on Geonosis. He remembers all of those brothers who died by his side in the short month of war. Then he thought about all the others who could die with the war kept going. He then thought about Brain, Cell, Dab, 3-4, Tech and Metal. He thought about Keeley, Gree, Cody and even those who he had just met such as Scar and Cedar. So, Metal, put aside those memories, and shown your respect to those who left us by fighting side by side with me, Hell Squad, the 303rd and every clone in the galaxy. Metal stood up, his eyes glinting. Yes sir. When he talked it wasn't only his voice, but also some more that came from the door. Dager turned to see the rest of Hell Squad on the door. 
3-4 spoke with a strong voice. We will make sure to follow what you just said sir. Ah. Uh. For how long have you been listening? Don't you know that not saluting your superior officer is disrespectful? We know. Brother. Thankfully a clone soldier came and took danger if the awkward moment. Sir. General Skywalker took out the shield. General D want you on the bridge. The invasion has begun. All right trooper. I'm going. Hell squad. Check your weapons and your armors. We are going to show this separatist scum what brothers can do. Clones were working hard on the bridge. Different from the normal clones, those didn't wear armor, but navy outfit. On the middle on the bridge there was a platform, higher than the rest of the bridge. The door on the end of the bridge opened and Dager walked in, helmet off his head, and under his arm. The bridge was especially crowded at this moment. Captain stood on organized rows before the hologram table. General D and Commander Keeley were facing the projections of General Luminara and Commander Gree, General Kenobi and Commander Cody and General Windu and Commander Vant. General Windu was the one speaking. Obi-Wan, you and Commander Cody shall land on the South Hemisphere, where the Separatists built their communication center. Luminara, you and I will land onto the North Hemisphere and try to clear as many droid air bases as possible. Luckily we have stopped the Separatist fleet before they could dominate the whole planet. If we do our job well then the air battle should be easy. What about me, Master Windu? I'm a gun D, you and Commander Keeley also have air bases as target. There is an archipelago onto the planet where the Separatist built one of their largest air bases. It is from there that they are resupplying their capital ship. General Windu turned to the clones that were on his ship. Automatically the projection zoomed out to show that he had all his clone captains with him, as did Kenobi and Luminara Unduli. Troopers, listen up. Your mission isn't only to conquer the planet, but also to keep an eye out for this separatist weapon. You will know that it is at the moment you see it. You are not to approach it on any occasion. The troops of Master D and Master Kenobi have already proved how deadly that can be. Chapter 39 our orders are to destroy the air base, and while we are at it try to locate the separatist weapon. We are not to get anywhere near it. After the briefing Dager was giving Hell Squad their orders, which were the same as the other clones. Now get in the gunships. Remember what I said before. We might not have any special assignment this time, but that doesn't mean we can't be at the front lines. Metal, before we go come with me a minute. Metal followed Dager to the armory. Inside there were thousands of blasters, cannons, turrets and explosives. Dager lead metal through a maze of shelves with weapons to a section where what looked like e-webs but smaller were leaning. Wow! Those are Z-6 rotaries, aren't they? I used to have a smaller version of them Kamino, but after we went to Geonosis I didn't see one of those. Well, one of them is yours now. I have already talked with command. I expect you to be Hell Squad's strongest attacker. Thank you sir. Dager and Metal went RO the hangar, where the 303rd was preparing to go. The members of Hell Squad whistled when they saw Metal new gun. ZSXS weren't that common, and needed special authorization to use. Hell Squad got in the gunships, together with General D and Commander Keeley. Taking out the base shouldn't be much difficult, as they had an overwhelming number of clones. What they were really worried about was the weapon that created the black bubble. The clones who had been in Alaris Prime have all experienced the terror of it. Even those who weren't have heard of it by other clones. The pilot of the lot directed the gunship to a group of islands. There was no anti-aircraft fire, and the sides of the gunship were open. Dager looked outside and saw the lots diverting in three different directions. The 303rd lots lowered their altitude, and soon the droid air base was on sight. A stream of black dots left the air base, and the pilot warned them. Vultures incoming. Closing the doors. The doors slid to the sides, covering the sides. Red lights turned on. Dager was now used to it, and the sounds that the battle outside made didn't make him uncomfortable as the first time. He walked on the gunship, going to the cockpit, and at the same time talking with the soldiers. On his way he crossed with Commander Geely, 
who was doing the same on the other direction. He arrived behind the pilot's seat and looked outside. The battle was on full swing, vulture droids blowing up, not without taking some lots out. The clones had the upper hand, and Dager gunship faced almost no enemy fire before it neared the landing point. Dager turned and walked back into the cargo area. He looked and nodded at Commander Keeley. He, on turn, nodded back at Dager, as if saying that he should do the talk. Dager looked at the thirty or so clones and turned on his speaker. Listen up boys. Get in position. We are coming in hot, and we will take that base fast and easy. Remember our orders, if any of you see the separatist weapon tell the general. Now, get ready. Dager went to the left side, where General D and Commander Keeley were. He prepared his DC-15A and stood at their side. General D turned on his lightsaber, and on Dager left Commander Keeley took out his 2 DC-17. Brain went to his right, and Hell Squad entered position behind him. Cell put his hand on his shoulder, and Dager nodded to all the members of Hell Squad. The clones lifted their weapons. The doors opened. Chapter 40 Lasers hit everywhere. The lightsaber of General D swung crazily, but it wasn't able to stop every shot. By luck no clone of Hell Squad was hit. Dager jumped of the lot. His feet hit the soil and he ducked behind a tree. He looked to the left, quickly taking note of the droid defenses. Blast shields had been put in four or five locations, but it appeared that most of their defenses were composed of boxes hurriedly moved. Those were just the outer defenses though, further away was the air base. It was one of the easy-to-build droid bases, walls ten meters tall, holes on the top for the droids to shoot. There was one dwarf spider droid on each of the four corners. Towering over the walls was one C-9979 landing craft. The four wings of the C-9979 were able to carry thousands of clankers, but Dager was sure that every single clone of the 303rd was worth ten droids. By now the clones have got out of the gunship, and were taking cover. Meanwhile, dozens of other lots were landing. The two dwarf spider droids that were able to fire at them made quite a mess, even blowing up one or two gunships. However, the clone fire was annihilating their outer ring of defenses. Also, they had a Jedi. Like always, General D was fighting in the front lines, although he was heavily suppressed right now. He was, however, attracting most of the enemy fire, and Dager was using this chance to fire at the droids. He fired two shots to the right and ran to the left, advancing a couple dozen of meters before the droids aimed at him again. Commander Keeley talked to him through his comlink. Dager, take the left, I am taking the right. The general will attract their attention, and we sneak around them. When we are in position we pincer them from two sides. What about the clankers on the walls, and those two spider droids? Hit and run. Commander Keeley cut off his communications, so Dager had no other option but doing as he was told. He waited until General D had jumped out and started crawling. He used the bushes and logs to cover his body as he passed, and it seemed to work. He got behind the enemy lines, just before the walls. If he advanced any further they would be able to detect him. Dager contacted Commander Keeley, careful to speak softly. I'm in position Commander. Wait. I had to take a detour around some of them. Give me ten seconds, and when you hear me fire, do it. Seconds passed at snail pace, as Dager was worried he would be noticed. No one did. When five seconds had passed he crawled a little more forward, taking the risk of been seen, so he could have a clear shot. The droid's backs were turned towards him, but there were at least a dozen of them. And that was just the nearest barricade, there were a few more. Dager really had no idea how he and the commander were going to survive the fire from both the droids outside and on the walls, but he trusted Commander Keeley. Ten seconds, and nothing happened. Dager griped the hilt of his DC-15A, his finger slightly pressing the trigger. Eleven seconds. Twelve. Thirteen. Bang, bang. Two droids on the other side of the barricade lost their heads. Dager fired, aiming for a target a bit easier to hit, their bodies. One, two, three droids went down on his side, 
and two more on the other. Six remained. Deja rolled to the side, dodging the laser fire from the droids. He fired two more times, getting one droid, but missing the other one. Commander Keeley ran out of his position, firing his DC-17, destroying almost all the droids. Deja got up and fired his DC-15A, his shots and Commander Keeley ones hitting the last droids at the same time. Everything took less than 15 seconds. Chapter 41 The droids on the walls finally started shooting at them. It was at this moment that Commander Keeley said something that made Dager think he was crazy, and he himself even more by following it. Run to the walls. What? However, he ran. Possibility the stupid idea of his short life, as he was now stuck between a solid and tall wall and dozens of E5s. And then Commander Keeley threw one of his DC 17s to him. Use the hooks. Light struck Dager mind. The idea was at the same time ingenious and crazy, but it could work. Actually, Dager felt it would work. Commander Keeley aimed his weapon to one of the holes in the wall from which droids were shooting. The he clicked some button and a metal cable, with a X shaped head penetrated the thinner metal pieces that made the border of the hole. Using both his arms, Commander Keeley started climbing his way up. Dejo found the hook button on the DC-17 and fired it, the recoil stronger than he thought, making his aim go up a little. The cable went directly through the window, and hit something inside. Dejo pulled it to make sure it was strong enough to take on his weight. The cable dragged something for a little, and then tensed up. Dejo ignored his uneasiness and started climbing. The droids on the outside had turned and fired at him and Commander Keeley, and lasers hit around him, one even grazing his shoulder, leaving a dark mark on it, but not hurting him. Slightly above him, Commander Keeley had reached the holes, and pulled himself inside. Immediately laser fire was heard, and somehow 1B1 droid was thrown out. Deja reached the hole, and mimicking Commander Keeley, held on to the sides, detached the cable, and pulled himself. On the walls there was actually only a metal floor, going all around the base, with stairs here and there. It was only a couple meters wide, so two careless steps could lead to a ten meters fall. From above, Dejo could see the ground level of the air base, on which were a few vulture droids and, of course, the C-9979. And there were also droids, many of them. On the top, where Dejo and Commander Keeley were, droids were divided into groups of five, one group on each hole. Deja had hit one of those droids with the cable, and the hook trespassed his front and appeared on his back. Maybe because of the loud noise outside, only the nearest droids have noticed them, giving the chance for them to clear up the droids on their side. Deja used the DC-17, faster and better for close distances, and shot the droids point-blank. Commander Keeley was doing the same, and when his ammo was over he used the butt of his DC-17 to back-punch one of the droids, sending him tumbling backwards, and getting on the way of the others. He picked up one of the droids E-5, and knelt down, turning and firing to the other side. Deja was a bit more violent and the ammunition of his DC-17 was over. He dropped it and picked up his DC-15A, which he had put on his back to climb, grabbed it by the barrel, and swung it like a club. The unlucky droid he had chosen was sent flying, out of the wall and onto the ground one level below. Dejo twirled his gun around, and fired, so close to the droids that the blue laser passed through the first droid and hit the second. Their side of the wall was now clear, but the small skirmish was enough to attract not only the droids in the other walls but also those onto the ground, who were surrounding the droid Dejo had thrown down. Chapter 42 Commander Keeley looked at Dejo, who in turn asked him a question. What now commander? There is only half a base aiming at us. Well. I only planned until this point. I didn't think we would make this far this fast. Either they are worse than we thought or we are much better than we thought. But now is not the time to talk. We have to find some cover, take the stairs. They ran towards the stairs that lead downwards, getting some cover behind some containers, but if the droids used a pincer move, from up and down, they wouldn't be able to survive five seconds. Dager, any idea on what do we do? Sir, that might sound even crazier than the ideas I had before, 
but I think there is an easy way to complete the mission, and maybe even come out alive. The commander fired a bit from the corner, at least for now keeping the droids below them away. I'm interested. What is this way? Deja knelt down and aimed upwards, taking down a few brave, and dumb, droids who tried to charge them. You see those red barrels over there? If I ain't wrong they should be Tabana gas. See that they are connected to those vultures. If we blow the barrels then we start a chain reaction. Yeah, and probably we will go to hell with it. Are you up to it commander? Any doubt? When I count three. One. Two. Three. They got out from behind the containers and fired. The big barrels were an easy target for experienced shooters like them. At first there was no reaction, even when the lasers hit. However, after a few shots hit the same place, the barrels finally exploded. A wave of heat passed by, throwing them onto the ground. The Tabana gas burned green, and as the fire ignited the gas inside the hoses, green flowers of fire were formed. When it finally got to vulture droids, shrapnel flew everywhere, dismembering the droids near. By now no droid was paying attention to Dager and Keeley, neither they were able to. Fire started to spread through the whole base, and firefighter droids were trying to put it out, without success. Oh ho! Commander, I think we might have a slight problem. The fire had made its way up the C-9979, and even if it didn't blow, even if it just fell it would be disastrous. Danger, let's go back the way we came. Up, now. They run up the stairs, and found themselves back into the top of the walls. The droids were too worried about the already out-of-control fire to go after them, so they faced no impediments. Commander Keeley got to the cables they used to come in and jumped, Dager following suit. The droids outside had already died, but after seeing the fire General D had tactfully ordered the 303rd to stay their advance. Dager and Commander Keeley were already quite a distance away when the C-9979 finally couldn't hold on anymore. An explosion bigger than the others sounded and then it fell, crushing the west wall. The whole air base was on fire, and Dager was sure that there was no chance any droid survived it. Brain approached them. Sir, I think when the general said take the air base, he didn't mean set it on fire. Ha 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 ha. You know Dager, I think this trooper here is right. Well commander, I can't take all the credit to myself. If it wasn't because of you I wouldn't even have gotten inside the air base. General D approached them, and the clones got in standard military position. General. Good job you too. On fire or not, this base won't be able to send any air support to Count Dooku. Any sign of the separatist weapon? Nothing sir. But I think I know where it is. And where is it Dager? Dager pointed to somewhere behind General D. There, a black pillar was growing larger by the second. Chapter 43 Commander, get me a lot. I am going with you sir. No you aren't Keeley. Jedis might be able to survive this thing, but clones don't stand a chance. Search the base, what is left of it. Make sure there are no separatists left. Soon a lot arrived, and General D embarked on it, going to the still growing pillar of black. The clones made a perimeter around the air base, and groups started searching for anything that could be salvaged. Hell Squad had long passed their time of guard duty, and, for the envy of all 303rd, were chilling while they did the heavy work. Dager was talking to Commander Keeley, both of them looking uncomfortably to the Black Pillar. Commander, it is in the south. Maybe we should contact Commander Cody, and see if he has any information. Already did it Dager. He said that General Kenobi ordered them to retreat as soon as the Separatist activated the weapon. But. Have you noticed it is different from last time? It isn't a bubble anymore. I hope that is good. Coming from the Separatist I doubt it can be any good. Tech interrupted them to show that something had changed. The black pillar had dimmed, and it was slowly disappearing. The moment it totally disappeared a mushroom cloud took its place. Commander Keeley activated his comlink, trying to get in contact with General D. General. Can you hear me General? Keeley. Is everything alright General? That appears to be one big explosion. 
It was. The harvester was destroyed, together with the rest of the weapon. Quite surprisingly, it wasn't any Jedi Master, but young Skywalker who did it. I think we should expect to work with him in the future, as he seems to be about to take the challenges to become a Jedi Master. General D interrupted himself, and gave a dry laugh. I am getting off track. What matters is that our campaign on Thule is over, and the galaxy will never see such a terrifying weapon once again. Unfortunately Count Dooku escaped, although his bounty hunter perished. So, what do we do now sir? Be ready to leave, and wait for new orders. I am going to the sincerity directly, there are still some matters I need to discuss with Master Windu. Meanwhile we are going to come get you. We are waiting sir. After the call was over Commander Keeley turned to Dajer, who was listening. Let's go, this war is not over yet. Later, on the sincerity. General D passed a memorial to Commander Keeley, who later passed it to Dajer. On it was written the next assignment of the 303rd. Dajer looked at General D, and couldn't help but ask. General, are we being assigned to guard duty? Why? The 303rd had stellar results, and so far we haven't lost one battle. Which is why we are receiving such a task danger. You, as a clone, should understand it better than anyone. Take Keeley as example, I am sure he is as unhappy as you, but he didn't complain. You know why danger. Danger was in silence, extremely surprised. He hadn't expected that a complaint he made lightly would result in such a scolding. I'm sorry sir. The Jedi continued as if he had not heard what Dajer answered. He didn't complain because he know his position as a soldier, and more than that, he knows how important that planet is not only for the Republic, but also for the clones. The sincerity shook lightly, and they entered hyperspace. General D turned to the front of the ship, showing his back to Dajer and Commander Keeley. Prepare yourselves gentlemen. You are going home. You are going to Kamino. Chapter 44 Two days later the Sincerity landed on a platform next to Topoka City, on Kamino. As always, it was raining, the only weather that the planet had. Dark green water made up for the entire planet, except its core, which was dozens of thousands meters deep. The access ramp on the back of the Sincerity got down, and the 303rd Attack Legion started to march out neatly. After all the soldiers got out, it was the AT-TS and AT-XTS turn. They were directed by the Kamino security team, a specialized legion, to their quarters. Not even the rain could make Hell Squad feel down. No matter how disappointed they were for being taken out of the front lines, returning to their home planet was still an amazing sensation. Dajer was approached by one of the Kamino troopers, recognizable by his gray shoulder armor. Hell Squad. That is us. Follow me. You were allocated somewhere else. Hell Squad left formation, and under the clone lead went to a separate platform. The clone explained that this platform was reserved to special units, such as Hell Squad. After they arrived at the door, the Kamino trooper took off his helmet and looked at them expectantly. Sir, if you don't mind me asking, but how is the battlefield like? Dajer could understand why the clone would ask that. The Kamino security team received some of the best training of the clone army, but unless Kamino was attacked they would never use it. It is at the same time horrible and impressive. However, no clone who ever fought would wish that for a brother. The clone looked like he wanted to ask something else, but in the end he didn't, and just saluted Hell Squad before he left. Keck watched as he left. Well sir, you did a good job scaring this one. Brain intervened. That is good. If he ever have to fight then he might survive more than the others. 3-4 gave Brain a light punch. Enough of this guys. We just got back home and you are already talking about those gloomy things. Ignoring his bickering squad, Dajer entered their facilities. It was a long hall, with doors on both sides, most of them unmarked. Only two had something written in the panels, the first one being, Hell Squad, and the second, Deep Squad. As Hell Squad was moving in, the door of Deep Squad room opened, and a clone wearing blue clothes, not armor, walked out. He seemed surprised, but then stuck his head inside the room from which he came and said something. 
After doing that he extended his hand, and shook it with every one of Hell Squad before introducing himself. Hello brothers. Shock, Deep Squad. I am Dager, Hell Squad leader. Those are Brain, Tech, 3-4, Cell, Dab and Metal. More clones wearing the same blue clothes walked out, a total of ten. One of them, who had long hair, unusual in clones, walked forward. Welcome home Hell Squad. My name is Brody, and I am the leader of Deep Squad. Always good to meet a brother. Which legion are you under? We serve General Shock T, here on Kamino. That doesn't mean, though, that we don't know how to fight. Dajer easily detected the need for recognition on Brody voice. Maybe because they haven't actually gone to battles, but they seemed afraid that the other clones would think they were cowards. Dajer suspected that every clone of the Kamino security team felt the same. It was a pleasure to meet you Deep Squad, but now we have to organize ourselves. It won't be long before we receive our tasks. If you need help or maybe a guide, feel free to ask. As Hell Squad members organized their few possessions, weapons and armor, Dajer went outside. The sincerity was refueling and preparing to go to orbit, where it would stay until they were called to battle again. Dajer checked on Hell Squad, and seeing that some of them had already drifted into sleep, he decided to go to the mess alone. Chapter 45 On the glass corridors of Topoka City a clone with a shaved head was walking. His once clean white armor was now dusty and scarred. When he passed by other clones they would greet him, and on one occasion, when he passed by a group of teenager clone cadets they looked up impressed. Dajer was immersed on his own thoughts as he walked to the canteen. Little more than a month had passed since he himself was a cadet walking on the same halls, but his mentality had changed a lot. Due to him being so absorbed on his thoughts he didn't see a figure coming straight towards him. They crashed on each other, Dajer only slightly shaking, but the figure dropped to the ground. Dajer looked at him, surprised that he found a familiar face so soon. 99. I am so sorry. CT 4063. It is. Cough, cough. It is good to see you. How are you doing? My name is Dajer now, and I'm fine 99. I am even better now that we are home. Any big changes here on the last month? Yes, yes. A lot actually. Cough. Berm. One Jedi, Shock T came to here. She has taken over the clone production control, but she is not bad. Not bad at all. She treats the clones much better than those bounty hunters that train the cadets. Bounty hunters? Yeah. Two of them, Brick and LS. They are good trainers, and they do a good job. Cough, cough. A good job training the cadets. But I feel they are too strict to the young cadets. Well, maybe I will meet those bounty hunters later, and have a look at their training methods. It was good to see you again 99. We probably are staying here for quite some time, so I will see you again. Bye, bye. Send my greetings to our brothers on the 303rd. Dajer watched the hunched back of 99. The poor clone was totally deformed, and completely inept to battle. However, he never gave up, and still fought his own way, giving many cadets, including Dajer, the support they needed to get through some of the most difficult moments of their training. Dajer pitted 99, for he had more fighting spirit than any clone Dajer ever met, but couldn't use it on a real battle. Remembering his initial intent of eating something, Dajer started walking once again, following the path he had treaded upon as a cadet, going to the canteen. He passed by many more clones, the Kamino troopers patrolling, cadets of all ages just walking around and soldiers like him, who had just returning and were going to the mess. On his way he met a good number of 303rd clones, and when they arrived at the mess the group had grown by a considerable amount. The doors slid up, showing a big building with dozens of long tables. Like most things on Kamino, the canteen was white, making he feel as if he had entered a white box. When the clones of the 303rd Attack Legion entered the white canteen, their dirty armor immediately made them the focus of attention. Uncountable identical faces turned to them, and when they looked back the heads turned to their food once again. 
their dirty armors, and the sharpened eyes of men who passed by countless life and death situations intimidated most of the clones on the mess, brothers or not. Of course not all of them, as some of the soldiers already on the canteen were the same as them. On one table, a group of clones looked up, and raised their forks to greet Dajer and the others. Those clones had the same scorched armor, and Dajer could tell they had also been to the war front. They were most probably the 182nd Legion, who was also stationed on Kamino. Chapter 46 On a building on the central platform of Topoka City. A female Tigruta, with red skin and blue and white protuberances on her head, was talking to General D. She appeared to be very calm as if nothing could make her feel worried. Master D, I understand how important those facilities are for the Republic better than anyone, however, I still think the High Council is wrong about positioning you here. Any danger at the Kaminoans might suffer has to be treated as a peril to the Republic Corps itself. Our informants have enough proof for us to believe that the Separatists are mounting an attack. Then, tell me Master D, how are the Separatists supposed to get past dozens of highly fortified Republic systems and still have a big enough force to destroy Kamino? That is. Unknown yet. But the Council is so sure that the attack is going to happen that they have sent not only me but also another group of Jedis, who are on their way. If what you are saying is true, then may the Force be with us. Hell Squad didn't have much to do on Kamino. Apart from the occasional guard duty, their only occupation was staying ready to defend all times. They spent most of their free time watching the cadets run the test course, a hobby that Cell had discovered and the other members of Hell Squad had adopted. At this moment Hell Squad was on the bleachers, watching a squad of five clones trying to clear the course. B1 and B2 battle droids reconfigured to fire non-lethal shots and painted with white targets were blocking the clones. As Dajer watched the clones finally shot down the last B-2 battle droid and captured the green flag that they were protecting. That wasn't bad. But if the one on their right flank hasn't hesitated so much to advance they probably would have won without losing anybody. You can't blame him brain. He has only trained here, we wouldn't have fared much better if we were still cadets. It was at that moment that someone behind them said something calmly. Then why don't you try a trooper? They all turned quick, only to see the Tigruta that was talking to General D before of course they didn't know that. General Shock T. No need for that troopers. If you are so interested in the test runs, why don't you show the cadets what a real soldier is like? I. Hmm. If we can do it as a squad, Hell Squad would be more than happy to give the cadets a taste of what a battlefield looks like. Dajer stepped forward, and Cell gave him a thankful stare. Good. I will call all the cadets available here, and I hope that by watching you they can understand some of their own problems. Prepare yourself. Yes General. Before long at least a thousand clone cadets had filled the benches, and, as improbable as it sounded, Tech and Cell, two soldiers who had passed through dozens of life and death combats, were starting to get nervous. Man, I don't think we ever had such a big crowd watching us battle. Usually the crowd was trying to eliminate us. This lightened the mood, and Dajer directed them to the starting line. The course was made up by scattered crates, small fortifications, and at the end a tower they had to either climb or invade to get the flag. Of course, there were also many training droids, who had been placed on almost all defensive positions of the test field. Since Hell Squad was an elite unit, Shock T had decided to increase the difficulty, adding not only a lot more droids but also some droidicas. Dajer had the feeling it was going to be fun. Chapter 47 General Shock T looked down, to where Hell Squad was and used a microphone to ask if they were ready. As an answer, Dajer raised his DC-15A, and then the timer started counting. Hell Squad advanced together, as a unit to the first bit of cover. From that point onwards, every other crate or fortress they wanted to reach would be full of droids. Dajer then made a decision that the clone cadets were trained and not to do, that was direct Hell Squad to the left, where their backs would be against the wall. That meant that, although they wouldn't be flanked, they wouldn't be able to run if things got too hot. Only Dajer knew what he was thinking when he ordered that. On the benches, clones were cheering loud for them, but they all frowned when they saw Hell Squad moving to the left, 
totally against the logic. On a higher stage, General Shock T was together with the two bounty hunters, a Sinatine called Brick and an Arcona called L. Less. At this moment Brick, who before had complained a lot about the show, was impressed now. They aren't actually as bad as I thought. General Shock T looked to Brick weirdly. She had thought that he would be angry with them not following the tactic books. Why are you so impressed Brick? They are doing the opposite of what you teach. L.S. intervened. I can answer that for him, General. If soldiers without battle sense do that, it is the same as, since they wouldn't have enough space to dodge. But, as battle-hardened men, and a special unit on top of that, Hell Squad can make the most out of it. Yes, General. You might be a Jedi, but this is the first time you went to war. Then clarify for me how they are going to make the most out of it please. It is simple. They only have to take down every droid before they can fire. When Hell Squad went left, they have escaped from two different perils. The first was that the middle was lower than the rest of the terrain, so they could have been fired upon easily. The second was that there were two towers, on each side, and each one with a turret. If they have just gone to the left a little they would have gotten out of the lower terrain, and also would have a lot of covers, although both towers would still be able to fire at them, but with a smaller outpost, as there were too many obstacles. That was the strategy that all the cadets followed. However, Dager had moved Hell Squad to the extreme left, out of range from the right tower, but with little to none cover. And directly in front of the left tower. The cadets sucked a deep breath, thinking that Hell Squad was about to be annihilated, but the members of Hell Squad itself did not even look at the tower and concentrated on cleaning the droids on the ground. Only when the turret had already turned to them that Dab aimed at it and fired two shots, taking out both droids on it and eliminating the threat easily. Dager switched from crate to crate, taking shots when he could. On a small space like that his accuracy reached its peak, and every shot took out of one droid. At this time he saw a big movement from the droids on the right. It appeared that they had decided that since Hell Squad wouldn't come to them, they would come for Hell Squad. Under his helmet, Dager smirked. That was the chance he was waiting. When almost thirty droids have reunited and were marching towards them, Dager signaled to Metal. Metal, big boy, it's your turn. Chapter 48 Metal got up, his Z-6 spinning slowly. As soon as he appeared the thirty-odd droids lifted their weapons, but it was too late. A torrent of laser left the six barrels of the gun, and the front of the droid forces fell quickly. As soon as one droid fell the one behind him would be on the receiving end of the lasers, and would also be shot down pretty quick. Hell Squad had shown now that even with their backs against the wall they could still take care of the enemies easily. Many of the cadets were already thinking of using this strategy to pass their final examination. What many clones did not think, though, was how much Dager pondered before formulating his plan. Dager has taken into account different facts before he decided for the extreme left. First of all, he knew how many enemies they would face, which usually is an incognita on real battles. Second, Hell Squad had a pretty clear objective, which was that capturing the flag, and he knew that the droids would do everything to protect it, including abandoning defensive positions and agglomerating on a large group. Lastly, Hell Squad had one sniper, Dab, to take care of the towers and one heavy machine gunner, Metal, to take care of the group of droids. Those were members that normal squads didn't have, so any of the cadets who tried the same strategy would be obliterated. While Metal was taking care of the droids who came at them, Dager called Brain, and together they sprinted towards a bunch of crates twenty meters away. They knelt on the floor behind the crates, and Dager took out a droid popper. Brain, seeing his squad leader doing so, also took out one, and they both threw it over their shoulders, without even aiming. The grenades flew over some crates and landed behind some droids. Blue, electric chains zapped and the droids trembled before crashing onto the floor. With the path clear, the rest of Hell Squad advanced, and Dager signaled for Cell to go ahead. The scout carried a DC-15S, much better for close ranges, and was a specialist on close combat. Cell darted through the crates, and when he passed through a droid he would shoot it point blank. His action secured Hell Squad another 20 minutes before he was forced to stop. 
There was now an open space, and the droidikas were positioned there, their shields raised. There were five of them, and for the cadets, it was their first time seeing one. The destroyers were amongst the most dangerous infantry forces of the separatist, and therefore it was difficult for the Republic to acquire one of them. Thus, the cadets only received theoretical training about how to destroy or deactivate droidikas. This time there was no doorway on which Hell Squad could funnel them, so Dager could only go with the second best option. First, he and Hell Squad cleared all the droids on the vicinities, so they wouldn't be attacked immediately. Then, each Hell Squad members grabbed droid poppers. Their objective was to roll the grenades under the destroyer's shields, but it was a troublesome tactic. They couldn't throw it too fast or the shields would identify it as a laser or attack of some sort and block it. But, if they were to slow then they wouldn't reach the target. Remember boys, neither too slow nor too fast, just like we practiced. We have to trick their shields into thinking those here are harmless rocks and not some kind of metal ball of death. When you are ready sir. Then go. Dager threw the grenade near the ground, and it started rolling towards the droidikas, together with six others. Chapter 49 The droid poppers rolled, but only four of them passed the shields and shut down the destroyers. Metal and 3-4 have thrown them too strong, and they banged on the shield before activating harmlessly. Dab 1, on the other hand, had been too slow and didn't have enough impulse to reach the destroyer. With Androidica remaining, Dager went all out and ran in a zigzag to the droid. Thanks to his swift movements he was able to dodge the stun lasers that the droidica was firing. He put the muzzle of his DC-15A on the droid head and pulled the trigger. On the stand's brick made a hard face, thinking about how hard it was to acquire an intact droidica and reprogram it. Now with a third of the course done, and their biggest threat out of the way, Hell Squad was much more relaxed. They walked through almost the entire test course as if they weren't on a battle, but walking on a park. Cell and Brain even found the time to bicker a little, although Dager ordered them to shut up. Come on men. I know it is just a test course, but we have a thousand cadets and even a Jedi watching us. You can decide later who sleep on the top bed. Hearing that Commander Keeley and General D, who had heard of the demonstration Hell Squad was giving and wanted to see it, facepalmed. On their minds, they were thinking if it was even possible for their special squad to embarrass the 303rd more than they were already doing. Hell Squad was now faced with their last obstacle, a fortress that presented them with two options. They could either invade it, fighting door to door or they could climb from the outside, but they would be exposed to droid fire from the top and the windows. It was a treacherous choice for others, but for Hell Squad not so much. Dab would be able to shoot any droid who approached the windows from the outside, so it was an easy option. However, before they could even take out the cables they had prepared beforehand, a heavy machinery sound buzzed. From both sides of the walls, holes opened and four heavy turrets showed up. It was obvious that General Shock T had already analyzed their members, and knew what they were going to do, so she couldn't let Hell Squad had it too easy. Deja knew there was no way Hell Squad could escape from the turrets on open ground, even less if they wanted to climb. He could only command them to break into the tower, the option he liked less. The members of Hell Squad disappeared inside the tower one after another. The cadets outside couldn't see anything, but General Shock T, Brick and LS could. They had cameras inside the tower that they used to analyze the cadets during normal training. At this moment Hell Squad had only broken through the first door, and still had five floors to go. They moved organized, their leader on the front, followed by the heavy machine gunner, their medic and then the sniper in the middle. Walking backward was their mechanic, and lastly, the two clones who had been discussing earlier. The two bounty hunters were impressed by the cohesion the group showed, going from door to door, opening it and shooting the droids inside systematically. Dager opened the last door and then started going up the last set of stairs. Hell Squad had taken care of each and every droid on their way, and now the only remaining ones were those defending the flag. They didn't stand a chance. Dager walked among downed droids and grabbed the flag. The moment he touched the green flag it turned red, and the timer stopped. 1456 Chapter 50 
As soon as the chronometer stopped ticking the clone cadets got up and started cheering and clapping loudly. Such a short conclusion time was unheard of, and with turrets, droidikas, and a ton of droids, even more so. Commander Keeley also joined in the fray, and even General D had a proud smile on his face. General Shock T asked for everyone attention on the speaker and waited for all of Hell Squad to line up. Congratulations Hell Squad. You have set a new record for all clones on Kamino to break. And a difficult one on top of that. However, cadets, do not feel discouraged because of this. Those clones here are merely two months ahead of you. All you have to do is train harder and you will be able to do the same as them. I thought the whole point of us being a special squad was doing what others could never do. Cell, unconcerned as ever, whispered to Dager, who gave him a stern warning stare. However, before Dager could reprimand him, the lights turned red. General Shock T and General D pulled out their lightsabers. Hell Squad, Commander Keeley, the two bounty hunters and any of the clones of the 303rd or 182nd who were there aimed their blasters at the doors on a swift motion. The cadets, on the other hand, did not know what to do, or at least the young ones didn't. They were just standing, waiting for someone to order them. A few seconds later General Shock T received a message through her comlink. Immediately after she gave some orders to the bounty hunters, who then left, and turned to General D. You were right Master D. Kamino is under attack at this exact moment, but we still haven't identified the enemy commander. You and your legion already know what to do on this case, I believe. Don't worry my friend. Not a single droid will get past us. That said he gesticulated to Hell Squad and the 303rd clones on the training course. They immediately entered formation and followed him out of the training field. On her side, General Shock T connected the speaker to the entire base system, and her voice resounded on every corner of the cloning facilities. Shock T talking. This is a level 1 alert. Kamino security team, take up positions and prepare to hold. All clone cadets and non-essential personnel, return to your dormitories. Those who have 6 months or less to complete your training, pick your weapons at the arsenal and meet with trainers Brick and LS on platform FF203. The voice of the Tegruta Jedi repeated the warning three times, but Dager was too busy running to pay attention. In his head, he was thinking that this was the reason why the 303rd attack battalion had been moved to Kamino. The Jedi knew something was going to happen, but they decided not to tell the clones. As a soldier he knew that was the correct decision, otherwise, the men would stay on a tiring, unnecessary alarmed state, waiting for an attack that they didn't know when it would happen. Nevertheless, a small part of Dager Mind, the emotional one, thought that maybe, just maybe, he wasn't high enough on the chain of command to be trusted with this information. But now wasn't the time to think about this. Behind General D, Hell Squad ran through one corridor after another. They passed by Kamino security team members going in the same direction as them, robots and Kaminoan workers going on the opposite direction and cadets of all ages returning to their quarters. Panic, and also a bit of angry, adorned the faces of the teenager cadets who were being led by a clone sergeant to their dormitories, away from the fight. Chapter 51 Rain kept falling over the platforms, buildings, and clones of Kamino. In fact, it had started raining even heavier. The Iwas, native creatures of Kamino, used by the natives for locomotion, were jumping happily out of the water. Dozens of platforms were currently occupied by thousands of white armored men. The rain made heavy thuds when it hit their armor. From one of the compounds, a bunch of clones led by a Nikto walked out. Some of them went to join the already their clones, while the rest followed the Nikto. They arrived at the central platform, way bigger than the others, and where the cruisers landed when they needed to refuel. When they stopped they all looked up at the same time. Above them, on the distant space, massive Munificent-class frigates and Providence-class dreadnoughts, and many of the smaller Gonzati-class cruisers jumped out of hyperspace one after the other. Welcoming them were large Acclamator-class cruisers and Venator-class star destroyers, together with the small CR-90 corvettes. General D turned to his troops and lifted his lightsaber. Soldiers. Get to your positions. I don't think I need to explain how important it is that we defend Kamino. 
Am I right? Yes sir. After the resounding response, the clone started to move and spread, and General D turned to Keeley in danger. Now let's hope that Admiral Dow can keep those ships away long enough for us to prepare our defenses. May the force be with us. Up and above, past the black clouds and the green sky of Kamino. On the sincerity, a Navy officer with many different symbols on his uniform was observing the starry space, now occupied by droid warships. His short, military-style hair gave him a strong and dangerous look. Behind him, another officer came running and gave him a data pad. He didn't even look at it. What is the situation, Lieutenant? Bad, Admiral. Our scanners detected three Providence-class dreadnoughts, 26 Munificent-class frigates, and 165 Gonzati-class cruisers. Their fighters' numbers are unknown by now, but according to our calculations there should be. Enough. Their numbers are unimportant. General D orders are to defend Kamino till our last starfighter, and so we will. Admiral Dow walked back to the hologram table, taking his eyes off the magnitude sight of both Republic and CIS ships about to collide. Connect me with Admirals Yazeb, Shantu, and Yularen. We will be responsible for holding Section 3. Sections 1, 2, and 4 will have to find their own ways. Rosal's Arc 170 was heading Steel Battalion 183 Starfighters. Each Arc 170 needed three crew members plus an astromech to work perfectly. Rosal had divided Steel Battalion into three groups, each with 61 Starfighters, arranged on the usual V attack formation. The Republic had many similar battalions, scattered all around the planet of Kamino, but even so, they were nothing compared to the number of vulture droids about to be thrown on them. They had an advantage that made up for this though. The vulture droids flew on a different number of patterns, but the pilots were able to grasp them quickly. Batch after batch of vultures left the hangars of the Munificent class frigates and the Providence class dreadnoughts, not to count the many Gonzati class cruisers, smaller but still lethal. Rosal, who was piloting, called his co-pilot, in the seat behind him. Hey, Bat, how are you doing there? Systems Online Captain we are ready to go. Spark, how is my favorite gunner doing? On standby to blow some droids captain. Rosal pressed a button on his panel, connecting him to the rest of Steel Battalion. Steel Battalion, this is Steel 1. Light up your engines. Steel 2 ready. Steel 3 on standby. Steel 4 can't wait. Steel 5 locked and ready to go. Bat confirmed that Steel Battalion was prepared, and Rosal passed on the information to an officer on the capital ship, the Sincerity. The officer wrote down everything he heard from all battalions and screamed to the top part of the bridge. Admiral. All ships ready and on standby. Admiral Dow responded simply. Wait for confirmation. Chapter 52. Admiral Dow was waiting for the Separatist to make their move. To him, battles were like Dejeric games. He had already made his move by setting up his defenses. Now was the time for the enemy commander to make his, or hers, as they didn't even know who it was yet. Dap was not a clone, but he was already an admiral on the Old Republic Army for years before the Clone Wars began. He had worked his way up the ranks and was an expert on pacification and defense missions. His years of experience told him that since the enemy had not to attack immediately there were three paths that the enemy could choose. The first one was that they were expecting reinforcements, and were not worried about time. They could also be waiting for contact from the Republic, probably to order that the clone army surrendered unconditionally. Lastly, the Separatist could be trying to intimidate them, by showing their numbers and firepower. Either way, Dow knew that on any of those situations the enemy would have to contact them first. Dow certainly would not surrender, even if that cost him his life. He could also bet that the clankers weren't waiting for reinforcements unless they were really stupid. Kamino was the heart of the Grand Army of the Republic. Even if the Separatists have found a secret hyperspace path that the Republic didn't know about, and caught them by surprise, that would only buy them a few hours at most. So, the only option was that the Separatist leader was trying to apply to press on the defending forces, and hoping to crush their morale. 
Then, according to Dao deductions, the enemy commander would say that the Republic had no chance and will be destroyed, all of this in hopes that the clones fight with a little bit less spirit. For all that Dao knew, those were the worst kind of enemy. An enemy that uses all his strength to eliminate you is scary, but one who tries to decrease your forces, both physically and mentally, on every which way before attacking is absolutely terrifying. Admiral. Incoming transmission from their capital ship. All of our command ships are receiving it. Put it on the table. Facing the Republic ships, on the biggest of the Providence-class dreadnoughts, called Trambok-1. Different from the other ships of the Trade Federation, the crew members of the Trambok-1 were not B-1 battle droids, but Mon Calamarians. They had red or green skin and looked many alike fishes, a necessity considering the planet they came from. Besides the rows of deactivated battle droids on the hangar areas, there wasn't a single other robot on the entire ship. Even cleaning and transportation were made by Mon Calamarians. If it wasn't for the fact that the ship was clearly a separatist dreadnought then, and one looked only to the crew, they might think it was a commercial ship. On the bridge, a glass compartment supported by a part of the ship, that towered over the rest of the dreadnought, there was a big chair, decorated with images of aquatic creatures. The Mon Calamari sitting on the chair was incredibly small, looking like a child next to the others, but he had abstract tattoos all over his arms and faces. On the Mon Calamari traditions, those tattoos were only given to a leader and a hunter who fought countless of the dangerous creatures on Mon Kala and survived. One of the Mon Calamari crew members went to him and bowed respectfully before rising and giving his message. We are ready to transmit her message commander. Pass me to all of their capital ships. Another Mon Calamari went to the chair and also bowed before taking out a hologram projector from his sleeves. The Mon Calamari on the chair straightened up and started talking. Admirals, I see your tactics didn't work on you. The projections kept quiet, waiting for their opponent to finish talking. Since things are like this I won't delay my attack anymore. As a sign of respect, I am warning you. 10 Minutes Chapter 53 Since things are like this I won't delay my attack anymore. As a sign of respect, I am warning you. 10 Minutes As soon as the projection of the Mon Calamari disappeared Dao grabbed the nearest clone by his shoulders. Discover who in the galaxy our opponent is. I want to know everything, from his name to the battles he participated. The clone quickly went to do as he was ordered, but Admiral Shantu made it unnecessary. His name is Mirai. A Mon Calamari who received many honors from the Mon Calamari king for destroying Quaran ships on their civil war. After Mon Kala joined the Republic he tried to convince them that they have chosen the wrong side. Once nobody listened he defected to the Separatist with his crew. Shantu was usually a happy and motivated admiral, but when he talked about Mirai his tone took a turn to worst. One admiral with a missing ear looked at Shantu and asked the question on everybody's head. And. How do you know all of that Shantu? I ordered a complete investigation on him after he crushed three Aklamator class cruisers on the Kessel sector four weeks ago. Less than half of their crew survived. The 313th lost many good men that day, and the Republic lost Kessel Sector. Solemn faces disappeared one by one as the admirals turned their attention to their troops and the imminent battle. Dao ordered his starfighters to start their engines. Rosal received steel battalion orders. Wait for the enemy to engage and don't go too far. Protecting the planet is our priority. Minutes passed slowly as the vultures rearranged their formations, entering on full attack positions, V, shape similar to the Republic ones. It seemed that it would be a frontal confrontation. Differently from Geonosis, this time the enemy was prepared for them. Rosal could already see the start of the battle playing on his head. The two sides will collide, ships will explode and they would pass by each other. Then, it would be the big ship's turn firing their turbolaser cannons at each other. Detecting heat signatures ahead captain. The clankers are warming up their engines. Rosal let their channel open, so he wouldn't have to worry about pressing any unnecessary buttons on the middle of the battle. He had lost enough brothers to learn that a moment of distraction could cost not only his life but others too. Rosal totally lit up his ARC-170, 
and Spark turned the turrets to the direction where the thousands of droids were. The voice of an officer came through. Here they come. Steel Battalion. Move out. Rosal accelerated the ARC-170 to his maximum in less than five seconds. The vultures were closer and closer. With the side of his vision, he saw the fighting erupting on other sections. Bat warned him. Three parsecs. Two and a half. Captain. Two. Rosal aim locked on the front vulture droid. His thumbs pressed both triggers and blue laser left the frontal cannons of the ARC-170. Two flashes of blue traveled thereon through the vacuum of empty space. There was no sound, only the two lonely blue lasers flying at light speed. Their destination, a vulture droid, twisted out of way, but it was too late. The lasers found its home on the vulture right wing, sending it spinning before it blew. The first eliminate went to the Republic, but who knew how many more were needed before they could call it a day. Obviously, Rosal didn't have the time to think about it now. One vulture might have been shot, but the separatists were not to be outdone. Red and blue laser intertwined in the space. Rosal pulled the yoke hard, making the ARC-170 go even faster. One starfighter to his right exploded. Spark was spamming fire on the incoming mass of droids. Bat was still giving orientations. We lost Steel 46. One parsec to them sir. Zero. Five. Steel 87 out of combat but still alive. Rosal didn't need the warnings to see that they were about to hit the vulture droids. Keep going boys. Cut right through them and turn quickly. Let's beat those droids in scrap metal. Chapter 54 Half of the space around Kamino was filled by big and small ships and starfighters, red and blue lasers, all in the still and noiseless vacuum of space. Steel Battalion was one of the many groups of starfighters, and they were about to pass straight through a group of vulture droids double their number. Rosal spun his ARC-170 to the left, doing full 360 spins, all the while firing. Spark, fire straight ahead. We have to cut a path in their midst. Steel Battalion, focus all your fire up front. I am not sure I can do that sir, I've lost my gunner. Do what you can. Every eliminate counts on this battle. Captain, they hit my stabilizers. I am losing contract. Steel 7. Ferret. We lost him, Captain. Rosal wanted to curse and mourn at the same time, but the vultures were already in front of him. Luckily Spark has turned the turrets right on time, and they blitzed their way through the remains of a vulture. Shadows passed by him, almost invisible in contrast with the dark space, if it wasn't for the blur their red, cold, mechanical eyes left behind. For a few moments, he couldn't even see what he was shooting. Just beside him Steel 81 and two vulture droids crashed on each other leaving almost nothing. And then they were out of the cloud of droids. Rosal made a sharp turn, passing awfully close to some of his own brother starfighters. The short encounter had left behind many remains of Republic and Separatist combatants. And the big toys haven't even entered the fray yet. As the pilots of the 303rd made the turn, the vultures kept going without looking back, straight to the Republic cruisers. Come on brothers. Their objective is our home below us, but they have to pass by our cruisers first. We can't let them do that. Let's play catch. Rosal speed up his ARC-170. The battle had only started. Farrell didn't have much to do now besides watch and analyze. As the admiral of the 303rd, his focus was on his legion ships, but he still kept an eye for any Republic cruiser needing reinforcements. Report. Yes Admiral. We lost a lot of pilots on the first engagement, and Rast Battalion was hit pretty hard by some torpedoes. But overall we took more of them than they took from us. We are still tabulating the exact numbers. That was similar to what Farrell was seeing outside. Clones and vultures had passed by each other, both sides suffering severe losses, but the droids more than the Republic. However, now was the time for the clone pilots to show their specialty, persecution. Their analysis of the vultures' patterns of flight, and their instincts, or, as the soldiers like to call, senses, made they much better at pursuit. 
as if to prove his thoughts an officer screamed from below the bridge. Vultures incoming sir. They should be trying to destroy us and invade the planet. Arc 170's on hot pursuit. All turrets open fire. Cannons hold for now. Charge and wait for their frigates to come into range. What Farrell was really worried about were not the vultures, but the big ships of the Separatists. Even if some small droids passed through their blockade they wouldn't be able to do much damage. But if just one of the Munificent class frigates got to the surface it could destroy dozens of installations and murder hundreds of thousands of embryos and newborn clones. Not to talk about what a Providence class dreadnought would do. Farrell ordered the Republic fleet to hold ground, not actively attacking, but focusing on destroying the incoming vulture droids. Some of the vultures passed really close to the sincerity, but their small lasers didn't do much against the shields. And those who came close enough to fire were also on the range of the sincerity turrets. But the droid navy was relentless and knew no fear. They kept coming despite losing hundreds, and soon their proton torpedoes started amounting for something. One of the CR-90 sent a call for help, but even when the backup arrived it couldn't hold. Its shields went off, and a round of torpedoes blew it. Chapter 55 Rosal and ten pilots of Steel Battalion were part of the group sent to give the corvette backup, so when they failed Rosal decided he wouldn't leave the droids unscathed. Rosal took three ARC 170s with him and started chasing a group of vulture droids, flying in the middle of the remains of the CR-90. When Rosal entered persecution he focused only on his target. Before his visors, the only thing was the vultures. Bat prepared the ion torpedoes. The gifts are ready sir. Rosal locked his aim not on the vulture droids, but in a point somewhere in the middle of them. His computer bipped that he was aiming at the wrong place, but Rosal trusted his senses and pressed the trigger. Torpedo one off. The torpedo flew, leaving behind blue and white sparks. The torpedo almost scraped off the painting of one of the vultures, but hit bullseye. The explosion threw the vulture droid's formation in disarray, sending five or six of them out of control, some crashing on others and some exploding directly. Rosal didn't give them a chance to catch their breath. Torpedo two off. Another torpedo flew, but this time one vulture droid got on the way, and they took only one enemy out. Bat touched some buttons and keys on the control panel. Torpedoes 3 and 4 ready captain. You might want to hold them for now sir. Their small cruisers are getting into range. Spark, working not only as a gunner but also as a spotter, saw the Gonzati class cruisers starting to get into the battle and warned them. Almost at the same time, they received orders from their command ships ordering them to attack the Gonzati class cruisers. Rosal didn't hesitate, separating steel battalion on pre-existing divisions for those situations. Iron and Thorn squadrons, attack the cruiser at marker 187 to 690. Copper and Brown squadrons, take out the one at 187 to 485. Cooperate with each other, if it is too risk fall back, regroup and focus on one of them. Steel 127, Steel 66, Stell 43, Steel 90, and Shell squadron follow me. Thorn leader is down sir. Yonk, you are the new Thorn leader. Rosal moved Steel 1 to the cruiser he decided to attack, but with them on the offensive, it was the droids' time to chase. Two vulture droids were on their tail, and even with Spark doing his best they were having difficulties shaking them off. Steel 1 needs assistance. We got two of them following us. Copy that. Steel 66 on the way to help, Captain. Rosal made a lot of sharp turns and even tried to rotate, but the vultures kept hot on them. Another Arc 170 appeared behind them, support finally arriving. The Arc 170 fired his two frontal cannons, spraying on the vultures. One of them exploded, blinding both Steel 66 and the other vulture temporarily. Spark took the chance, and the top turret tore the vulture droid to pieces. Now that their backs clean Rosal and his men concentrated on the attack. The Gonzati class cruisers weren't big, and because of that had fewer defenses. They were used mostly as troops transports and were probably carrying the droids supposed to drop on Kamino. Those following me, go ahead and take out their shields. Steel 43 and I will deliver the torpedoes. 
Roger that. Rosal slowed just enough for the other starfighters to overtake him. Yonk voice came through the comms. Enemy ship at 187 to 690 is falling captain. Good job Thorn Squadron, Iron Squadron. Go give support to the attack on their other cruiser. In front of Rosal, the ARC 170s accompanying him fired a volley of lasers on the Gonzati class cruiser, wearing out its shields, but Shell Squadron took one loss on the process. Rosal and Steel 43 prepared their ion torpedoes and took over the attack, flying extremely close to the enemy ship, and bombarding the heck out of the bridge. Without its command center, the cruiser quickly went down, falling towards Kamino. Rosal turned around and went looking for more targets. On the sincerity. Admiral, their frigates are in range. Scanners indicate that they are coming right to us. Dao showed some excitation on his face. The real battle was about to begin. All batteries, concentrate your fire on the nearest frigate. We have to take out as many as possible before the dreadnoughts arrive. Chapter 56 The Sincerity was a Venator-class cruiser, which means it had a good number of heavy turbolaser cannons, which were able to wreck a ship without shields in a few minutes. Also, since the Venator-class cruisers were bigger and more advanced than the Acclimator-class ones, they had a longer range. So, the Sincerity was the first Republic ship to open fire. Huge blue lasers impacted on the Munificent-class frigate's shields. Each round that the heavy turbolaser cannons fired need about 30 seconds to recharge, but took huge chunks out of the enemy. The Separatist frigates were still holding at the moment, but their ships shook each time a shot connected. However, the Sincerity range vantage didn't last much. When the Munificent-class frigates started taking too much fire, the Gonzati class cruisers took the lead and went forward to attack. The Republic cruisers started facing some problems, although a good number of small Separatist cruisers went down. But the objective of the Separatists wasn't to destroy all Republic ships, but have a small group breakthrough. In fact, Dow suspected that the Munificent class frigates were being used as bait, but he couldn't move critical troops because of that. He didn't have ships he could move. So, he decided that he would wait and see what cards the Separatist had. That was his biggest mistake. Before he knew one munificent class frigate suddenly accelerated, its cannon silent, as if there was no one on it. Admiral. It is heading straight toward us. I can see that. Destroy it. Now. At that moment that the biggest trick of the Separatist showed itself. When the lasers landed on the front of the frigate, big explosions happened. They have no shields admiral. And no weapons. It appears that all their power is on their thrusters. What are they doing? Oh. Darn it, they got us. Evasive maneuvers, quickly. But it was too late. The frigate torn front crashed on the sincerity, opening a rhombus on the cruiser belly. The entire ship tilted sideways, and inside it clones were thrown in the air as if they were dolls. A gigantic gap was opened on the defensive ring around Kamino, and close to 20 Gonzati class cruisers crossed it and entered the planet atmosphere. On the Sincerity Bridge, Admiral Dao got up, in his head a wound bleeding, and his left leg limping. But he couldn't feel his wounds, and went to the semi-destroyed hologram table. On the planet below, Dager saw everything. Even if he wasn't using his binoculars, the shocking sign of two massive ships crashing in each other was clear. He could also see the twenty-odd Separatist cruisers entering Kamino. One transmission from General D. Capital ship arrived. On it a man that Dejer recognized as Admiral Dao appeared with a bleeding head. I am so sorry General D. The droids passed through our defensive line. I never expected that scum to use one of their frigates as a weapon. You have 18 small enemy cruisers going for you. Don't worry about it Admiral. You did your best, the Separatists don't view their troops as we do with ours. They will need more than a few cruisers worth of droids to take Kamino. Just make sure that their bigger ships don't make it through. Admiral Dow didn't hear the entirety of General D words, he passed out before. Keeley, every man on his position, they will do a ground attack. Their main targets will be the main reactor, the DNA room and the incubation area. Make sure our defenses there are strong enough. 
Yes, General. I will go talk to my fellow Jedi, let them know about this on first hand. Don't worry General, we will be all set when you are back. May the Force be with us. General D went way to talk with the other Jedi, and Commander Keeley turned to Dager. The Force may be good, but I trust a clone with a good blaster more. Hell Squad, I want you here, ready to give the Clankers a welcome they will never forget. Our objective is to stop them before they can enter the buildings. When we are outnumbered we retreat to a better position and start again. Copy that? Yes Commander. Chapter 57 As the men of the 303rd got into position General D came back just long enough to take about half of the Clone Legion to protect the incubation area and the DNA room. Before leaving he told them about the situation. Of the 18 Gonzati class cruisers, three of them were coming towards Dager position. That was a lot of droids, but Dager had confidence that the 303rd would eliminate at least half of them on the outside. The open platforms of Kamino were optimal to defend and terrible to attack. If the defending forces were well positioned they could hold out for a good amount of time. With the enemy invasion force drawing closer and closer, Commander Keeley took Dager on a last-minute check of their defenses. Any ideas if there is any improvement we can make Dager? Dager analyzed the resistance that his brothers had made. Crates and blast shields have been put on the bridges connecting the platforms, and short-range anti-aircraft turrets on the buildings made so that the droids were forced to land a bit far away. On the platforms that the clones calculated the droids would land nothing was left. Every bit of cover that the droids could use was taken away, leaving only the bare platform. The bridges connected to such platforms had defenses only in the opposing half of the bridges, so the droids would have to walk on a small area with zero cover. I think we are okay. When the clankers land we should have our heavy machine gunners concentrate their fire on the disembark ramparts. After that, the first half of the bridges, the open areas, and the platforms on itself shall become death zones to them. Maybe if we have snipers take positions there, there, and there we can eliminate some more of them. Commander Keeley didn't answer. Dager looked at him, and after a few seconds, realization struck him. You had already thought of that. Of course, you have, you are the commander. Then why make me say it all over again? First because two minds think better than one, and you might have spotted something I didn't. Secondly, because the best place to learn things like that isn't in a classroom, but on the battlefield. Um. So, did I miss anything? Actually, yes. See those side bridges? They are too small for their ships to land, but we can put some men over there to catch the droids on a crossfire. I've already ordered that, actually. Commander Keeley's comlink blinked to life. Commander, they are arriving. You should hurry back. Both of them looked upwards and saw that the three Gonzati class cruisers were only a few kilometers away. They hurried back to the first line of defense, on the bridges near the landing points. Crates and blast shields were scattered here and there, so the clones would have a bit of cover. The problem was that once the droids got to those defenses they also would have cover, but there was nothing they could do about that. Dager sent Dab to a sniper point a little far away and put metal with his Z-6 at the very front. The other members, including Dager, scattered among the crates, and aimed their blasters at the landing droid cruisers. Three Gonzati class cruisers landed, each one on different platforms. This meant that the droid forces wouldn't be so concentrated, which was bad, because if one of the defending groups failed, the droids would be able to fire on the clones on the other bridges. Here they come. The lateral of the cruisers opened, revealing droids upon droids. Literally. The droids were mostly deactivated, one above the other, so they could fit as much of them as possible. Only the ones on ground level were activated and started marching out. In the first line was out of the way the second pile of droids was dropped and went live. Of course, the clones weren't doing nothing while that happened. All of them had opened fire, and the lasers from the heavy machine gunners were totally drowning the doors of the cruisers. Deja was calmly firing his DC-15A for the first moments, but soon the droid started returning fire and he was forced to duck behind the crates. Chapter 58 Dead droids were pilling up in the hundreds, but the clones were paying a hefty price for it. 
members of the Kamino security team and of the 303rd Attack Legion were getting gunned down left and right as the droids continued on their unwavering efforts to take Kamino. By now, two hours on the fight, the defending troops retreated to a complex of platforms a few hundred meters away from where they started. Using the crates and blast shields that the clones had settled, mechanical feet stepped on dead clones and droids, heading to the buildings where hundreds of thousands of clones were growing. By now Dager had already lost count of how many clankers he had eliminated. He, as well Hell Squad and Commander Keeley, was on the front lines, retreating when needed, all the while fighting. Dager finished reloading his DC-15A and got up to fire once more, as he had been doing for hours. However, before he got up a volley of red lasers eliminated three or four clones, making him rethink. While crouching Dager looked to his side, where five members of the Kamino security team and on clone of the 303rd were. There were originally twenty or so clones at that position, but now they were all that was left. Dager made a retreat now sign and then an I will cover to his brothers. He looked a little bit above the crates and then hit his head once more. The droids had advanced a lot after one round of suppressive fire. Dager was hoping to give his brothers a little time to escape and then make a run for it, but once again things didn't go as planned. Before anyone could retreat, or Dager could deploy cover fire, a thermal detonator as thrown. The little ball rolled until it touched the feet of one of the clones. He looked down to see what it was, and then the detonator exploded. Dager had a vision of the clones being thrown in the air and spinning as they fell off the bridge into the sea below them. Then that vision disappeared as it as replaced by grey clouds, parts of the bridge, sea, and grey clouds again. He fell into the agitated sea, not hearing anything because of the blast. The ice-cold water was probably what saved him, as the cold shocked him out of unconsciousness. Dager swan up and broke to the surface. Above the water was much more aggressive, big waves going forth. He took off his helmet, that was at the moment making things worse. After that he could hear something, although muffled. When he touched his ears he sensed blood, but besides that, he wasn't very hurt. A bit away he saw something white contrasting with the green water. It was one of the Kamino security team clones, his left side totally burned and his armor destroyed. The clone had no pulse. Dager left the floating body behind and swam towards one of the huge pillars that sustained the platforms of Kamino. There were elevators and stairs on it, which he could use to get back up. When he got to the base of the pillar he heard someone or something walking from the other side of it. It could be one of the clones, but it could also be one of the droids. He had, of course, lost his blaster on the fall so he could only hide and wait for the owner of the steps he was hearing to come and ambush him. As the sound drew closer Dager tensed up. When one figure entered his line of sight he threw himself over it, and both fell and rolled, nearly getting into the sea again. It was only at that moment Dager saw the face of his opponent, the clone of the 303rd that fell with him. Damn! I am sorry Barrow, I thought you were a clanker. No worries sir. Better safe than sorry. Are you hurt somewhere? No. We need to get back there. Did you find someone else on the water? I think it is only us sir. Then let's waste no more time. Dager and Barrow entered the elevator. Both of them had lost their weapons and had only their fists to battle whatever droid they encountered on the way. Chapter 59 Barrow and Dager went into the elevator and pressed the top button. If Dager wasn't wrong they would get out on the back of the droid invasion forces. Dager also knew that no commander would leave such pathways to the back of his army unguarded. Barrow, do you have any detonators? No, I lost all of them when I fell. But if you want to do what I think you want to, I still have some magazines left. Um. Tibana gas. That will do. ZZ. 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 Commander Keeley tried his comlink once more, hoping to get an answer, but the only response was static. He then switched to another frequency. Dab, do you copy? Yes commander. Do you have eyes on Dager? No sir. I don't think he is amongst the dead, although it is difficult to tell with so many bodies. Dager doesn't die so easily. I just don't know where the hell he went. 
I swear that if he is dead I will throw each and every one of those droids on the sea persona. Oh damn. The clankers are coming again commander. Commander Keeley heard the sound of Dab's DC-15X firing before he cut comms. The droids were attacking again after small regroup moment. Cell came running towards Commander Keeley, his binoculars lowered on his visor. Commander, there was a small explosion behind enemy lines. From the size it was something smaller than a thermal detonator. Do we have anyone still alive behind the clankers? Not that we know of. And the droids certainly aren't taking prisoners. They. Proved that already. Cell was referring to a moment not long ago, after Dager went missing, when a squad of clones was overrun, and when the survivors surrendered the droids executed them in cold blood. After that no clone tried to surrender again, and fought to their last breath. If we don't have anyone there then it is probably some B-2 battle droids experiencing a late explosion. Continue the defense. A few minutes earlier. Dager and Barrow strapped four magazines together. The Tabana gas that composed the fuel to the laser shots was highly unstable, and Dager wanted to exploit that. However, they needed something to trigger it. Barrow and Dager took off their armors and supported them on the walls of the elevator so it looked like two clones. Of course if one were to look at it one second longer than necessary they would discover the trick. After that, they left the elevator one floor earlier than the top floor, where the droids were. Then, they used some pieces of scrap metal to drill a hole on the magazines and threw it onto the elevator. Soon the Tabana gas filled the elevator with a brownish fog. On the top level of the Kaminoan platforms, behind droid lines. A squad of droids was guarding every elevator, with orders to shoot anyone who got out of it. One of those elevators chimed and the door opened. The droids guarding it saw two white armors and fired instantly. When the red lasers entered in contact with a brown mist that was in the elevator a small explosion engulfed the area. Taking advantage of the distraction of the other droids, who had turned around to see what was happening, two clones wearing no armor got out of another elevator and pushed the droids out of the way and off the platform. After Dager left the perforated magazines on the elevator he and Barrow went to another elevator. When they heard the explosion they got to the top level, hoping to get the droids by surprise, what really happened. With their backs turned towards them, the droids didn't have a moment to react and the two clones grabbed their E-5s and threw them off the platform. Dager and Barrow then used the stolen E-5s to eliminate the three remaining droids guarding that elevator and took cover behind it. They had got back to the platform, but there was now an entire army between them and their brothers. Dager quickly thought of a plan, and it was crazy as always. Barrow, I have a crazy idea. I'm up to everything at the moment sir, crazy or not. Chapter 60 Barrow, try to contact Commander Keeley. You will have to take a comm link from one of our brothers. What do I tell him sir? Tell him to move all of our forces back. Sir. But then the Fasilite. He will have to trust me, as you will have to. Dager left the cover that the elevator was providing and ran to a group of crates while firing. After he got there he searched the bodies of clones and droids for thermal detonators and was rewarded with a bunch of them. Then Dager triggered all of them and threw it without care, sending droids flying left and right. That gave them a small window on which Barrow found a comm link on a dead clone and contacted command. Commander Keeley. This is Barrow, CT-0457. I and Dager were thrown out the platform, but we are back. Barrow. Good to hear from you. Where are you? Was that explosion you're doing? Yes. We are behind the clankers. There is no way we can make it back now. But Dager has a plan. What is it? He wants you to retreat our troops to I side the buildings. I don't know anything apart from that. He said you will have to trust him. What? I want to talk to him. He is crazy. Yes commander. Barrow turned to call Dager, but the only thing he saw was Dager's back, running towards the Gonzati class cruisers and away from the clone defenses. Commander, he is out of reach. What do you mean? Commander Keeley was talking to Barrow in the middle of the fight, using his twin DC-17s to eliminate droids. 
when he heard that Dager had run towards the enemy cruisers he almost froze. He had a slight idea of what Dager wanted to do, and on the small chance that Dager wouldn't die while at it he had no option but retreat his troops as Dager said. He decided to wait a little more before calling the retreat, but for security and to speed up the process he ordered the back line of the clone army to build defenses near the entry of the facilities. Of course, he didn't forget to tell Hell Squad that their squad leader was alive. Deja ran towards the closer Gonzati-class cruiser with nothing but his stolen E-5 and a bunch of thermal detonators. Thankfully the only resistance he encountered were the groups guarding the elevators. He had a crazy idea, and stupid one, but it was the only he had. With the droid invasion forces disembarked, the Gonzati-class cruisers were almost empty apart from the crew. Dager easily got into the ship after killing a few droids. Gonk droids and cleaning droids were the only sort of droid he found for a time. It was only at the command bridge that he saw some battle droids. A group of B-2 super battle droids and a dozen B-1 battle droids were guarding the bridge. It was time for some grenade action. Without giving the enemy a warning he blew them to pieces. B-1 battle droids with blue painting but no weapons commanded the ship. Buzz. Who are you? You don't have authorization to. Dager dropped his blaster on the floor and started fiddling with the buttons of the control panel. He heard some movement behind him and instinctively dropped to the floor. However, no laser fire came. He got up and saw Barrow looking at him with a grimace. Barrow. You scared the hell out of me. Says the one who left me behind and ran towards an enemy cruiser. Come on man, I knew you would find your way. Now help me, this cruiser is so small that with two of us we should be able to get it on the air. And why exactly do we want it on the air? A clone came running to Commander Keeley. Sir, the enemy cruiser on the middle platform is taking off. He did it, that mad clone. Trooper, let's retreat. I want everyone inside the buildings before that cruiser is on the air and order the anti-aircraft turrets not to fire. That cruiser is with us. After the clone left Commander Keeley found Brain amongst the clones and pulled him aside. Brain, your squad leader is coming back on that cruiser. I need you to find and tell General D why we retreated and that the Gonzati class cruiser is on our side. Chapter 61 Brain found General D and told what Commander Keeley said to him, but the Jedi was still unconvinced. Commander, you bet the lives of hundreds of thousands of clones on the hands of a single clone. And now you say you don't even know what is his plan. Luckily for you there are only two ways this could end, and in neither of those you will be reprimanded. Either Dager plan works and your harsh decision saved all of the clones here or it doesn't and then all of us will be dead. It will work general. I trust my brothers. Dager and Barrow got the cruiser in the air quite easily. The first part of Dager plan was completed. Now it was the difficult piece of it, flying the cruiser to where the other two were and destroying them. The Gonzati class cruiser got up very slowly, and turned even slower. Since the crew necessary to fly it was of only a few droids, Dager and Barrow could still do it, although the hyperdrive and the shields would be out of reach. Literally. If Dager left the control panel to go activate the shields, the ship would lose control. If Barrow tried to do it the weapon system would be unavailable and all of Dager planning would be for naught. Sir, the other enemy cruisers don't seem to have noticed we are not their allies. I am locking on the target. Wait till we get closer. Neither of us is a gunner. The first shots are crucial, and I don't want to miss them. Dager controlled the ship to go after the cruiser on the left platform first. After they destroyed or at least disabled it, they would have to turn around and go to the second target, which would probably be prepared for them. When they were midway between the middle and the left platform, a transmission of a B-1 battle droid with blue strips, a crew droid, popped into the control panel. R3, G6, why is cruiser HHP taking off? Those are not your orders. Sorry Clanker, R3, G6 had a slight malfunction. Wait. Buzz. Who are you? Barrow, now. Usually the small turrets of a Gonzati class cruiser would be useless in a fight with anything bigger than a starfighter. 
However, as a troop carrier, the Gunzati class cruisers focused on having as much space as possible, eliminating everything apart from the necessary for it to fly. That included its shields, who were so weak that even the small turrets could break them easily. And so they did. The first Gunzati class cruiser was turned in scrap metal at record speed, and had zero chances to retaliate or run. The second one, however, turned its turrets to the stolen cruiser. It was true that the ship in which Dager and Barrow were destroyed the other easily, but that also meant that the same could happen with them. When the Gunzati class cruiser took enemy fire its engines quickly shut down, and holes were opened on its surface. Barrow controlled the turrets, and even amidst the shaking, aimed and fired at the command bridge of the last ship. The command bridge blew up, and the cruiser which had barely taken off fell once again, crashing sideways on the platform. But Dager and Barrow had to pay quite the price to destroy the enemy cruiser. Their engines were dead, the ship was half destroyed and there was no way they could land it safely. Barrow. Remember when I told you that I had a plan? Well, I have good and bad news. The bad is that my plan depended on this ship being flyable. The good news is that I have a new plan. Why do I have the feeling that those are not exactly good news? Dager pressed all the buttons not destroyed on the control panel and put the cruiser in a direct course to the bridge where the main invasion droid force was. Find a door leading to outside. We need to run. Dager pulled Barrow to outside the command bridge. They didn't find a door, but soon a hole appeared on the side of the cruiser. That will do. Jump on the three. Wait. Sir, that is your plan. Three. Now. Dager jumped and Barrow followed suit. For the second time on the day, they fell onto the green and grey waters of Kamino. Chapter 62 The clones defending Kamino all saw the Gunzati class cruiser take off, and most of them worried thinking that an air attack was coming. Only a few knew it was Dager controlling the enemy ship, those being General D, Commander Keeley, Hell Squad, and the clones in charge of the anti-aircraft turrets. So when the ship they thought it was an enemy fired and destroyed one of its own, they were astonished, to say the least. Commander Keeley waved a sigh of relief, but his expression soon turned dark once he saw Dager and Barrow taking a lot of fire from the second cruiser. Even when they destroyed the second cruiser his face didn't light up. Commander Keeley was no engineer, but even a child could see that Dager's cruiser was doomed. And then Commander Keeley screamed when Dager did the second unexpected thing of the day. What? Dager, you. All troops, fall back. Fall back. The Gunzati class cruiser, 60 meters long, hundreds of tons heavy, came crashing down into the droid infantry troops. Be it B1 battle droids, B2 super battle droids, droidikas or dwarf spider droids, all of them were crushed immediately. The bridge where the cruiser crashed bent under the strength of weight and speed combined. For a few seconds it seemed as if it would resist, but then cracks appeared and the bridge broke in many pieces. Not only that, but the nearby bridges and platforms all fell due to the momentum of the ship. With thunderous sounds, cruiser, bridges, platforms, and droids were dragged into the sea, starting waves dozens of meters tall. Dager fell into the water once again, but this time the impact was much bigger, and his consciences started fading away. Dager saw flashes of grey and green, and what might have been some B-1 battle droids, as well as clones. Something or someone started pulling him. He tried to resist but realized he couldn't move his body. Things started to get darker and darker, and he passed out. Shadows hiding into shadows. An eerie laugh resounded. Brain, Tech, 3-4, Cell, Dab, Metal, Commander Keeley appeared. Dager tried to reach them, but blue lightning zapped and they were gone. Then his old squad leader, CT-4087 and many of his dead brothers appeared in his vision. This time, when the lighting passed they didn't disappear, but slowly turned into a hooded black figure. The many figures became a giant one, and terrifying chuckles came off the dark hood. Things started to spin in and out, black becoming red, and red becoming black. Dager was spinning faster and faster, red and black flashes making him want to close his eyes, but he wasn't able to. The chuckles turned to a hoarse voice saying the same phrase over and over. 
Eliminate Jedi. Eliminate Jedi. Eliminate Jedi. Dejer woke up. Dejer reached to his left side with his right hand, looking for his blaster, but it wasn't there. Only then he looked around and recognized the beds and backed at tanks of Kamino Infirmary. A female Kaminoan, with its long neck who was near another bed, where a wounded clone was, saw him trying to sit and came to him. Don't get up trooper. You have. A fractured rib. Obviously, it was only when she said that, that he felt the pain on his abdomen. But he had suffered worst injuries. Where is Barrow? I don't know who. Barrow is, trooper, but Commander Keeley. Said that I was too. Call him as soon as you. Woke up. Then call him please. Already. Did that. Wait for. Moment please. The Kaminoan went back to the injured clone from before, and Dager spent the next few minutes looking at some of his unconscious brothers. Soon Commander Keeley and Hell Squad came in, and the first thing that happened was a bunch of them talking at the same time. When they finally stopped Commander Keeley spent the next ten minutes scolding and congratulating him at the same time. At last Dager discovered that they had won and that the Separatist had been beaten back, not without taking a bite out of the clone forces. The installations that the 303rd was protecting stayed safe, but others weren't able to stop the droid invasion groups, and the death toll of soldiers, cadets and embryos was in the dozens of thousands. Chapter 63 Apparently, the enemy commander, Amon Calamari called Mirai, saw that the battle was lost for the Separatist and tried to do a charge with his starfighter on the Jedi starfighter's hyperspace rings, and succeeded. The rings were destroyed and the Jedi weren't able to chase the retreating Separatist ships. Without the commands of the Jedi the Republic cruisers decided it was too risky to chase, and the remaining Separatist cruisers, frigates and dreadnoughts disappeared in the space. Commander, brothers, is good to see you, but where is Barrow? He was with me when we jumped off the cruiser. Don't worry sir. Barrow is in another infirmary, and besides a few broken ribs he is okay. Tech is right, Dager. Actually, you better thank Barrow as soon as you leave the infirmary. If he didn't drag you out of the water you probably would have drowned. He said he found you almost unconscious. It is good to hear that. I will make sure to go after him soon. The Kaminoan from before came back, waving her long hands and fingers to make Commander Keeley and Hell Squad go out. Commander. There are many. Troopers that need rest. I shall ask. You. To leave. No problem Jumai FY. We were just making sure that this clone here was all good. Jumai FY gave Dager some pills, and soon he drifted into a heavy sleep, this time without dreaming. A few days later Dager was out of the infirmary. His broken rib didn't need a back to tank, so his recovery took a little more this time, but there was no imminent battle, so he didn't rush it. The Republic discovered which path the Separatist had taken to arrive on Kamino, and were now guarding it tightly. Dager expected that the 303rd would soon leave Kamino and go find another battle. Of course, he didn't forget to visit Barrow on the other infirmary. He was more injured than Dager, so his recovery would take a little more. Most places of Kamino suffered some measure of damage. Corridors of glass were shattered, the mess had a patch of metal covering a hole in the ceiling where some laser fire melted the roof. There were still broke droid bodies here and there, and the robots were working hard to clean them. While roaming around Dager saw a teenager cadet talking to a clone on a litter. The clone had a bandage on his leg, but besides that seemed all right. Don't worry kid, it is just a blaster wound. Soon I will be back. You were very courageous there, make sure you and your squad work hard. The cadet nodded, and Dager became curious. He had supposed that by now all wounded clones would be on the infirmary, so why did that one have a fresh wound? Trooper. What happened to your leg? Sir. Nothing much. Some clankers managed to lock themselves into a storeroom, so we didn't discover them until today. It was quite a surprise, and they gave me a little gift before dying. The clone tapped himself on the leg and them frowned with pain. Go get yourself patched up. Dager turned to the clone cadet. 
He himself was quite amused by the situation and felt like smiling, but the cadet seemed afraid that it would get reprimanded. And what was your play on all of this cadet? I. I was near the room at that time sir. I helped to pull him out of the way when he was shot. Dejer couldn't hold it anymore and smile, making the cadet sigh in relief. That was very brave of you kid. What is your name? CT-4040, sir. Dejer shook his head. He should have known that a cadet wouldn't have a name yet. Most of the grown soldiers were just getting theirs. That can't do. Let me tell you a secret, little brother. A clone fights much harder when they have a name. We aren't just a bunch of numbers anymore. Many of us bleed and died for the Republic. We deserve at least that. The cadet listened attentively, feeling anticipation for Dejer's next words. CT 4040 right? Forget that numbers. Let me think. What about? Cut up. Yeah, cut up is good. Don't forget to tell our brothers what I said to you. We are living beings, not machines. Never forget that. Quite satisfied with himself, Dager left the clone cadet behind and went to meet Hell Squad at the mess. Chapter 64 The 303rd Attack Legion was going to be stationed on Kamino for a few more weeks until they could replenish all the troopers who died in battle. Dager had become once again the reason for proud of Hell Squad and the 303rd. Now most clones who took part in the Battle of Kamino, as it was being called, knew who he was, at least by name. Few days have passed since the invasion, and the originally tense and easily scared clones have now started to relax. Members of the Kamino security team, and even some cadets, walked with more confidence, and weren't afraid to lift their heads in front of the soldiers. For the past few days, Dager had done nothing more than patrolling and socializing. The members of Deep Squad, who at the start had been almost hostile, were now some of the best friends that Hell Squad had. If it wasn't for the batches of fresh clones that took the place of his fallen brothers, Dager could have thought that the war was over, although he knew it had just started. Now, however, duty called once more. Commander Keeley asked Dager to go to his headquarters, in the capital ship of General D. Fleet, the Sincerity. A lot took him there, and Dager had the chance to see what remained after one of the biggest space battles of the Clone Wars till now. Debris shuffling in the starry skies, some as small as fists, and others gigantic pieces of destroyed ships. Every now and then Dager saw dead droids floating, and he could swear that some were still trying to move, to no avail. What pained him, though, were the numerous clone bodies. Droids might be able to survive for some time in space before their engines froze and their power ran out. However, that was not an option for clones, who could survive only 10 to 20 minutes even with their helmets. After 15 dollars minutes, the gunship finally landed inside the Sincerity. Even inside the cruiser things weren't going well. During the battle, a frigate tore a hole in the belly of the Sincerity. The hole had already been closed by energy shields, but it was still a depressing sight, seeing the ship that he treated as a second home like this. Commander Keeley was in the command bridge, surrounded by officers, and yelling tasks. General D was nowhere to be seen. Commander, you wanted to see me? Yes, Dager. Just give me a minute. Gorg, send the broken Arc 170s down to Kamino. After that ask them to send a group of mechanics up here. Yes, Commander. Little by little the officers around Commander Keeley dwindled, and Dager finally heard what the commander had for him. Dager, I have new orders for you. In the Scarif system, about a thousand parsecs from here, there is a medical base. Too many clones were hurt or died. Kamino has sufficient facilities to take care of them all, but not enough supplies. I am sending Hell Squad to go there, grab medical necessities and come back. I can see the questions in your face. You know Dager, you are a fine soldier, but if you keep contesting your superiors it will be difficult for you to ascend at positions. Dager smiled, because he could see that although it looked like Commander Keeley was reprimanding him, in truth, it was a compliment. I never had that kind of ambition sir. In any case, it was you who said I had questions, not me. Am I authorized to make them? Yes you are, soldier. 
don't you think that sending just Hell Squad is too little? Also, why Hell Squad? First of all, after the battle we have too little men. We can't spare many, and I don't trust the Shines to be decisive enough. And why do they have to be decisive? Have you thought why the medical base can't send the supplies by themselves? Dejer kept his silence. The supplies in Scarif come from the ocean of the planet. The algae and small creatures are of utmost importance to the creation of medicines. However, ever since the end of the battle, they haven't been able to gather anything, and every clone they sent to investigate was never seen again. I understand Commander. Ask your men to come up here, and you will take a CR-90. And, Dager, be careful. The enemy commander this time was Amon Calamari. Although he died, I don't think it is too far off to think that there is some kind of connection. Chapter 65 Maybe it was coincidence, or some mysterious formation from when the galaxy has been created, but most planets near Kamino were almost or entirely aquatic. Scarif was no exception. That was what Dager was thinking, while he looked down on the planet from the command center of the CR-90. Scarif was 90% water, and the remaining 10% were composed of archipelagos. In fact, from the images that Dager got before, it was a very beautiful planet. Contrary to Kamino, where it was always raining, Scarif was sunny 100% of the times. If the planet wasn't so far from the inner core, and so deep on the outer rim, where pirates and criminals were kings, it would most probably be one of the most visited planets on the galaxy. Speaking from a strategic perspective, though, the planet had zero value. Kamino was already near the end of the known galaxy, and the planet was even further than that. Also, there were no sentient beings, so the only intelligent life form were the clones based there to collect medical supplies which would later be sent to Kamino. Dager looked at the captain of the corvette. Hell Squad was the only combat group on the ship, the rest being crewmen and some scientists. Captain, were you able to contact the medical station? Apart from the missing clones and the lack of medical ingredients, they say that nothing is wrong. Land. It will be up for me and Hell Squad to say if there is anything wrong. The medical base was nothing more than four or five buildings connected by halls. Since it wasn't a war facility, the garrison stationed there was of only thirty or so clones, commanded by a sergeant. After they arrived they discovered that the actual number was much smaller than that, and that the situation was much worse than they initially thought. According to the captain, about a few days before they arrived, the algae and small sea animals that were used to make some of the medicine stopped appearing. The machinery was still working, but nothing came. The day that happened the sergeant sent two clones to see what was going on, but those two never returned. After that, at least one soldier would disappear every day. By now, of the thirty men garrisoned that, only twelve remained. The sergeant was scared and looked at Dager as if he was his savior. I am very grateful that you arrived sir. We were starting to think that you hadn't got our message. If the situation was so serious, why didn't you tell us, sergeant? One clone disappearing might be an accident, or a native creature, but eighteen of them is no such thing. You better pray those men are well, or you are not going to have a good ending. But. Sir, we tried to contact you. There was no answer. What do you mean sergeant? The only transmission we received from you was that production stopped and some clones went missing, so we were sent to solve this, and take medical supplies to Kamino. That was eight days ago. I know sir. After we sent that transmission more men disappeared, so we tried to call Kamino once more. Our transmission was sent, but no answer came. And. We never received those transmissions. That means they were intercepted somewhere in the middle. What do you think it is sir? Certainly not a native creature. I am sending the corvette back right now. Dejo turned on his comm link and contacted the captain of the CR-90, but the voice on the other side wasn't the one from a clone. Clun. Your kind eliminated my father. Now I will eliminate all of you. Who are you? What did you do to my brothers? You mean those clones? They are alive. You can come get them in a while. You won't die so easily. I will start with you all and they destroy all of you. 
the voice cut off communications. Dager instantly got into action, putting his helmet and grabbing his DC-15A before running out. The sergeant followed suit, as well as the two guards. Midway Dager contacted Brain, telling him to surround the corvette with Hell Squad. When they arrived the ship was entirely encircled, but after they entered it all they found was the unconscious crew and water puddles. Metal and 3-4 started carrying the unconscious clones to the medical station, while Tech started checking the ship for any hidden bombs. Brain and Dager checked the near areas but found no one. Sir, who do you think it was? And why leave the crew alive? I don't know who it is Brain, nor why not eliminate them. But I can guess why he is attacking us. He is a Mon Calamari, as was the enemy commander in the Battle of Kamino. Chapter 66 I don't know who it is Brain, nor why not eliminate them. But I can guess why he is attacking us. He is a Mon Calamari, as was the enemy commander in the Battle of Kamino. Deja knew it had to be a Mon Calamari, and one who partook into the Battle of Kamino. In two months of war, a lot of living beings died, be it on Geonosis, Kamino, Ren Var, Alaris Prime, or any other battlefield in the galaxy. But the timing was too close to be any other than a Mon Calamari. Brain, after the ship is clean, I want everyone inside the medical base. Including sentries. He already proved that he can sneak inside easily, a few more guards won't make a difference. Not long after Brain left, Tech came over to Dager. Sir, the corvette is clean. No bombs, almost all functions are good, only the communicators were broken, and there is no one left inside it. Only the communicators? He didn't even break the flight systems. No sir. Are the communicators reparable? Not in a short amount of time, sir. Then get the crew back here, and send them back to Kamino to ask for reinforcements. We have an unknown number of enemies, but they already eliminated or captured two dozens of clones. Sir, are you sure that is all right? Why would they leave the ship intact, knowing that we can ask for support? Think with me Tech. They cut our communications, so the only way we can ask for backup is by this ship. They broke the communicators, which means that only when the corvette land on Kamino that they will be able to know our situation. And that will take a few days and a few more for them to arrive back here. Is this a trap sir? Not for us. Our opponent must think that this spam of time is enough for him to eliminate all of us here on Scarif, and flee. Either that or he wants our reinforcements to arrive, and that would mean that the enemy force is much bigger than we thought. That doesn't make sense. If they were strong enough, why bother jamming communications? They could just have let the medical base tell the whole story and then a big group of Republic ships would be sent. I agree. I think they want to eliminate us all and flee before our reinforcements arrive. The reason that they let the corvette intact is that more clones can arrive here and see what they did. I am sorry sir, but I am still confused. That too doesn't make sense. If you are thinking from a strategic perspective, it doesn't. But this isn't a military operation. He said clones eliminated his father. This is vengeance. Deep into the Sea of Scarif, where there was so little light that only the weirdest creatures could survive. A starship as big as a Gonzati class cruiser laid on the muddy bottom of the ocean. Inside it was a crew of Mon Calamari, and on the command center was a Mon Calamari bigger than any other. The Mon Calamari was alone on the command bridge, talking to a hologram of a hooded figure. At this moment the Mon Calamari seemed to be angry, and the calm voice of the hooded figure only made him angrier. It is exactly like you heard Count Dooku. Your pile of metal that you calls an army retreated as soon as they saw that my father died. Young Heige, the last order from your father was for them to retreat. He should have retreated too. The death of your father was his own fault. He died because of you. He believed Ulan the Separatist. I told him that your plan was bound to fail, but he trusted you, and now he is dead. Heige, be careful. What you are saying could be interpreted as treason against the Separatist cause. No Oduku. I still believe in your cause. The Un I don't believe is you. You ask me to return, and do what? Stay hidden. 
do a mission for you, as my father did. I can't even return to my home planet, or I will be charged as a traitor. No, oh, I will not return. I will avenge my father, and eliminate every clone and Jedi in this galaxy. And after you do that, what will you do, child? I will eliminate you. The Mon Calamari, Heige, crushed the hologram projector in his hands. Unfortunately, he was too absorbed in his rage to see the smile on Count Dooku's face. Chapter 67 The Mon Calamari, Heige, threw the broken pieces of the hologram projector away and sat on the captain chair. The door opened, and a Mon Calamari entered. He had wrinkles on his face, and one of his legs was made of metal, so he limped while walking. Heige wasn't on a food mood, but when the old Mon Calamari entered the room, respect showed on his face. Tart. Heige, I followed your father four years, and I want to avenge him as much as you do. But we can't be harsh now. What do you want me to do? You said that I should interrupt their production. I did it. You said that I should cut the clones' communications. I did it. You said I should let their ship intact and not eliminate any of I did it. Now you say that we should eliminate those clones who came here. I am going to do that with pleasure. Heige, calm down. Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. My father was eliminated and the next thing you want me to do is eliminate some clones and run away. I don't want to eliminate some clones. I want to eliminate them all. Tart said nothing, and just looked at Heige until he stopped raging. The chest of the big Mon Calamari waved up and down, and after he calmed down he sat on the chair. What do you want me to do Tart? What do you think that we should do? We can't fight an army. Not now. I say that after we eliminate all the Kloon Zuan Scare if we leave this planet and try to gather as much support as we can. Then we eliminate every Kloon and Jedi we find. Heige closed his eyes and crossed his fingers. Tonight we attack their medical base. No clone survives. All the clones and researchers on the base were waiting for Dager in the command center. He had taken his time to talk with all the clones so he could grasp the situation. All the clones, including the researchers, have armed themselves. Hell Squad wasn't so tense, but the clones already there had some difficulties to calm down. Dajer couldn't worry about it at the moment. They were soldiers, and wanting it or not, they would have to get used to it, or they wouldn't last long. Troopers. For the last few days you have faced some hardships. I know losing a brother is terrible, and not knowing what happened to them is even worse. But. We have a mission, to serve and protect the Republic. And those who took our brothers are ours and the Republic enemies. Worse than that, they are part of the same group who attacked our home planet. Tech went ahead and showed a projection of a Mon Calamari. Dajer let the men take a look at it before continuing. Our enemy this time is a Mon Calamari, most probably related to the enemy commander during the Battle of Kamino. That is why you couldn't find him no matter how much you searched. He got the whole ocean to hide. And that is also why the sentries were useless. Sergeant, I imagine there is some connection to the ocean inside the base. The water we use come directly from an underwater tunnel, the same from which we take the algae needed to make the medicine. However, the grid on it showed no sign of being broken. That doesn't mean anything. After the production stopped you sent two men to discover what was wrong, right? I imagine they had the keys to the grid. Those men didn't return, did they? This. All of you, listen. I already sent back the ship in which Hell Squad came. Since this Mon Calamari didn't blow it up, that means he isn't afraid of our reinforcements. That also means we have no means to escape. Somewhere between tonight and the next week, that separatist scum will try to eliminate us all. That is not going to happen. Understood. Understood. Yes sir. Good. Tech, Dab, you two go take a look at the armory, see what we can use. Cell, take another clone and go have a look at the surroundings. I am quite sure the attack will come from this tunnel the sergeant talked about, but just to make sure, install some sensors. Sergeant Salve, stay here for a moment. 
The rest of you, go back to your positions. I don't want anyone alone. At least two men together always. The clones acknowledged his orders and went to do their duties, only the sergeant, Salve, staying behind. Salve, you and I are going to take a look at that tunnel. Chapter 68 Dejo changed his helmet for a diving mask connected to a small gas tank on his back. On normal circumstances, the tank was able to sustain for 36 hours underwater. He and Sergeant Salve directed themselves to the tunnel. When they arrived, Dejo saw it wasn't actually a tunnel, but a big well. On it, a treadmill was moving, but there was nothing on it. Some robots attached to the treadmill were doing picking motions, probably to separate the algae, if there was any. Dejo pulled the diving mask over his face and jumped in the water. It was surprisingly clear, and the lights on the treadmill made so that he didn't need to use the lantern on his mask. Dejo grabbed the treadmill and used it to propel himself downwards. A splashing sound, and then Salve was on the water with him. It was obviously not the first time he did that, and his movements were experienced, leaving Dejo behind. The large well soon started to narrow, and the before smooth walls soon became rocky. The treadmill accompanied them all the time, providing light. After a few dozen meters the vertical descent started easing, and after a few more dozen meters it became a normal tunnel. Dejo and Salve released their grasp on the treadmill and started swimming. About 200 meters later, the tunnel came to an end on a metal grid. As you see, sir, the grid is intact. But if that scum took the keys from FYTT and Hing, they can easily open it. We can change the lock though. There is no time. A job like that, underwater, will take some time, and we don't have that time. Dejo approached the grid and looked outside, but the lights from the treadmill only illuminated so far as a dozen meters. Some strange fishes swam away when he got close, but nothing bigger than a fist appeared. Open it. I want to take a look outside. Are you sure sir? Dejo checked the weapon he brought, a DC-17. He had grown fond of it after Commander Keeley showed all of its uses to him. Besides, his DC-15A was too cumbersome and big to use underwater. Open it. Salve took out a keycard and passed it in front of the lock. The red light turned to green, and then he pushed it slightly. A small section of the grid opened, and Salve passed through it, followed by Dejo. They turned on the lanterns on their masks, and two flashes of light swiped the darkness. Well, not total darkness. After they got out Dejo saw that the light from outside still illuminated a good hundred meters below them, although weakly. They swam a couple of strokes forward, and Dejo turned to look at the entry of the tunnel. He was already having some ideas. Their opponents would have to pass through there. If he could get a couple of detonat. A shadow. Somewhere behind him, something big swam. Very slowly he lifted his pistol, trying to give the impression that he was just going to swim back. The shadow moved fast to him, and Dejo turned as fast as the water let him, and fired the pistol. The blue laser concentrated a high amount of energy, and water evaporated on its path, even underwater. As the trail of bubbles cleared, Dejo saw what he hit. A Mon Calamari corpse floated to the surface, a hole on its throat and green blood staining the water around him. Next to him was a Vibro Trident, a weapon more lethal than blasters on close combat. Through the transparent mask on Salve's face, Dejo could see his shock. But soon that express turned to one of surprise, and the sergeant fired his weapon, a DC-15S. The laser passed a few meters away from Dejo face, engulfing him in a cloud of bubbles. Behind Dejo was another Mon Calamari, now with a blaster wound on his arm. Contrary to Dejo expectations, after the arm that was holding the Vibro Trident was disabled, the Mon Calamari didn't run, but showed his sharp teeth and swam to Dejo barehanded. Dejo didn't show mercy. They stayed alert for two minutes, but no more Mon Calamarians came. They should have been guarding the grid. Salve, when we return send someone to fish their bodies. Let's see if we can find them on our database. Do you think those two are the only ones? No. They are probably just sentries. But now we know two things. The first one is what happened to our brothers. 
The second is that our enemies will be aware that we know from where they are coming. Chapter 69 Dajer and Sal went back the way they came, not forgetting to lock the grid, although it wouldn't make a difference. Two clones were sent to place some detonators on the grid. Hopefully, the explosion would take out a few of the enemies, and warn the defending clones. Sal sent some men to pick up the two dead Mon Calamarians, in hope that they could find something about who they would be fighting, but it was in vain. Time passed, and the night soon arrived. Some clones were left on the walls in case the enemy tried to attack from there, but the main defenses were on the inside. The well was surrounded by a multitude of clones. The medical base didn't have any e-webs, but was well supplied with electric grenades. Those were specifically designed to restrain some of the more dangerous predators on Scarif's ocean, and would work well against an aquatic enemy like the Mon Calamarians. The electric grenades could be attached to a launcher on the blaster, so when underwater they could still be launched. Deja was walking amongst the clones, making sure they were ready for the battle. And then the ground went down and surged up at the same time. A column of water rose, and two unfortunate clones were caught into it, being torn to pieces. For a moment all the clones turned to where the implosion happened, and it was at that exact moment that the Mon Calamarians came out of the well. The one leading them had his top stripped, and a large half of it covered by black and blue tattoos. Heige stabbed his Vibro Trident on the back of a poor clone, then pulled it viciously and threw it at another clone, impaling him. Dajer had to recognize how clever the enemy was. They had discovered and disarmed the thermal detonators on the grid, and also had to dig a hole underwater and blow it, at the same time distracting the clones and stopping them from using the electric grenades. Another clone fell, and the already small garrison went from 18 to 15. Dajer turned and fired his DC 15A, days without end of practice guiding his hands. A few pulls on the trigger, two dead Mon Calamarians, and the effect was better than a sign saying, shoot me, on his armor. That was, at least until Metal showed up. Metal got up from his crouched stance, using both hands to lift his Z-6 rotary at his waist. Green blood flowed from the bodies of some Mon Calamarians, their lack of armor only making the situation grosser. By now the Mon Calamarians had changed their Vibro Tridents to a kind of blaster that fired red lasers. By Dajer's side, one clone was hit on his shoulder, falling to the ground in pain. Dajer dropped his weapon and dragged him until most of his body was behind the treadmill. 3-4. Wounded. Coming. 3-4 ran from behind his own piece of cover, and even eliminated one Mon Calamari while at it. He knelt besides Dajer and the wounded clone, checking his wound. Sir, press here, we need to stop the bleedy. Damn. Red laser hit the treadmill in front of them, pulling splinters of it. Dajer took 3-4 DC, 15S and got up. Change of plans. 3-4, do your best and get him behind something. We need every clone here. The wounded clone moaned, and reached for his weapon. I can still fight sir. Cough. Cough. No, you can't. Be a good boy and follow orders. 3-4. On it. While their little exchange was going on, the Mon Calamarians had gained more ground, dozens of them already on the base, and more coming out of the well. Brain. Brain listened to him, and knew what to do. From his belt, a handful of thermal detonators appeared. Back on Kamino, when Hell Squad found out that Brain was putting so much training on throwing grenades, they had made fun of him. Now, each and every one of the detonators he threw took out bunches of Mon Calamarians. Dajer had a random thought about how Brain, the one who didn't have a specified role on Hell Squad, went out after it by himself, deciding to train in the position they were missing, a grenadier. Chapter 70 Dajer was very proud of the current Hell Squad, but there was no time to show it off at the moment. Even with Brain's thermal detonators, the situation was still getting out of hand very quickly. The number of Mon Calamarians who invaded the base was well over a hundred, although it appeared that the last of them had already got out. If Dajer had to analyze the battle, he would probably say that, although the clones were outnumbered four, maybe five to one, they still had a chance. There were two main reasons for that. The first and most obvious one was that they occupied defensive positions, which was always an advantage. 
The second, and not so obvious, was that their enemies were enraged. That might not look as an advantage for some, and in some cases it really wasn't. But at this specific battle, or at least this moment of it, it made so that the Mon Calamarians were more likely to make mistakes. Such as running forward without thinking. At least two dozen Mon Calamarians had to fell to clone lasers, and brain grenades, until the rest learned that charging might not be the best tactic. Nevertheless, the brave moves by the Mon Calamarians paid off. Meter by meter, clone by clone, they started to gain ground. The one leading them was especially eye-catching. He used the weird Mon Calamari blasters with ability and zero scruples. Dejer aimed at him, knowing that if he took out the leader, the invasion would soon crumble. The DC-15S, however, wasn't accurate enough. Dejer shots passed right above the Mon Calamari head, and he ducked behind a crate. Fall back. Take position inside. Dejer saw that he didn't have enough clones to maintain their position. He ordered a retreat, but he himself stayed behind. Unconsciously or not, all of Hell Squad members had gathered with him. Brain left his thermal detonators aside, changing them by a DC-15A. Tech and 3-4 were side by side, 3-4 helping Tech, who had a hole on his legs. Cell and Dab stayed a little behind, ready to cover their retreat. Metal took the chance to reload his Z-6 rotary, a troublesome matter, impossible to be done if they didn't have that break. Dager scrubbed the dust of his visor. Boys, we have no way out. Either we eliminate those fishes right here and right now, or we become seafood. On my mark, everyone gets up, fire what you had and run to inside the base. Cell, Dab, you cover us while we retreat. When we are past you, turn back and run. Brain, help Tech. His men looked intensely at him. He and Metal would be at the most danger, covering their retreat, and being the last to leave with a small nod, Dager took a deep breath and got up. In a synchronized movement, like a well-oiled machine, Hell Squad became an executioner squad. Almost ten Mon Calamarians in the front were cut down like Jiryu being harvested. Following Dager's orders, Tech, Brain, and 3-4 turned and ran. Dager aimed and fired, and then aimed and fired, and then aimed and fired, and then aimed and fired. When he thought that the others had enough time to retreat, he gave Metal a pat on his shoulder, and started walking backwards. The enemy blasters were getting more accurate, so Dager ordered Metal to turn back and run. Now, only Dager was left facing 60 or 70 enemies. He ducked behind cover, and analyzed the situation at hand. There were 15 meters of open ground between him and the base. Almost all clones were already there, metal reaching at the moment he looked. Men. On two. Arg. He didn't get the chance to count to two. One Mon Calamari had run very far forward, and somehow had managed to hide long enough to jump on Dager. They rolled on the ground, and the Mon Calamari grabbed Dager's head and smashed it on the ground hard. Amidst his dizziness, Dager took out his DC-17 and pressed the muzzle on the chest of the Mon Calamari. The eyes of his enemy enlarged, and he let Dager go, but it was too late for him. Dager pushed the Mon Calamari off. His men inside the base sent volleys of laser fire, trying to fend off the incoming enemies and give Dager some cover fire. But they were too close. Soon, his allies at the doorway had to hide from the laser fire of the Mon Calamarians, and Dager was left alone, about to be engulfed by the enemies. Chapter 71 The Mon Calamarians were advancing slowly, looking for traps. It seemed that they learned that clones were a tough nut to crack, as the fifty or sixty Mon Calamarians bodies on the ground showed. In contrast, there were only seven dead clones there, showing how high the price to take the medical base was. Things had gone quiet for the moment, but it wouldn't take long before the air was filled with lasers once more. Involuntary, and certainly to their worry, one clone had been left behind. Dager checked his belt, and even the dead Mon Calamari, for anything that could be used to stop the invaders. He had on DC-17, one DC-15S, and two thermal detonators. Not nearly enough to escape his current predicament. No, that wasn't all of it actually. He also had some electric grenades, 
but he had thrown them to the back of his mind because they could only be used underwater. Underwater, underwater. The word kept ringing on his mind as if he was missing something. And then the idea dawned upon him. It was no wonder that Commander Keeley always said he had really bad ideas when he was in battle. That was another one of those bad ideas. Dejo took out the grenade launcher and attached it to his weapon. Then he got one of his thermal detonators and activated it, before rolling it to his right. When the explosion sounded, and the Mon Calamarians turned to it, he ran the opposite direction, circling around them, hoping they wouldn't see him. They saw. Look. The Mon Calamari who pointed at Deja was the first one to receive his greetings. He looked surprisingly unconcerned at the hole on his chest, as if he never thought it would happen, and then fell to his knees. Dejo pressed the trigger madly, sending wave after wave of lasers onto his enemies. By the time he arrived at his objective, another five Mon Calamarians were gone forever. Dejo had gone all the way back to the treadmill and was once more using it to hide his body from his enemies. This time, however, he wouldn't run away, but in fact, he would get closer to the well. Alternating between crouching and standing to shoot, he walked as fast as he could towards the well, paying little attention to anything else besides the Mon Calamarians dead ahead. And that almost costed his life. The treadmill was only half a meter large, and the moment he stood up, one Mon Calamari appeared right in front of him, on the other side of the treadmill. The Mon Calamari grabbed Dejer's neck with one hand and used the other to stab his Vibra Trident on Dejer. Or at least tried to. If he had the chance he would have stabbed Dejer without mercy, but his head blew up before he could. On the doorway of the medical base, one of the clones who had taken cover before was now shooting. Dab used his DC-15X to eliminate not only the immediate threat to Dejer's life but also three other Mon Calamarians who were close. Although those events might seem long, in truth they all happened in quick succession, and before they knew, the Mon Calamarians had lost almost ten men. Without any enemies right next to him, Dejer did the unthinkable. He grabbed the diving mask and put it on, before jumping into the well. Before that, he left a little gift for the Mon Calamarians, a small and round metal ball, who eliminated three of them when it exploded. Needless to say that Heige was furious. He had started the assault with a full 128 men, but now only 58 remained. He had expected to lose some men, but not more than half of his forces, all because of a single variable, a clone squad he hadn't paid attention before. Tart. Chase and eliminate that idiot who dared to jump in Urdu main. I want his head. The elder Mon Calamari, Tart, acknowledged his orders, and gathered twelve Mon Calamarians before jumping in the well. He could only think of this clone as stupid, who decided, at his own will, to fight the Mon Calamarians on the habitat they knew better. Then he was greeted by a chain of electricity, numbing and paralyzing his body, as well as his men. The stupid clone didn't show any mercy, and tried to finish them off while they couldn't fight back. Chapter 72 Dejer calmly shot the paralyzed Mon Calamarians, finishing them off one by one. Some of the weaker ones had already lost consciousness, and even the stronger of them, an older Mon Calamari, was having problems moving his body. Dejer didn't show any mercy, even if his opponents were defenseless at the moment. He would not shoot a surrounded enemy, or one who couldn't fight in any way, but that wasn't the case for those Mon Calamarians. Dejer was sure they would try to eliminate him as soon as they recovered. Eliminating all threats was in his nature as a soldier, and also on his genetic code. But he didn't have the time to eliminate all of them. A hand penetrated the water and grabbed the older Mon Calamari, pulling him out. After that, the owner of the hand jumped in the water, and punched Dejer. Maybe because of their skin, the Mon Calamarians didn't face as much resistance from the water as clones did. The punch wasn't enough to throw Dejer away, but still got him dizzy, and he expelled some air, creating bubbles on the water. Dejer grabbed the treadmill and started pulling himself down blindly. At the same time he launched another electric grenade, hoping to entangle the Mon Calamari. It just slowed him down for a little. Heige was angry. First, he lost many good men. Then one clone slipped by his hands and jumped in the water. Heige faced that as a provocation, 
and such as that he sent his right hand, Tart, to eliminate him. Never would he have thought that one clone would be able to take on thirteen Mon Calamarians, even if it was through different means. Of course, he couldn't let Tart die, so he pulled him out of the water before he was eliminated. After doing that, a red mist took over his head, and all he could think of was of killing the clone. When the clone used his weapon to throw another of the detonators that exploded on electrical spirals, he was forced to stop. That was enough for him to clear his head, and think that maybe the clone was leading him into a trap. But what trap could it be? He had already disarmed their bombs, and scouted the tunnel. No. The clone was just desperate. And Heige liked the feeling of invoking such terror on one of the clones who eliminated his father. Dager's plan only went as far as that. He was now alone in the underwater tunnel, and a good number of Mon Calamarians would go after him for sure. At least he had taken some pressure out of his brothers. As he followed the tunnel, Dager started designing his new plan. If someone came after him he would fight, no other choice. But if they decided that he wasn't a threat, and let him be, he would show them how wrong they were. The grid at the end of the tunnel was open, as he suspected, and the thermal detonators they left there were gone. Carefully, he swam across the grid, entering the ocean. It was night, and because of that he had trouble seeing more than a few meters ahead. No Mon Calamari attacked him, and he decided to put his second plan in motion. He went back in the tunnel, but before he made the first turn, the lights on the treadmill projected shadows in the walls. Too many shadows for Dager to take care. Once more he turned and got out, looking for somewhere to ambush them. But this was an ocean, how could he ambush someone? It was only when he turned back and saw the rock wall where the tunnel ended that he saw the many caves in it. Thinking it was better than nothing, he swam to one of them, not the closest, as that would be the first they would search, but one close enough so he could get them when they came out. He couldn't see them, and there was no sound, so the only thing he could do was wait. He didn't have to wait for long, though. Figures appeared in the entrance of the cave, and Dager made the shot. Instantly, a small amount of blue laser fire, and a huge amount of red ones intertwined in the cave. Red lasers flew inside the cave, almost getting Dager, who tried his best to take out his enemies before they could take him out. One of those red lasers flew all the way to the end of the cave and hit the wall. The wall moved, and two huge eyes appeared on it. After that came a curved beak, which opened and let out a horrifying screech. Sraik. Chapter 73 The screech was so loud that all of them, be it Dager or the Mon Calamarians, stopped. Dager turned and looked at the darkness behind him, only to see a pink tentacle shooting out of the darkness and winding around him. The tentacle swung him, smashing into the walls a couple of times. The impact was so hard that Dager actually spat blood, leaving a small and red mist on the water. The scent of blood seemed to stimulate the owner of the tentacles, and it came out of the darkness. A giant monster. That was the only way Dager could describe it. It was at least fifteen meters long, with a pink body. It was covered by a dark gray shell, and the only uncovered place was its face, from where the tentacles came. Five long tentacles, ending on suckers and starting at the sides of its beak. The monster went closer and closer to the entrance of the cave, and the Mon Calamarians there seemed to be paralyzed. Even when the tentacles reached out to grab them, there was still no resistance from their part. The monster kept dragging Dager, and luckily for him, decided that it was one Mon Calamari, not him, that would be his dinner. The scene was gruesome. The monster, however, was not satisfied after just one Mon Calamari, and this time, Dager was the unfortunate one. As the tentacle pulled him closer and closer to the curved beak, Dager had to think fast. When the monster opened its beak in anticipation, Dager used another of the electric grenades, launching it directly inside the monster's mouth. Blue arcs of electricity filled the monster mouth, and it let another horrifying screech before its tentacles twitched and let go of Dager and the Mon Calamarians. Without worrying about the fact that they were enemies, Clone and Mon Calamarian swam as fast as they could to get out of the cave. Once they were out in the ocean again, Dager was instantly surrounded by Mon Calamarians. There were at least ten of them, lead by the one who chased Dager on the well. They entered a stalemate, 
both sides pointing their weapons at each other, but too worried with the monster to actually try and eliminate each other. The Mon Calamari on the lead, the one with the tattoos, looked viciously at Dajer. Clun. Your kind eliminated my father. We are at war, Mon Calamari. Your father was amongst the one who attacked my home planet. How would you feel if we attacked Mon Kala? Moon Kala? Ha! I despise Moon Kala. They took your side, and betrayed my father and I. Listen Klun. The name of who will eliminate you is Haigi, soon of Mirai. So the Mon Calamari was the son of the enemy commander. Now it made sense why he had such hate for the clones. And I am Dajer, son of Kamino, a pleasure to meet you. Don't you think that we have more immediate problems? Such as this creature right there. Dajer pointed at the cave, from where the tentacles of the monster were already emerging. I can eliminate you first, scum. Heidi spat those words, and was almost pulling the trigger. But Dajer was already expecting that, and sent his last electric grenade. The grenade exploded, once more paralyzing the Mon Calamarians, and knocking some of them unconscious. Dajer obviously would not wait for them, and swam as fast as he could to the tunnel. When he arrived there he looked over his shoulder, and saw the monster grabbing Mon Calamarians and stuffing them on its mouth. The clone threw another one of the electric grenades, catching Heige and the other Mon Calamarians out off guard. With a numb body, Heige could only look while the monster used its tentacles to capture his men and eat them. Heige hated himself for not being able to move, he hated the clone who caused so many of his men to die, and he hated Count Dooku, who started it all. As the tentacles reached for him, the only thing he could do was watch and wait. At that moment, when he was almost being captured, Tart, his father right hand, pushed him out of the way. Tart. Until the moment that his body was crushed by the curved beak, Tart said nothing, but only looked at Heige, his eyes telling him to run. Later, on the bottom of the ocean, Heige's ship. Heige was once more on the control room, facing Count Dooku's hologram. Heige. I see your vengeance didn't go as well as expected. Not caring about how Count Dooku knew this, Heige faced him silently. Child, you come to me for my help, even after you said you will eliminate me. I will show you the path on which you can destroy all clones. Go to a planet called Kaylee. Someone there will teach you how to exercise your vengeance. Heige turned off the transmission, and not much later a ship left Scarif. Chapter 74 When Dajer got out of the well, the situation was pretty much the same as when he left, but both sides had suffered losses. Without counting the Mon Calamarians who chased him, and were by now most probably dead, there were about twenty-five or thirty of them. The clones obviously made them pay a heavy price to get to the inside of the base. But they did. Dajer could see two dead clones on the doorway, and another one leaning on the wall. Thankfully none of them was of Hell Squad. As Dajer got inside the facilities of the medical base, more bodies appeared. Most of them were Mon Calamarians, but there were also some more clones, and even some researchers. Judging by the blasters on their hands, even the researchers were still clones. Soon, Dajer heard laser fire. He sneaked across the corridors, and saw the backs of the Mon Calamarians. They were grouped around a door on which water tests was written, and were firing inside. There were two more dead clones, with holes on their backs. Dajer couldn't see who they were. By the sights of it, the clones were retreating when the Mon Calamarians caught up to them. If Dajer didn't miss anything, then there were seventeen Mon Calamarians alive. And judging by the bodies all over, only three or four clones remained, plus Hell Squad and some researchers. Hey, you smelly scum! Dajer did the most reasonable thing, which was, of course, shooting at every Mon Calamari on his line of sight. The DC-15S that he took from 3-4 was the best option at this kind of close combat, since it could fire faster, and accuracy wasn't so important. Gus started with his blaster pointed at the left, and pressed the trigger non-stop, at the same time moving the weapon in a horizontal line, ending his movement on the right. As a result, the back lines of the Mon Calamarians, about six of them, all fell, and the astonished survivors took a lot of time to react. Dajer didn't have anywhere to hide, 
and all of his ammo was spent. But he didn't need to worry, as the clones on the room came out, and quickly took down some enemies. For the first time in the whole battle, the Mon Calamarians showed some common sense and surrendered. Only half an hour later that Dager finally had the chance to sit down and think about the situation. They had nine prisoners, all locked and defeated both physically and mentally. However, the Republic side wasn't faring much better. On the battle, of the original 18 clones stationed on the medical base, only Salve and three more remained. Of the researchers, more than half were dead, all with a blaster on their hands. Hell Squad only had one wounded, Tech, and no dead, but were extremely tired. Talking about that, the only reason they were alive and victorious was because of that strange monster that Dager encountered. The creature eliminated at least 15 Mon Calamarians, and Dager still didn't know if their leader was alive, but his instincts told him that Heige was. Dager became curious about why such a dangerous monster lived near the medical base, and asked one of the researchers. The answer surprised him. It turned out that the monster was called Blixus, a native predator of Scarif. The electric grenades were originally designed to deal with it. And more, the Blixus he encountered was only one of the many who lived in Scarif. The clones knew the monster lived there, but since it never came out of its cave, until Dager electrocuted it, they never had any problems. The aftermath of the battle was intense, and the clones spent the next few days cleaning up everything. The task of how to make the production continue was not Dager's problem, and the researchers decided to wait a few weeks before going down on the water, to make sure the Blixes had calmed down. However, the medical base still had a huge stockpile of medicines, and Dager got it all ready for their return to Kamino. Dager didn't know that Heige had survived and followed Dooku's instructions to go to Kaylee, but it was a fact that after the battle their communications were restored. Dager saw that as a sign that the planet was theirs again. It was only after a week that another group of Republic ships arrived, not rushing since Dager contacted them to say everything was under control. Dager was expecting that they would get the medical supplies on a ship and go back to Kamino, but apparently, Commander Keeley and General D had other plans. Both of them disembarked from the Sincerity, and asked Dager to have all the clones in position because they were going to get a speech. Together with the speech came the surprises. Chapter 75 Commander Keeley and General D looked quite serious when they saw all the clones lined up and waiting, for a grand total of eleven clones and six researchers. Both leaders looked at the group, solemn expressions on their faces, but Dager wasn't getting any bad feelings. He went up to greet them. General, Commander. It is good to see you. For some time we thought we were all dead. Dager, are those all the survivors? Even the injured are here. Keeley. Yes, General. Commander Keeley stepped forward, and took off his helmet. His eyes calm, he took out a data pad. But before he started reading from it, he decided to say something himself. Clones. Only you remain before me, of over thirty brothers who were here before. They died doing their duties, but that doesn't make their deaths less important. Commander Keeley looked at the clones, who were all looking sharp. Most of them had some new scar or hole in their armor to show. Satisfied, Commander Keeley looked at the data pad, and started reading it. Sergeant Salve. One step ahead. Salve walked until he was in front of Commander Keeley and General D. Sergeant Salve, the Republic, and I, are deeply grateful to you and your men, by defending this medical base, at the cost of your lives. Your lost troopers will be replenished soon. Thank you, sir. Salve returned to his position, and then it was the turn of the head researcher, Jitu. Jitu, many of the researchers lost their lives defending this base, as good as any other clone. Their sacrifice will not be forgotten, and the men you lost will also be replenished. Thank you, sir. After both men returned to their initial position, Commander Keeley passed the data pad to General D, who took it, but didn't give it another glance. With his hoarse voice, the Jedi asked Dager to come a little bit forward. Dager, leader of Hell Squad. You lead your squad and the garrison of this medical base to withstand an attack from an enemy many times larger. 
Your actions also gave the Republic a crucial piece of information, that being that our enemies are not only much better prepared than we thought, but also that they are not only droids. He stopped talking, something that Deja was already accustomed. General D looked at Commander Keeley, who took over. Deja, you did a meritorious service for the Republic, and showed exceptional bravery, attracting the invasion force way and giving your men the chance to regroup and fight back. For that reason, I, in the name of the Grand Army of the Republic, am rewarding you with the second-class Kaminoan Medal. Commander Kelly took out a small medal, shaped like a rectangle, and with dark blue borders. The medal was magnetized, and when Commander Keeley put it on Dager's chest, it stayed there without falling. Dager accepted the medal without any complaints, as he already suspected he would receive something like that. What surprised him was the second part of Commander Keeley's words. That is not all. Now I am not speaking in the name of the Grand Army of the Republic, but in the name of the 303rd Attack Legion. During this battle and many others, you showed outstanding courage, leadership, and a little bit of craziness. However, everything you did was thinking about your brothers, and how to keep most of them alive. Those are the thoughts that a leader should have. He paused, and one of the clones that came with him advanced, carrying a box bigger than Dager's head. The clone gave the box to Commander Keeley, who in turn passed it to Dager, but told him not to open it yet. I discussed with the general, and we both agreed that you deserve a promotion. You don't have to say that you don't want it, I know you don't. But we cannot let your talents go to waste. Because of that, we both agreed that you shall be given the rank of sub-commander in name. That means you will still command Hell Squad as a special unit, but when needed you will have to step out and take over. Do you copy that? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, General. Commander Keeley and General D united the best of both options, giving Dager a place for his talents to shine, but at the same time keeping the best special squad on the 303rd. Nobody would say that aloud, but it was obvious that they were showing a lot more support for Hell Squad and Dager than for the rest. General D put his hands on Dager's shoulders, and surprisingly made a joke. We prepared you a little gift, to congratulate you and at the same time make the heavy duties we are putting on you are a little bit lighter. It was so different from the general normal self that Dager took a few moments before he understood that it was not a real commentary, but a half joke. Like a kid that got a new present, Dager opened the box expectantly. On it, a shiny new helmet waited for him. Chapter 76 Dager opened the box, and inside it was a shiny new helmet. He used both hands to pick up the helmet and saw it was very different from the normal ones. First of all, it had one of the macro binoculars that was only present on lieutenant and higher ranks. The macro binoculars was different from the usual ones, slimmer and more powerful. It had many functions, like night vision, 100x zoom, detection software that provided distance, wind, elevation and more. But that was by far the less eye-catching piece of the helmet. What really caused an impression was the dark, reddish-brown paint. The right side was plain white like the standard armor, but on the left was a stylized horn, much like the one on Commander Keeley's helmet. The base of the horn started a little above the neck piece, and started thinning as it went up. It ended when it met the visor, and appeared once above it. At the top, the tip of the horn was only one finger large, and made a curve to the side part of the helmet, ending in a half circle. It was amazing. Dager never thought he would use those words to describe a helmet, but it was really amazing. Dager picked his old helmet, full of scorched marks, dust and scars, and put it carefully on the box. Old or not, the helmet saved his life many times, and Dager felt it deserved some respect. After that, he put his new helmet, and it fitted perfectly, just like his old one. The helmet was new, but he felt a sense of familiarity with it, just like the one he felt with blasters, even when he had never used them. It was his soldier jeans talking. He pushed down the macro binoculars, and started playing with it. The islands that before were just a dot on the sea, now were clear as day, and he could even see the distance between them. Realizing that he was behaving like a Kawakian monkey lizard, Dager held his new helmet under his arms and saluted Commander Keeley and General D. Dager was already respected by the men of the 303rd, but his prestige grew a few steps after his promotion. 
He was now the sub-commander, and slowly his achievement started to spread. He was the clone who destroyed an AAT using a grenade on his first battle. He was the clone who formed up a special squad from zero. He was the clone who took down an entire battle sphere. He was the clone who confronted the weapon of death of the Separatist, the Harvest. He was the clone who led a group of men in the sewers and tore apart a droid base. He was the clone who hijacked a Separatist cruiser on Kamino, and risked his life when he threw it on the enemy forces. He was the clone who took a bunch of shines and commanded them to fight more than a hundred Mon Calamarians. He was the clone who fought a Blixis and used it to destroy his enemies. Here and there he would hear someone talking about him, and many of his closest friends, like Rosal, Fonder, Guard and Barrow, went up to congratulate him. In the end, they didn't return to Kamino. Two CR-90s were sent back with the supplies, and the sincerity, together with the rest of General D's fleet, was going to their next destination. Now, Deja was going to a meeting to discover exactly what was that destination. Fully clad in armor, his helmet standing out, Deja's presence made every clone stop what they were doing and greet him. When he arrived at the door of the command bridge, the four guards stepped aside and made way for him. With the black space as background, the command bridge was less crowded than Deja expected. General D and Commander Keeley were with Admiral Dow, seeing the projection of a planet. They all had worried expressions on their faces, but that didn't tell much, as all commanders had that kind of face. General D, sir. Admiral Dow, commander. The Nikto looked up, and called Dager closer. He then pointed to the planet on the projection. The planet looked like it was actually two, the smaller one, made of earth and so, and a bigger one, like a sphere enveloping it, made of water. Dager had a bad feeling. Dager, are you familiar with that planet? It feels familiar, sir, but I don't actually know what planet it is. Can you? The Jedi answered him ambiguously, not saying the name of the planet but telling him everything he needed to know. I called you here for two reasons Dager. First of all, you are the sub-commander. Secondly, I want you to detail the battle you had with the Mon Calamarians on Scarif. Because we are going to their home. Chapter 77 We are going to their home. So their next destination was Mon Cala. Dager had already heard of the situation on the planet. The two intelligent species on the planet, the Mon Calamarians and the Quarans had engaged on war for hundreds of years, only coming to some kind of peace on the last few decades. But that peace was once more broken when the Clone Wars started and the planet once again was divided in two. Most of the Mon Calamarians took the Republic side, the exceptions being a few like Hygie and Mirai. On the other hand, the Quarans had taken the Republic side, mostly because they didn't want to fight side by side with the Mon Calamarians. As the flames of their internal conflict burned stronger and stronger, both Republic and Separatist had sent their troops. Now, both sides were in a standoff both on space and on the planet. One side controlling the south, and the other the north, small skirmishes had been happening for the last months. Now the planet was on the verge of an all-out conflict. And Dager voiced his doubts about it. Sir, it is not that I like the situation on the planet, but till now, nothing big happened. However, I fear that the arrival of another Republic fleet and legion might be the spark that ignites it all. The Mon Calamari king asked for Republic aid. If we deny that, the whole planet might turn to the Separatist. And the start of a war is crucial. Losing a planet on a battle, we can take it back. But losing the people. That is not something that can be retaken easily. The Senate is afraid that this might start a chain reaction. We have to show our allies, and the neutral systems that we can be trusted. Even if that means starting another battle. Seeing that things were getting a little out of hand, Commander Keeley intervened. Dager, orders are orders. Later, some were more silent of the sincerity. Commander Keeley stoked Dager, and looked at him seriously. Dager. What was that? Commander, with all due respect, but we are going to send a lot of our brothers to death if we go to Mon Cala. I just think. You think I don't know that? Do you think the general doesn't know that? Let me tell you something. 
When we received our orders, the first thing the general did was go and voice the same concerns with the Jedi Council. That got danger. Of course, General D would think the same things he did, and have the same worries. You, Dager, are a sub-commander now. If the only thing you do is complain and go against your superiors, then maybe you are not as fit for this position as we thought you were. We are going to Mon Cala, and we are going to fight. That is our job. We are already at war. One battle more we win can be the decisive factor, and you know that. Now think about that, and I want you to pass the information you pass to us to as many as possible soldiers. Go. I am sorry sir, I. Dejer wanted to explain, but in the end, he just decided to go do his bindings. Meanwhile, with all that talk about Mon Cala, he wondered what happened to Haigi, the Mon Calamari he fought on Scarif. Millions of parsecs away, deep into wild space. A small ship came out of hyperspace. The ship was controlled by only one being, a Mon Calamari. Before Haigi was a small planet, called Kali. When Count Dooku sent him there, Haigi had looked for all the information he could get on the planet. However, besides the coordinates and the fact that there were no intelligent lifeforms there, he got nothing else. When his scanners analyzed the planet, he saw that there was no sign of life at all. It was a barren and deserted planet, but weirdly, his sensors told him that it should be habitable to most lifeforms in the galaxy. As he got closer to the planet, his sensors finally picked up something different. On one of the few mountains of Kali, there were high energy fluctuations. Heige flew over the plains and savannas of the planet, and landed on the mountain range. There, amidst the mist, a door was opened, and waiting for him. He picked his vibro trident and his blaster, and got in slowly. As soon as he passed through the door, it closed, and he was in total darkness, one that even his eyes, adapted to the depths of Moncala, couldn't see through. But he walked all the same, until an eerie voice was heard. Ka 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 ka. So you are the insect that. Cough. The insect that my master sent for me to train. Who are you? Ka 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 ka. If you survive, you will see. A hole opened under Heidi, and he fell in the darkness below. Inside the mountain, only a creepy laugh remained. Chapter 78 Heidi slid down faster and faster, his head, back and hands slamming on the sides repeatedly, leaving many bruises. Then, the hole ended, and he slammed on the ground, his legs exploding in pain. Struggling to get up, he looked around. The room he was now was illuminated by green lights, and was circular. While he was wondering what to do, the creepy voice appeared once more. Insect, you are weak. I don't understand why my master chose you. But if you can't survive this, then I am sure he will agree that choosing you was a mistake. What do I have to survive? Ka 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 ka. As an answer, from another hole in the ceiling, two droids wearing cloaks fell. They rolled on the ground and split, starting to surround Heige. On their hands, a metal rod appeared, and on both ends of it, purple lightning appeared. Ka 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 ka. Cough, cough. Kaka. Those are only the first battle you will fight, insect. Kaka kaka. Since his conversation with Commander Keeley, Dager thought a lot about what his commander said, and realized that he was right. Dager had indeed forgotten his place as a soldier, and that he couldn't be afraid of starting a battle. He wasn't fighting only for the Republic, but for a galaxy in which he and his brothers could be free, and that galaxy would only become reality if they win the war. With all that in mind, Deja shared his experiences in underwater combat, about two hours of it, with every clone he could. That could be the difference between life and death in the Battle of Mon Cala. When they came out of hyperspace they arrived just behind the Republic fleet already there. On the distance, very far away, was the Separatist fleet. They must have detected General D fleet before it got out of hyperspace, because they were already arranging defensive formations. But they obviously didn't know that the Republic was going to send aid from Mon Cala, since they didn't attack, but waited for the Republic move. As per discussed before, half of the CR-90S on General D fleet immediately descended on the planet. Their objective was to drop troopers on Mon Cala. 
since less they only had diving and underwater equipment for less than half of the legion, only two regiments, about four. Zero 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 clones, would fight on the planet. The rest would stay on the cruisers, either to board separatist ships or defend against them. Hell Squad was among the ones who would be dropped, but the separatists wouldn't let them get there easily. Mon Kala was basically an ocean, and as such, there was nothing like outposts, bases and else. The battles would take place directly in the cities, and 4,000 clones could make all the difference there. So, as soon as their objective became clear, the separatists moved to intercept. Vulture droid after vulture droid speed towards them, and the same amount of Republic starfighters went to meet the incoming enemy. Inside one of the corvettes, Deja reassured his opinion that this was the worst moment of any invasion. He was fine with fighting on the group or underwater, attacking or defending, alone or with his brothers, but not inside a ship. He couldn't do anything, only hope that he wasn't the next to be blown by the droids. At the cost of many pilots' lives, including some of Steel Battalion, only two corvettes were lost on their way. The bottom part of the CR-90 opened, and Dager, this time using much better prepared equipment, told the clones to jump, squad by squad. Hell Squad was the last. Dager watched his brothers jump, then sent his squad members. Tech, 3-4. Brain, Metal. Go down. Cell, Dab. Your turn. Hell Squad jumped, hitting the water and creating splashes. The last man on the corvette, Dager connected the tubes on his diving mask and drooped from the ship. Feet first, the water enveloped him. Kaylee, in a room on the mountain complex. Heige gasped hard. At his feet was the body of a crab-like creature, and a broken half of Heige's vibro-trident was trespassing its head. Heige knelt on the ground. His clothes were ragged and his body full of wounds. His left hand was wrapped in a bloody bandage, and this little finger was missing. The room was full of bodies, most of them being a type of droid called Magnaguard, but also a lot of different creatures, all of them deadly. The voice that Heige had been hearing for the last three days appeared as soon as he eliminated his enemy, just like he expected. Cough. Mon Calamari, you have passed the test that my master left for you. Heige unexpectedly laughed so hard that his wounds started bleeding again. Cough. What is so funny? You. You called me, Mon Calamari, Nut Insect. The voice was startled for a moment. You are still an insect. But an. But an insect who passed my master's test. You survived three days fighting every twenty minutes. I will train you. Ka 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 ka. Chapter 79 The water closed around Dager, but this time he didn't get temporarily blind. The clones taking part in this battle had vision gear made especially for underwater combat, and that should help them aim. Their armor was modified to resist the pressure from the depths, and their air supply should last a week. All in all, they were ready for a long battle. Dager looked around and saw all the clones that were under his command. He looked at the map on his comlink, and pointed south and down. Move out. Squad leaders, if anything happens, report to me. Keep an eye out for trouble. We might be on friendly territory, but that doesn't mean the clankers can come and get us. Using thrusters, the clones dove in the depths below. Heidi walked in a long, straight hull. On both sides, green lights illuminated him, giving his injured face a terrible look. Holding his hand at his chest and limping, he almost fell many times. Finally, when he was almost giving up, he got to the end of the corridor. He got to another room, a storage one. However, the things it was storing were weird. Hands and arms made of metal were hanging from the ceiling. On racks, feet and legs laid. Heidi walked amongst the racks, looking for nothing in particular. The metallic limbs shone in the green light, and their shadows formed deformed beings on the walls, sending chills down his spine. Heidi made another turn, and when he looked at the things on the rack, he almost tripped on himself. Row after row of weirdly shaped metal heads watched him. Their empty eye sockets followed him wherever he looked. Heidi was almost turning back and getting out of this line of racks when one of the heads caught his attention. Differently from the others, which were opaque but new, that one looked old. 
Heidi got closer, trying to figure out why, and looked at the empty eye sockets. The darkness seemed to call him, and he reached with his hand. And then the eyes opened. Bright yellow irises, with reptilian pupils, faced him. Something hit his chest hard, sending him flying, and he was unconscious before he hit the ground. Grabbing on thrusters, the clones of the 303rd dove into the ocean. Deja was in the front, following his map to arrive at the city of Vernila, where their allies were. Suddenly he received a signal from ahead. One of the scouts he had sent returned with another clone. Deja looked at the clone and his worn-out armor. He was from a different clone group, the scuba troopers under Jedi Master Kit Fisto. They were a legion specialized in underwater combat, and were of course the first to arrive on Mon Cala. Their equipment was even better than the one that the 303rd was wearing. They had propulsion backpacks and scuba rifles, which helped them operate to their best. The clone approached Dager, and seeing his helmet knew that he was of high rank. CT-9087, Glock, from Monk Company, Scuba Troopers. Dager, 303rd Attack Legion. Glock, what is the situation ahead? All clear sir. The Quarans and Separatists have engaged our troops in many small fights in the last week, but nothing big happened. Is General Fisto in Vernila? No, sir. He went in a recognizance mission with Commander Monk yesterday. Dejer preferred to talk to the Jedi as soon as possible, but if he wasn't there, then he could do nothing. Following Glock, the 303rd dove even deeper, going straight to Vernila. Slowly, Heidi woke up from his torpor. His body was aching all over, but he realized that most of it was because he was hanging upside down. Chains wrapped around his ankles, but his arms were free. His first reaction was to try and reach the chains, to get rid of them, but when he moved, his body rotated enough for him to see a dark figure in the corner. Seeing he was awake, the figure approached him, his steps making heavy, clank noises. The figure appeared in the light little by little. In the end, the owner of the heavy footsteps showed itself. Heidi almost thought it was another monster. It was at least two, five meters tall, and his body was totally covered in dirty white metal pieces. His chest was sectioned on three parts, and Heidi could see a dark red heart beating under them. It was then that Heidi understood that the white metal pieces weren't an armor, as he had thought, but the actual body of the creature. When it talked, the only thing that moved were its eyes, and it didn't have a mouth. Ka 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 ka. Insect. My master ordered me to train you in the ways that the Jedi fight. Like me you don't have talent in the Force, but you. But you can learn their other talents. Who? Who are you? The creature grabbed something behind his body. With a green flash, a lightsaber as turned on centimeters way from Heige's face. Ka 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 ka. I am the Jedi Hunter. My name is Grievous. Ka 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 ka. Chapter 80 At one of the many crevices that made up the bottom of Mon Cala, Vernila laid. The buildings were built in the rocks, and a glowing stone worked as light. Between the buildings glass tunnels with rapid currents connected them. That way, the Mon Calamarians could travel faster, and safely. Glock took the 303rd to a big building a little away from the city. The flag of the Republic was printed on the building. When they entered it, they saw many scuba troopers, all of them in good shape. It was impossible to treat the wounded underwater, so they had to be sent back to the ships above as soon as possible. Soon the 303rd was accommodated, and since Dejer was the commander, it was his job to go and talk with the Mon Calamarians. But he decided to wait for Monk and General Fisto to come back. If he wasn't wrong, anything he asked about the Quarans or Separatist would be answered with hate. He wanted to have a clear view of the situation, if possible given by a Jedi. Nevertheless, he still decided to walk around the city. He changed his helmet for a normal one, so others, beside clones, wouldn't be able to tell his rank. That way, even if he was stopped by a Mon Calamari he could say he didn't know anything because he was too low ranked. What surprised him was that the Mon Calamarians lived as if they weren't about to enter a war. Merchants still sold their merchandise, parents and kids were shopping and playing. The only signs that the war was already there were the soldiers patrolling the city, 
and the graffiti claiming for the death of the Quarans. Dejer even saw some wanting for the clones to leave. As he wandered in the poorest areas of the city, the situation started to get worse, and the number of graffiti asking the clones to leave started to get bigger. When Dejer turned a corner, he saw a commotion. Three young and male Mon Calamarians were kicking and punching someone. Initially, he was going to let them be, and call the Mon Calamari police. But then he saw that the person they were beating was different from the Mon Calamarians. His skin was yellow, and he had small tentacles growing of its chin. It was a Quarren. But what was a Quarren doing in the middle of a Mon Calamari city? If he was a spy, how could he let three Mon Calamarians beat him? But then another group of Mon Calamarians appeared. Dajer thought they were going to join the others, but in turn they took the side of the Quarren. A big fight broke out, and by the time Dajer got there the three Mon Calamarians had ran. One of the Mon Calamari helped the Quarren up, and hugged him. When Dajer approached, the crowd parted, and Dajer saw that there were many more Quarrens amidst them. The Quarren who was beaten up was bleeding from some small cuts, but besides that, he looked okay. Both Mon Calamarians and Quarrens looked at Dajer with some hostility, but his words surprised them. Are you alright? The Quarren nodded, his hostility appeasing a little. Dajer asked the question that was in his mind. You are a Quarren, right? Many of you are. I thought you were at war with the Mon Calamarians. The Quarren gave a dry laugh. Our kings are at war. It has been many years since both our species saw that it was unnecessary. I moved here when we were at peace, but now that we are at war again, things are getting out of hand. What you saw today isn't the first time and neither the last. Back at the barracks, Dajer was deep in thought. He never thought that maybe, just maybe, not everyone agreed to the war. Quarrens and Mon Calamarians had hated each other for centuries, but when they had the chance to get along, they discovered they had a lot in common. Sir, the general returned. Thank you Vilo. Dajer thanked the clone that warned him, and went to the command center, ready to meet the Jedi and Commander Monk. The Jedi had green skin, and his hair was a bunch of tentacles. He had a big smile on his face, as if seeing Dajer was the best thing in the galaxy. Besides him was a scuba trooper with two yellow lines, one on which side of his helmet. Commander Monk, probably. You must be Dajer, the rising star of the 303rd Attack Legion. General Fisto, Commander Monk. Not so much, but I am Dajer, yeah. Did Master D come? No, sir. He said he can't fight in an ambient too watery. Ha ha ha. That is understandable, he is a Nikto after all. His home planet doesn't even have a lake. But forget about that. Give us your report Dajer. I have two regiments with me, but none of them have combat experience underwater. I fought some Mon Calamarians on Scarif, so I did my best, but General D hopes that Commander Monk can train them before we start our attack. Kit Fisto looked at Monk, who nodded his head. That is a deal then. Now let us tell you what we saw. Chapter 81 Kit Fisto turned on his hologram projector, and showed Dajer and Monk some underwater separatist buildings. When I went ahead, I passed a good number of their patrols, both droids and quarons. Their base is quite well hidden. If I haven't followed one of their patrols, it would have been difficult to find. He zoomed on the face of one Quarren, presumably the king, since he had a crown on his head. The Quarrens have always been more aggressive than the Mon Calamarians. He is Chieftain Nasseri. Ever since the Separatist contacted him, he had shown huge support to their cause. Now, he is at their camp. This shows where his loyalty really lies. Next, the Jedi showed the base once more, this time focusing on the buildings. Their weapon depots are here, here and here. I saw at least two buildings that look like storage of some sorts, they might keep the deactivated droids there. Also, the Quarrens are staying in a group of buildings out of the base. Maybe the Separatist doesn't trust them, or they don't trust the Separatist. Or maybe both don't trust each other. Did you see what defenses they had General? Dajer shrugged, and asked the most concerning thing for an attack force. I am no specialist in regards to Quarren weapons, 
but there were at least twenty things that looked like giant pipes. I bet they are a cannon of some sort. And there are many separatist manta droids and mini subs. Dajer looked at the projection and thought of many different ways of attack, but none of them had a hundred percent chance of they winning. Besides that, there weren't that many clones, and they had to minimize their casualties as much as possible. While he and the Jedi were thinking, Monk spoke for the first time. We could bury them. Dajer was startled, as was the Jedi. Kit Fisto didn't answer immediately, but went deep in thought. Dajer and Monk kept quiet, but Dajer could understand what the scuba trooper meant. The Separatists wanted to keep their base hidden, so they chose a crevice in the rocks, and as the Jedi discovered, it was extremely hard to attack. But that also meant that the clones could undermine the rocks above, and crush them. Strategically speaking, that was the best way to destroy the enemy without suffering a single casualty. Dajer nodded his head, agreeing with Monk, but the Jedi didn't. If it was just the droids, I could agree. But there are Quarans there. Even though they are our enemies now, we can't do that. Monk shook his head disappointed but not surprised. Dajer knew what both sides were thinking. Clones were genetically engineered to be combat machines. Things such as mercy and pity were unknown to them. But the Jedi were peacekeepers. Their history came from thousands of years, when the galaxy was at a chaotic moment, and the so-called dark side ruled. After many thousands of years, the Jedi had accommodated on their role of guardians, judges and mediators, and were unprepared to the Clone Wars. At least that was what Dajer thought. But a general was still a general, even if his methods weren't the best. If we can't do that, then a frontal attack is our only option, but the cost will be high. Dajer, Monk, return to the barracks. Monk, I will take your suggestion to Yoz Kalina. He is still king, and that is still his planet, he has the right to at least know our options. Dajer, take your men to outside the city, Monk will send someone to give them some basic training. Yes General. Yes General. When the Jedi left, Monk turned to Dajer speaking in a way that clones only spoke with each other. Brother, let me present myself unofficially. I am Monk, commander of the scuba troopers, and under General Fisto. Dajer, subcommander of the 303rd Attack Legion. I see that General Fisto is quite difficult to deal with. He is emotive. His mood swings very fast, but his sense of righteousness is unmovable. Now come, let me give your boys a taste of underwater combat. Vernila, Red Palace, Side Hall. Dajer and Monk were at the most important building of Mon Cala, the Red Palace, where the king lived and made his decisions. At that moment, what they were deciding was their course of attack. The meeting had been called by the king himself, Yoz Kalina. For fear of spies, only the most trusted men of the king were there, mainly generals, and the prime minister. Of course, Jedi Kit Fisto and the clone commanders, Dajer and Monk were also there. As Kit Fisto have suspected, when he took Monk's suggestion over to the king, the old Mon Calamari rejected. But many of his generals didn't view the matter the same as him. They supported burying the Quarans, and Yoz Kalina was having a hard time suppressing their protest. The side hall was filled with angry voices shouting, and the situation was getting a little intense. Because of that, General Fisto used the force to move a torrent of bubbles right in the middle of the hall, attracting everyone's attention. Chapter 82 Bubbles shuffled in the side hall, and the Mon Calamarians twitched and swam a few steps back. Dajer and Monk weren't surprised, since it wasn't their first time seeing the force in action. Yoz Kalina also didn't seem phased by that. Having grabbed the attention of everyone, Kit Fisto smiled. Your Highness, Generals, please listen to me. I am speaking in name of the Jedi Council when I say that we do not agree on that tactic. The Mon Calamarians got angry, because their biggest backer was the Republic. If the Jedi didn't want to help them, then they had zero chance of winning an argument with the King. Monk retreated slightly, and pulled Dajer while doing so. Using his comlink so only Dajer could hear, he uttered dangerous words. Be prepared. Those Mon Calamarians are too angry. I fear the general or their king won't be able to control them. Dajer frowned, and unconsciously reached for his blaster. 
Meanwhile, Kit Fisto continued talking. While the clones here are under my command, the Republic will not take part in such inhuman attack. One of the generals that was closer to the king whispered something to him. The king got angry, and ordered the general aside. Unhappy with the king's attitude, the general started whispering with some others, before speaking to Kit Fisto. Jedi, you say such things, but you never saw the horrors that the Korans do to or people. You have no a right to say that here. Yo's Kalina got up from his throne, his green face a shade darker. Yo's Tivos. All the while, Kit Fisto's smile never faded. Don't worry, your highness. His worries are perfectly understandable. You are right when you say I don't know what the Korans did to your people, General Tivos. What I know, though, is what the Mon Calamarians can do to the Korans. I've seen innocent Korans being beaten and eliminated on the streets of Renaila, be they elders, women, men, or children. And I know that you can't wait to bury thousands of Korans because of an old feud. Yo's Tivos was speechless. Rumble filled the side hall once more. Dajer frowned even harder. He didn't like the way that things were going. The hall was splitting into two different factions, one taking the king's side, and the other echoing Yo's Tivo's words. Why should we respect the Korans? They are beasts. We follow the king. Which side is the Republic? Are you even here to aid Moon Kala? Oh or to give it to the Separatist? Jedi, do you represent the Republic? Are you just speaking your mind? Silence. When Yo's Kalina spoke, everyone shut up. The king was still the king, even if he was going against the wishes of his subordinates. Jedi, finish speaking. Generals, if you wish, you can ask the Chancellor for another Jedi or Commander. But while I am here, we won't undermine those rocks. That is not the way the Republic fights. Many hours later, only Yo's Kalina, Dajer, Monk, Kit Fisto and a few loyal aides of the king stayed in the hall. After the generals paid their respects to the king, in a not very respectful way, they stormed out of the hall, still angry with the decision. But they couldn't do anything, because without the help of the Republic they would be crushed. Master Jedi, I am sorry that my bro other behaved in such way. Ever since we were little, Tivo's always was against the peace agreements that her father made with the Korans. I wasn't offended, your highness. But if I could ask for your help. Go ahead. Please, send someone to keep an eye on General Yo's Tivos. I am afraid that he might do something harsh. I already did that. But he is right about an thing. We can't delay much, who are the side attacking will be the separatist. How about? What? While the king was speaking, one Mon Calamari came and said something in his ear, and that invoked a big reaction from him. Tivos, how can he? That is unacceptable. Your Highness, what happened? My bro other. He ignored my orders, and decided to bury the Separatist himself. Hearing that, Kit Fisto decisively turned around and swam out of the Red Palace. Dajer and Monk followed him, and on the background, the King was barking orders at his subordinates. Monk and Dajer only caught up to the Jedi when they reached their barracks. There, Kit Fisto was grabbing a thruster, and a battalion was already behind him. As soon as they arrived, Monk and Dajer parted ways, each going to their respective men. Brain. Get everyone here now. Tech, 3-4, go with the support team, get them going, we catch up to you. Cell, Dab, you two go ahead, destination, Separatist base. However, your target isn't them, but a group of Mon Calamarians who are going there. They are going against the orders of King Yo's Kalina and General Fisto. Don't eliminate anyone, but try your best to stop them without alerting the Separatist. You will probably meet a group of scuba troopers with the same mission. Sir, are we attacking? I am not sure yet, but the odds are that we will have to attack, ready or not. It is up to General Fisto. Dajer turned his comlink and spoke to every clone of the 303rd on direct channel with him. I boys. It is time for some action. Chapter 83 Using their thrusters and propulsion backpacks, the clones set out almost immediately. Such a huge movement would be impossible to hide, 
and Dager was sure that the Clankers and the Separatist would be waiting for them. It was with that in mind that Dager thought that maybe the insubordination of Yos Tivos was for the best. But the general was disobeying his king, and that was unacceptable for Dager. When Dager and the 303rd got on their way, the Mon Calamari army was still trying to organize themselves. The scuba troopers were either setting out or already on their way. When Dager stopped one of them, he discovered that Monk and Kit Fisto had gone ahead. Sel, are you there? Where are you now? Did you catch up to General Fisto and Commander Monk? Sir, Commander Monk is with us, but General Fisto just stormed past us. Hurry up and get your men over here. Our scouts already reported that the Separatists are mobilizing. And we still have no clue on Yos Tivos. Monk cut into the conversation, and Dager had to hurry his troops. One of the advantages of the ocean was that they didn't have to take any detours, just a straight line. Not much later they caught up to Monk, Sel, Dab and the other advanced units. They were pretty close to the separatist base, so they were forced to stop, or they would have a head-on confront. Dager swam closer to Monk, but he didn't see any Jedi or Mon Calamari general with him. Commander, what happened? Many things and nothing. General Fisto ordered us to stay here and went to see the separatist base. He is not Olin, so he is much more agile in the water. And what about Yos Tivos? And the separatist? They are starting to move, but it doesn't seem like they know we found them. Nasser Ri is still having his banquet. The bad news is that we still haven't found Yos Tivos. He has to be somewhere down there if he wants to blow up those rocks. I am going there. Wait. Dager, you can't. General Fisto gave specific orders to. Monk. I am going there. You have to stay here, you have your orders. General Fisto is your general, not mine. I respect him as much as I do with any superior, but I have my way of following orders. Look, Monk, he said that we have to stop Yos Tivos from blowing this. I don't agree on that, and I know you don't agree on that. So at least let me stop them my way. Jedis are good, but maybe just one isn't good enough for that. Dager, you. Just go. But I hope you are right, otherwise you won't be sub-commander for too long. Hell Squad, on me. All kinds of creatures dwindled on the rocks at the bottom of Moncala, some beautiful, some weird and some dangerous. Amongst them was a group of seven clones, armed to the teeth. Hell Squad was having an easy time so far. No enemy patrols had appeared, but they still hadn't found any of their objectives. For some reason, General Fisto wasn't responding, so they had to search for him manually. Sir, I got something over here. Tech was using a sensor to see if he could find anything, and he finally got a response. A small heat signal, stronger than that of fishes showed up. They followed the signal, and after a small search found an FF-6 bomb strapped under a boulder. Tech carefully disarmed it, and put it on his backpack. They were on the right trail, and soon found another one. But still, no sign of either Kit Fisto or Yos Tivos. All of sudden an enemy patrol appeared in their line of sight. It was too unexpected, but they took quick care of it. Not too much later the bottom of the ocean had five new decorations. Cell, I want eyes on that enemy base. Dab, follow him from a distance, help each other if you get in trouble. Hell Squad, let's advance. We are out of time for anything too careful. Our priority is securing General Fisto. We can deal with the bombs later. Five minutes after Cell and Dab went scouting, Dab contacted Dager. Sir, we got something here. Cell is going ahead and... Dang! Sir, we need some help here. Dab, what happened? It will be better for you to see for yourself, sir. They advanced quickly, but what greeted them was out of their expectations. On one side was Kit Fisto, with his lightsaber turned on, and Cell. Dab was a little more far away, his sniper ready. On the other side were ten or so Mon Calamarians, including Yos Tivos. Both sides were facing each other, blasters ready to go. The arrival of Hell Squad evened the equation. Dager asked what was happening to Kit Fisto quietly. 
I caught them strapping more bombs, but I was the one captured. What are you doing here? Saving you, General. Oh. What are you talking? Jedi. Yo's Tivos, on the other side, got afraid that they were making plans, and interrupted them. Jedi, we are all on the same side. There is no reason for you to stoop me. I can win this battle. Not that way, General. Leave those bombs and return. We can't have an internal conflict when we are about to enter a battle. The Mon Calamarians need to see that you, the King and the Republic are on the same side. Chapter 84 Not that way, General. Leave those bombs and return. We can't have an internal conflict when we are about to enter a battle. The Mon Calamarians need to see that you, the King and the Republic are on the same side. Kit Fisto words were touching, but useless. Yos Tivos was fighting for something on which he believed, and Dajer knew by experience that it was impossible for such a man to give up. He was all too familiar with this because that was the way every clone fought. Don't think you can convince me, Jedi. As we speak my men are planting more bombs. Even if you try to disarm them, there won't be a new time. Enough time for what? A third voice was introduced in the conversation. Dajer looked up, to the Quarans and Separatists above them. There were at least a hundred, and on the front was Chieftain Nasseri. Clones and Mon Calamarians had been so absorbed in their confrontation that they didn't notice the enemy arriving. The Quaran leading the enemy was Nasseri himself, holding his crown in one hand and a scepter on the other. So, General Yos Tivos, would you be kind enough to tell me your plans? Dajer slowly moved while Nasseri and Yos Tivos were quarreling, trying to get to a better position. At the moment the clones were too exposed, and the Separatists were right above them, at a perfect angle to eliminate them all. The Mon Calamarians that Yos Tivos brought with him, presumably his guards, were doing the same. Both groups might have been discussing moments ago, but when they were put against the wall, they were still on the Republic side. Their actions, however, didn't pass unnoticed. With a shout from Nasseri, a hundred blasters were pointed at them. Don't you try anything, Republic scum, or you are dead. Kit Fisto talked at this moment, his eyes closed in concentration. His hand was moving left and right, in a hypnotic rhythm. Chieftain, you don't want to eliminate us. You want to let us free. You will let us go, and you will retreat your troops. We'll let you go. For a few seconds, the eyes of the chieftain became dazed, and Dajer thought that maybe General Fisto's use of the force would work. But then Nasser Ri's body shook and the misty in his eyes disappeared, giving place to anger. No. Your tricks won't work on me, Jedi. My mind is too strong. You just dug your own grave, trying to control me, the king of Moncala. You are not the king. My bro-other is the only king Moncala have. Yos Tivo's face was entirely red, and he disregarded everything when he heard Nasser Ri calling himself king. He tried to swim to Nasser Ri, but gave up when dozens of E-5s were pointed at him. Nasser Ri sneered, disdain all over his face. Little general, why are you so angered? Don't you already know that your dear brother charged you with treason? Ho ho he he. Did you really think my spies wouldn't discover why you came here? As we talk my men are disarming your bombs. Yos Tivo's face showed surprise, despair and then a defeated smile. Sue that is how it is. I guess I can only redeem myself by completing my treasonous acts. He opened his fists, showing that they weren't closed only because of his anger, but also to hide something. A small switch was revealed. Many things happened at the same time. Ki Fisto yelled at no. And Nasser Ri ordered his men to stop Yos Tivos. But Yos Tivos pressed the switch, and then was immediately torn apart by the lasers of the droids. Muffled explosions happened all around them, and big boulders and rocks started to fall. One big boulder hit the droids and Korans, burying them under a few tons of rocks. More rocks crashed down, directly above Hell Squad. Before everything went dark, Dajer felt a small push on his body. Hell Squad, can you hear me? Cell. Dab. Meta. 
You don't need to call in the comms, sir. We are here. Tech. Is everyone all right? Report. Tech here. Brain here. Cell and dab ready to go, sir. I am here, sir. 3-4. Metal here. General Fisto, can you hear me? There was no answer. Dajer touched his helmet, and found out that he lost his lantern. Men, turn on your lights. Let me see what we have here. One by one, small light beams appeared in the darkness, barely enough to see anything. 3-4. What happened? Dajer looked to one of the moving lights. Nothing, sir. Just got a bit scared here. Dajer looked over, and saw that 3-4 was facing the corpse of Amon Calamari, only that its bottom half was buried under the rocks. Miraculously, no one of Hell Squad got hurt, but it appeared that only them had that luck. Around them was an empty space, where no rocks had fallen, and then the rest was a mess of broken boulders and droid parts. Brain called him. Sir, I found General Fisto. Dajer swam over to the middle of their cave and saw Kit Fisto there, laying on the bottom of the ocean, covered in dust. His arms looked like they were frozen, stuck in a manner that hands were pointed to above, his open palms facing the rocks. I think he used the force to protect us, sir. That is the only way we can be unharmed. 3-4, do a check on him, see what he needs anything. The others, look for any way out of here. Chapter 85 Dajer looked around, touching the rocks, trying to see if he could find some way out, maybe a tunnel or something. But there was nothing, they were totally trapped. In the end, after a fruitless search, Hell Squad grouped together around Kit Fisto. 3-4 had used some painkillers to stabilize the Jedi, but it appeared that he was unconscious from overexertion. He had made a huge effort to stop the falling rocks, and all he needed was some rest. What Dajer was worrying at the moment was how long it would take for the Jedi to wake up. Just Hell Squad alone wouldn't be able to escape from their prison, and their air supply would end sooner or later. 3-4, how long before he wakes up? Six or seven hours at least. But based on what I know about Jedis, he will need at least two days before he can use the Force again. Damn. Okay. Everyone, check your air supply. All of you have two days or more worth of it. Sure. I'm okay. I'm good. After making sure that the members of Hell Squad were alright, Dajer asked them to get some sleep, that he would do the first guard shift. Almost certainly they wouldn't face any enemy, after all they were buried, but it was better to be prepared. Dajer chose on rock and sat on it, his blaster on his lap. The lights that represented Hell Squad members turned off one by one, and soon he was in total darkness. Quack. A sound startled Dajer out of his dreams. Instinctively, he grabbed his DC-15A, that was by his side. The coughing continued, and Dajer realized it was Kit Fisto waking up. Dajer looked at his comlink. It has been six hours since Tech took over his place and he went to sleep. Now the one doing the guarding shift was Metal, who had his Z-6 rotary pointed roughly at the direction of the Jedi. Put down your weapon, Metal. It is the General. The Jedi got up and saw that Hell Squad was looking at him. When Dajer thanked him for saving their lives, Kit Fisto just waved it off with a smile. Hell Squad, am I right? Yes, General. I don't think I know any of you besides Dajer. What are your names, troopers? My name is Brain, Hell Squad Grenadier. Metal, Heavy Machine Gunner. Cell and Dab, Scout and Sniper. Tech, Mechanic and Technician. 3-4, Medic. You came after me even after I ordered you not to. Though that might have saved my life, you all were still disobeying orders. I am sure you did that knowing that you could lose your ranks and be punished. So why? Commander Monk had to follow your orders because he had to think not only about you, but also about all the scuba troopers. Our brothers of the 303rd will do well under his command, so we don't have to worry about that. I know we might get punished, but that is better than following orders and letting a general be eliminated. What an interesting squad. Well, shall we get out of here? General, 
Are you strong enough? You just got conscious. We won't know if we don't try, right? Besides, as much as I trust Monk, we can't let him do all the work alone. Kit Fisto started making circles in their small cave, one of his hands always touching the rocks. After repeating this action for some time, he stopped at one point put both hands on the boulder. That is it. This is the point where the rocks are lighter. He closed his eyes, and stood immobile. The rocks started shaking, and slowly started to fall apart, creating a path in the middle of them. The Jedi started swimming through the path, and Hell Squad followed him. The scene was impressive, but Kit Fisto's face was getting uglier and uglier. As he got tired, small rocks started falling as he chose to control the heavier and more dangerous ones. Thankfully the path they had to cross was short, and an end was revealed. However, Kit Fisto couldn't control the rocks for much longer. When he got out of the tunnel, he turned and concentrated all of his efforts on the end of the path, letting the boulders fall where they had already passed. Quick! I can't hold on much longer. Swimming as fast as they could, Dager, Brain, Cell and 3-4 had already gotten out. Metal, Dab and Tech, on the other hand, were being slowed down by their heavy blasters and equipment. Leave it. Come on. Tech and Metal got out. Dab threw his beloved DC-15X away. The time was just enough for him to get out when Kit Fisto's eyes rolled on its sockets and he passed out again. The Separatist and Quarren base was chaotic but deadly silent. The vision that Hell Squad got when they swam over it was a mess. Half of the base was totally buried under rocks and mud. The other half was hit with sporadic boulders, and many buildings have collapsed due to it. Kit Fisto clenched his fists when he saw all the dead. Droid parts were scattered at the bottom of the sea since they were heavier. But the Quarrens were floating. Men, women and children, none of them had escaped. Dager even saw some Mon Calamarians, probably in the same situation as the Quarren he saw on Vernila. Dager knew that this was better for the Republic, but after seeing it, he understood why the Jedi were so much against actions like the one that Yos Tevos took. Kit Fisto spent a long while looking at the destroyed base, then turned around. Do we have any confirmation that Nasser Ri is dead? No, sir, but I don't see how he can be alive. We survived, didn't we? But we had you with us. For all we know he can be leading an attack at Vernila. This battle will only end when he is dead or captured. Let's go to Vernila. Chapter 86 Vernila was a battlefield. At the moment only the outer layers of the city had been hit, but even then the scenery was of utter destruction. The two opposing forces were crashing against each other over and over again, each time resulting in more and more casualties. What Dager had beforehand considered being huge pipes, he now saw it were deadly weapons. Small but strong metal legs sprung from its side, and it was using those to move, albeit slowly. At the end of the pipe, huge laser fire was shot. Each time one of those lasers hit a building, a hole with a diameter of 15 meters appeared, and the building collapsed right away. There is no need to say what happened to any unlucky clone in its path. But the Republic was fighting back. Under the leadership of Monk, small squads were flanking the cannons, and bombing it. Unfortunately, not all of those squads made it back. Hell Squad had an easy way to the city, mainly because the droids and quarrens were focused on the attack. General Fisto was still too tired to use the force, but his skills with a lightsaber weren't affected. Together with Hell Squad, he blasted their way through the droids. They were only eight but their skilled use of their blasters and the Jedi deflecting enemy lasers totally made up for their lack of numbers. Get that thing. On it. Dajer pointed to one of the giant cannons, and marked it as their target. Brain took out his thermal detonators and laughed. Dajer and Metal, with a little help from Dab, soon took out the droids around the cannon. Brain swiftly planted the detonators, and Kit Fisto helped by cutting the legs of the cannon. The weird cannon fell on one side when all of its legs were cut off, and crushed a few droids. Everyone, get some distance. Brain. Clear. The thermal detonators blew one by one, starting a chain reaction. In the end, the cannon cracked into two halves, 
totally out of use. After that, Hell Squad had a clear pathway to Vernila. They left dead Quarans and droids on their trail, and opened a path for the other clones to attack. General, it is good to see you. The situation is quite a mess at the moment. Monk. I thought you brought all your troops to their base, preparing for an attack. How come we are the ones being attacked? Well sir, I am quite confused about it. We were waiting for you, and Hell Squad, when the whole thing blew up. We thought you were all dead, but I was prepared to send a search team when the Seppis came out of nowhere. We were out in the middle of the ocean, no cover, and they had those huge crab cannons. I had to order retreat. We fought our way back here, so we at least have cover. I understand. Well, continue fighting. Where is King Yoskalina? I need to speak to him. He and the Mon Calamarians are on the left flank. Dager, I've sent the 303rd there to support them, they were getting destroyed. Dager, Hell Squad, go take control of your men. I will explain what happened to the king. Turned out that the 303rd was doing quite well. They had taken pretty good defensive positions, and were trading fire with the Separatist. Dager found his second in command, Jeffrey, coordinating the retreat of a batch of wounded clones. Jeffrey, status. Yes, sir. Quarans and Separatists pushed us back to the 13th block, but now our lines are holding them back. If we keep those cannons away, I believe we have a good chance of holding our position. How many casualties? Numbers are uncertain, but we have 205 dead, and at least another 200 out of combat. Medium and light wounds should be about 6 or 700. And there are 75 clones missing or uncounted for. I am not sure about the Mon Calamarians, but they are in a way worse situation than us. They have retreated to the 17th block and organized some bunkers. Okay. Jeffrey, prepare the men to push forward. Sir. If we go out now, their crab cannons will decimate us. I think it is better to hold. That is why I'm going to take care of the cannons. Why else do you think Hell Squad was formed to? Our job is to turn the tides of the battle. Jeffrey was stunned, but remembered Dager was right. Dager was only given the rank of subcommander so Hell Squad wouldn't face problems when in their operations. He might be the commander in name of this battle, but his real role was to do what he just said. His orders given, Dager and Hell Squad swam in the direction of the battle. Since the battle was now happening inside of the city, things were a little bit easier. The weird cannons, or crab cannons, had to either maneuver or destroy the buildings before they could go on, so their already slow-moving pace almost came to a stop. So, Hell Squad made use of the corners and alleys to get to the cannons. The problem was that the cannons were way behind the enemy lines. They reached the first line of defense of the clones pretty soon, and without any accidents. Since they were the closest to the quarons and droids, many clones there were dead or wounded, and dead bodies and blood floated in the water. Dager pulled the sergeant in charge of the line aside. Sergeant, retreat. Jeffrey built some strong positions in the 13th block. Get your wounded there and prepare for the counterattack. Hell Squad stayed back with some clones to cover the retreating ones, and when they were gone, they quietly slipped into one of the buildings. All right, boys. We will let them pass, and when the crab cannons are close, we strike. If they send a patrol to secure the building, we have to take care of them quietly. Tech scanners blipped, and he turned to one of the doors in the building, and put his head close to it. Sir, I am hearing something there. Probably just natives. Anyway, brain, metal, check it out. Chapter 87 Probably just natives. But anyway, brain, metal, check it out. Both clones got closer to the door, and brain pushed it slightly, but it didn't open. It was metal's turn then, and he was a little more brutal. He got in front of the door and kicked it hard twice. In the second kick, the door creaked and dropped to the inside. Brain covered the door frame, and he and Metal formed a sort of cross, covering the entirety of the room. Nothing. Moving to the next room. A few moments later, Brain called them from the inside. Just a family sir. No clankers. 
Dejer entered the apartment, and found a family of three trembling on a corner. The child appeared to be especially afraid, and it was hiding its face on his mother's clothes. Sometimes it would look at metal and brain, and then hide its face again. When Dejer entered, the father stepped forward, hiding his wife and child behind him. Brain, metal, go outside. You are scaring them. Especially you metal. Your blaster isn't exactly calming. What do you mean sir? This beauty here is absolutely charming. Ha ha ha. Stop joking. Brain, prepare everything for the ambush. We will have only one shot at this. Come on metal. Both clones got outside, Metal still complaining that they were making fun of his new Z-6 rotary. Brain shook his head, helpless. Tech, get to a window and see where this cannon is. Be careful to not be seen. Metal, you will take out the escort of the cannon. 3-4 and Cell will help you. Dab, I don't think there is much you can do, even more without your modified DC-15X. Grab a DC-15A and cover us. Dejer put his blaster on the table, and got his hands up to show he didn't mean anything bad. It is all right. We don't mean any bad. You are a clone, right? Sir, I am sorry, but I am afraid that I have to ask you and your family to leave this building. If you go towards the center of the city you will find other clones. They will lead you somewhere safe. Leave. My home. You. You. You come here and bring your war, and we have to pay for it. Now I have to leave my home. I won't. Sir, please think properly. This is about to become a war zone. Think about your family and leave now, please. Dejer tried to persuade the Mon Calamari, but it was in vain. For fear or anger, the man started shouting a torrent of curses, but since they were on his own language, Dejer couldn't understand any of them. He was trying to make the man calm down when 3-4 came in and startled the family once more. They are coming. Sir, please calm down. You and your family have to stay hidden. That is an order. 3-4, come on. Dejer picked up his DC-15A, checked its magazine and exited the room. The child hugged her mother stronger. Dejer looked through the window. Bunches of quarons and droids were swimming past the building they were hiding into. There were even some of the new aqua droids amongst them. Those droids were something the separatists first deployed on this battle, and they were almost as agile as quarons and mon calamarians on the water. Behind the infantry was the crab cannon, its massive body smashing in the buildings and breaking walls. Around it was thirty or so quarons. Dejer found it weird. Crab cannons were droid weapons. Why would Korans be guarding it? Then he realized it was most probably something arranged by Nasseri. The crab cannons were at the back of the enemy forces, and guarding it would probably be the safest role in the battle. Separatist and Korans were just using each other, so obviously Nasseri wanted his people to stay as far of the fight as possible. Of course, he didn't expect that half of his forces would be buried under tons of rocks. Let them pass. Sir, look. Dejer looked to where Tech was pointing, and saw a group of droids separate from the big group and enter a building. He paid attention and saw that there were other groups doing the same every time they passed by a building. That was what Dejer didn't want the most. The droids were searching building by building, and most certainly the same would happen on the one they were. If Hell Squad didn't want their whole ambush plan to fail, they would have to take care of the droids quietly and quickly. Okay. There are five of them in each search group. We have to do this quietly. That means no blasters. They will start by the lower floors. That gives us some time. Hell Squad positioned themselves. Brain, Dab, Tech, and 3-4 were on two of the apartments, ready to surround the droids. Cell, Metal, and Dager were just on the sides of the elevator door leading to their floor. They pulled some furniture from the apartments to cover them. The trick wouldn't last long, but it should cover them from the first stairs of the droids. The door of the elevator opened, and five droids swam out of it, all of them standard B1S, with thrusters on their backs. They glanced over Dejer, but didn't notice him or metal and cell. 
It was only after they were a little more on the floor that their scanners seemed to pick up something. Who is there? Dager and Sel pushed the table behind which they were hiding. The table half floated, half crashed, and knocked down two of the droids. Dager used his feet to push the wall behind him, and used the thrust to throw himself over one of the droids. Holding both ends of his DC-15A, he passed it over the head of the droid and pressed its neck. The droid struggled, but with a violent twist, Dager ripped off its head. On his side Cell and Metal had worked together to hold one of the droids, and the others had come out of the apartments to take care of the droids. The last thing the two droids who were trapped under the table saw was the butt of Hell Squad blasters. Chapter 88 Hell Squad took care of the droids nicely, and not one blaster was fired in the process. They took back their positions near the windows, just waiting for the crab cannon to get close. R1ZZ. R1H6, what is your unit doing? Report. You were supposed to have cleared this building. 20 seconds ago. The voice was all broken, with static interference, but it was coming from one of the dead droids. That was bad. If they didn't respond, that could screw their whole plan. Dager had to make a decision at the moment, so he chose to pass on the responsibility. Cell. Answer that. W what? Me? I'm not a droid. You are always mocking the voice of the clankers. I hope you can copy it. Berg. I will try. Air. BZZ. I am sorry. BZZ. There was some debris on the way. We are returning soon. R1H6 check your vocal piece when we return to the cruiser. Your transmission is weird. Roger, Roger. Fief, that was a close one. Hey, Cell, maybe we should change your name to R1H6. He he he. And maybe you should change your name from Brain to Joker. I just saved us, and you are making fun of me. Ha 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 ha. Hey, it's not time to joke now. Their infantry already passed. Be ready to assault the cannon. We are ready, sir. The crab cannon was really close now, almost under them. Brain, if you don't mind. Brain got close to the wall of the building and stuck a thermal detonator on it. Hell Squad took some distance from the wall, and Brain blew it up. Small rocks crashed in their armor, but they didn't see to notice it. With Dager leading the way, Hell Squad swam out of the building through the hole they blasted. Somehow the explosion had passed unnoticed, and the Korans protecting the cannon weren't looking up, but to the front. Until one of the rocks blasted from the building dropped in ahead of one of them. The Koran looked up, and his eyes widened in surprise. His mouth started to open, but Dager's blaster was faster. Now that they were revealed, Hell Squad spared no efforts to make the most out of the surprise effect. Metal Z-6 was again the most eye-catching, and the fact that there were no obstacles in the way only helped. The following scene wasn't a beautiful one. After the Korans were annihilated, Brain planted the detonators. Before the droid forces nearby could see what it was going on, a big explosion shook the water. Moments later, when enemy reinforcements arrived, all they found were dead Korans and the remains of a crab cannon. Hell Squad was nowhere to be seen. Ten minutes later, at another building four blocks away from the one they were, Hell Squad was laying on ambush again. Sir, we might have a small technical difficulty. Which is? I am down to my last grenades. We didn't have time to catch our breath ever since we got to Vernila, so I couldn't find many detonators. I'm afraid that crab cannon is the last we can take out. That sure is a problem. And I suppose we can't go back to our lines and come back even if we wanted to. Let's destroy this one first and think about the others later. We will work something out. We aren't a special squad for no reason. That's what I wanted to hear. Hell Squad is ready for some fun, sir. Their second ambush went as well as the first one. This time the enemy was a bit warier, so the fight was more intense, but Hell Squad didn't sustain any injuries, and the second crab cannon was destroyed. It was their third and last target that was the most troublesome. All problems seemed to have come together on this one. 
Not only they didn't have anything with which they could blow up the cannon, but there were two crab cannons. Besides that, the guard around them had increased a lot, to almost 300 enemies. No matter how good Hell Squad was, there was no way they could pass through that. But if they didn't, the Republic might win the battle, but casualties would be heavy. Apparently they heard of us, sir. Dab showed a multitude of enemies on their way. Deja shrugged. We weren't exactly discreet. So what is the plan? I'm open to ideas. Is the situation that bad? In the end, it was Tech who had the best idea. And even then, it was a terrible one but the best they got. Tech, are you sure you can do it? No, sir. But we have to give it a try. And I have quite the confidence in myself. They didn't have the time to sit and think, so they had to go with Tech plan. His plan, of course, involved a lot of shooting, and quite a bit of luck. The crab cannons were getting really close. They brushed by another building, turning parts of it into rumble. The dust settled quickly in the water, but it was enough for Hell Squad to make their entrance. A droid swimming in the front looked at its sensors, which have changed to red. My sensors are picking up something. Going to investigate. Roger, Roger. The droid went forward, but something touched his chest and made a clank sound. Dager looked at the droid and pulled the trigger. The droid's chest blew up, and at the same time, Hell Squad opened fire. The droid front lines were hit hard. Each droid was hit three or four times, chest, head, arms, legs, everywhere. They were thrown back due to the impact, hitting the others behind them, and dropped to the bottom, becoming more debris in the ocean. Tech, go. After Dejer's order, Tech dropped his blaster and turned the thruster on his backpack to full, gaining speed. He swam swiftly across the droids, and got to the nearest crab cannon. Using all his force he opened the cockpit of the cannon, and pulled out the droid inside it before quickly closing it again. Torturous slowly, Tech controlled the cannon to turn. When it was facing the other crab cannon, he smiled. Hello there. Chapter 89 Tech turned the crab cannon, aimed right at the other one, and pulled the trigger. But nothing happened. Tech looked at the panels and cursed. It needs time to charge. What? How much time? As much as we can get. It was Dager's turn to curse. They were getting surrounded by droids, and they didn't have an escape plan. Their idea was to hijack one crab cannon, use it to destroy the other and then carve a path amidst the droids. Tech, do you best. We will hold them off for as long as we can. Dager said that, but things were going poorly. Hell Squad had taken cover behind the crab cannon, but they were getting flanked. And there was the fact that the other crab cannon was turning towards them. They were floating behind the cannon, making some shots at the droids when they could, concentrating on taking out the ones that were trying to get to the cockpit. Tech. Almost there, sir. It needs another eight seconds. Dejer turned to his left, and fired two lasers instantly, each hitting a droid in the head. Five seconds. Start getting in the cannon. Dab, Cell, you first, we will cover. Sir, I don't know if there is enough space for all of us there. It will have to do. That or we fight a whole army with blasters alone. One by one, Hell Squad squeezed in the cockpit with Dager covering them. Now that he was alone, his position was getting overrun by the droids. Three seconds. It was time for him to go. Using the last of his magazine, he sprayed blue laser in the incoming droids. He grabbed the border of the cockpit and pulled himself inside, and Metal immediately shut the door behind him. There were so many clones in the cockpit that Dager hit someone when he entered. Ouch! What did I do to you, sir? Don't complain, brain. I almost died there. Two seconds. Dager looked outside. The other crab cannon was facing them, a red light was building inside its barrel. Besides that, the cockpit was getting pelted with lasers from the infantry outside. Now that he was inside the cannon, Dager's confidence grew, and he was fairly sure that they could pull this off, although it would be a close one. 1. When you are ready, tech. Firing. 
Tech pulled the trigger, and the red glow that had formed inside the hijacked cannon flew forward with full force. Good aim or coincidence, the shot from the crab cannon flew straight inside the barrel of the other cannon. The cannon seemed to inflate, and then it blew from the inside, sending shrapnel in the water. Both crab cannons were only 50 meters apart. When one of them exploded, the other was forced a few meters back by the pure strength of the blast, and almost dropped to one side. The clones inside faced a lot of turns and bumps, but came out and scathed. The droids and quarons outside, however, became butts and pieces. Dajer pushed Tech, who had fallen over him, and took a look at the desolation outside. Everything on a hundred meters radio had been thrown away or been smashed into pieces. There was no immediate threat. 3-4, do a quick checkup on everyone. Tech, see if this thing can still walk. Brain, do you still have your comlink? Mine was broken just now. Here it is, sir. Dajer turned on the comlink, and after a lot of static, Jeffrey finally answered, with a lot of noise in the background. We saw the explosions. Damn. Medic. I have a man down. Sorry sir. Did everything go as planned? Not exactly, but we did what we were supposed to. Now, Lieutenant, it is time to start the counterattack. Yes, sir. We will start now. And, Jeffrey, be advised that that is one crab cannon on our side. Sir, did you? Try not to shoot us. Considering that they were now in possession of a droid vehicle, Dajer had another of his ideas. After ensuring that the clones that would come knew they were on their side, Hell Squad left the crab cannon, leaving only Tech to control it. Hell Squad advanced on foot, or swimming, until they found a groupment of droids. Following their new plan, Tech drove the crab cannon straight in the middle of the droids, and fired it. Before the droids could react to why one of their own was attacking them, clones and Mon Calamarians arrived and crushed them. From then on, it was a totally one-sided battle. The left flank pushed back the droids, and regained enough ground that they could send reinforcements to the other parts of the battle. Monk was pinned down with some of his men, suffering heavy casualties. They were fighting bravely, killing ten droids for each clone they lost. Suddenly, a big line of droids was annihilated by a red blast, and a crab cannon appeared in their field of vision. Already knowing the power of those weapons, all clones got their heads down, but the attack they were expecting never came. That thing is firing on its allies. Look, Commander. One of the scuba troopers stuck his head out, and saw the crab cannon firing wildly, with dozens of clones as support. Monk glanced surprised when the cockpit of the crab cannon opened and Dajer waved at him. Hey, Monk, Commander. We thought you might need some support. Dajer. I should have imagined. The left flank should be okay, since you have the time to come on our aid. There are no droids attacking the left flank anymore, we pushed them back. In a sense, you are now the left flank. That is good. Since you are doing so well, take that toy of yours and go be our frontline. Dajer got in the crab cannon once again. Inside it was Tech, with who he was splitting the job of controlling the cannon. They were now on the outskirts of the city, so a little more and they would take the fight away from a civilian area. Half of the separatist forces had been buried by Yos Tivos, and a large number of their crab cannos had been blown up by Hell Squad. If they pushed the enemies to outside the city, victory was guaranteed. Chapter 90. Nasser Ri was never found. The Republic assumed he was either buried or had run early in the fight. The clones pressed the droids, and stopped for nothing. In the end the battle was considered to be a brilliant victory. Republic casualties were only a small fraction of what was expected, and CIS casualties were three times the estimated. But that were just the numbers. For the clones who fought, it wasn't so simple. Victory or not, they still lost many brothers. Besides that, the statistics didn't account for the civilians. Intended or not, the crab cannons had caused massive damage to the buildings, raising many of them to the ground. Thousands of Mon Calamarians died and became collateral damage. A meeting was conducted after the battle, to decide what would be done with the clones. 
Other planets required them, so not all could be kept at Mon Cala. Also, the droids had fled, but the defeated Quarans were still there. A lot of political moves would be needed to make them accept the Republic. Using the excuse that he was still clearing some resisting droids, which wasn't a total lie, Dager didn't go to the meeting. In the end, many hours later, he got to know what had been decided. First of all, the planet of Mon Cala as a whole joined the Republic, and although the Quarren representatives complained, as the defeated party they didn't have much of a choice. Secondly, Hell Squad and the 303rd clones who took part in the battle would return to the sincerity. With Hell Squad intervention, they haven't suffered many deaths, and their losses would be replenished soon. Thirdly was what Dager considered the dumbest and unnecessary decision of the meeting. Yos Tivos, brother of the king, was considered a traitor for actively going against his king's orders. As such, his name would be erased from the royal family, and all his closest relatives would lose their positions in the royal court. Anyway, neither of those points above were for Dager to worry. For him that was just another battle. Surely, not one to be forgotten, but still just a battle. Before leaving, Dager found Kit Fisto and Monk to say his goodbyes. They would stay on Mon Cala at least until the planet stabilized, and all separatist resistance pockets were exterminated. Well Dager, you crazy clone, take care, alright? Don't worry about me, Monk. You are the one who fights in the water. Compared to that, Geonosis was easy. While Monk and Dager were bickering, the Jedi said nothing. It was only when Dager was about to go that the Jedi talked. You are a weird clone. I can tell you disagree with my methods, but dove into danger to save me even when it wasn't your job. You are a commander, but you didn't stay out of the fight, where it was secure, but jumped in the action. You are mistaken on this one, General. It is not that I am a weird clone, but just that I am a clone. Every one of my brothers would have done the same. The longer you fight by Commander Monk's side, the more you will understand that. After all, we are the same. Dager saluted the clone and the Jedi, and turned on the thruster on his back, going back to the surface. There a cruiser from General D's fleet was waiting to pick up the soldiers. Kit Fisto looked at Monk, who got a little scared by the stare. He had never seen his general so surprised. Clones, hum. Dager did his job as sub-commander, seeing each of his men out of the transports, and following the injured to the infirmary. It was only after that that he reported to General D. As always, the Jedi was on the command bridge, looking to the vacuum outside. Together with him were Admiral Dow, Commander Keeley and a small hooded figure that Dager didn't recognize. The first to greet him was Commander Keeley with a handshake and Admiral Dow with a nod. Neither General D nor the figure turned around, so Dager started his report. General. Subcommander Dager reporting. During the battle on Mon Cala, of the two regiments sent, 282 clones died. Another 340 will need some time to recover. General D turned, as did the hooded person, but Dager still couldn't see his or her face. You did a good job commanding your men down there. We already received confirmation that our forces will be replenished soon. For now, I would like to introduce you to someone. You will work with him a lot from now on. The hooded person stepped forward, and took off his hood. A young face was revealed, with light blue skin and red eyes. Two large protuberances sprouted out of his head, blue as his skin, but with white stripes. Tigruta. That was the species of the newcomer. They lived in a planet called Shirley and took the tea. Republic sighed as soon as the war started. Not only that, but the planet had a significantly larger number of Force-sensitive children. Dager, this is Ragu Latte, the new Padawan sent to me by the Jedi Council. He is still young, and learning, so you will have to look after him in the following battles. Ragu made a gracious Jedi posture. It is my pleasure to meet you, Sub-Commander Dager. Commander Keeley already told me about your achievements. I look forward to fighting alongside Hell Squad. The young face was filled with expectations. Dager felt pity for the kid, as he would soon face the dark and not so glamorous side of war. Still, Dager answered him without giving away his thoughts. It will be good to have another Jedi by our side. 
Welcome, kid. Kaylee, Grievous Base. General Grievous was watching Heige with his hands behind his back. A few weeks had passed since he started training Heige, and the body of the Mon Calamari was riddled with scars. Heige was at the moment just looking at the empty air, his eyes blank. Grievous coughed and slammed his metallic leg on the floor to capture his attention. Insect, your planet just fell for the Republic. Heige said nothing and just looked at Grievous, who laughed maniacally. Kakakakaka. I forgot, you can't say anything anymore. Kakakakaka. The insect lost his tongue. Kakakakaka. Chapter 91. Somewhere in the space. Ragu and Deja were walking alongside. It was the day after the Battle of Moncala, and the Padawan had asked Deja to show him around. The Tigruta was still a kid, although his mind was much stronger than the one of a normal child. It was obviously something new to him, seeing all the military pieces of equipment, and the serious-looking soldiers. Here is the main hangar, where most of the lots are stored. That is the weapon deposit. I'm afraid you can enter there. It is a controlled area. Why? I am a Jedi Padawan. Isn't my rank even above yours? When they sent me here they told me that I am only under my master. That is not how things work here, kid. You might be a Jedi apprentice, but that doesn't mean much to us. We were trained to follow your orders, however, you still have to earn our respect. Of course, if you order me to take you to the deposit, I will have to obey. Ragu frowned, obviously dissatisfied with the way Dejer put things. Dejer sighed. He forgot he was talking to a young and most probably full of pride Padawan. I am sorry, I phrased that wrong. I didn't mean to diminish you. It is hard to explain just with words, you will understand way better when you fight your first battle. Ragu expression got a little better. Dejer decided that it was time to show the infirmary to the Padawan he was sure that when the Padawan saw the injured clones, he would understand what Dejer meant. He guided Ragu in the corridors, getting saluted by each clone they saw. Dejer's helmet was very distinctive and a symbol that he carried with pride. Two clones were guarding the doors to the infirmary, but they gave passage to Dejer and Ragu without saying a word. Medical droids and some medic clones were walking amongst the beds. The infirmary of the Sincerity was the biggest of General D's fleet, and as such, it was the best equipped. Because of that, it was also where the most badly injured clones were. Lost limbs, debilitating wounds, all of those were being treated there. No matter how good the medical technology of the Republic was, there were still some clones who lost their lives. When that happened, they were sent to the crematorium, and their ashes were later sent to Kamino, home of all clones. It was on such an occasion that Dejer and Ragu arrived. One clone that was missing his left leg had lost too much blood before being brought to the medical base, and didn't resist. Medical droids put the body in a litter, and when they passed, Dejer took off his helmet and mourned for another lost brother. Ragu had a serious face when they left the infirmary, and Dejer thought that maybe he was being too harsh, showing such scenes to the Padawan. But when he thought about how a battlefield was, he knew the Padawan would face much worse. Ragu, do you know the reason why we respect General D so much? It isn't just because he is our general. Every clone legion has one, and we all respect them. The reason is because of what you saw inside there. General D wasn't only commanding us. He fought alongside us, and saved many of us. In war injuries and deaths are inevitable. What a soldier respect the most isn't some hero who eliminated thousands of enemies, but some unknown person who did his best to save as many as possible. Of course, General D isn't unknown. I think I understand now. At least a little. I guess. What is that? The now familiar alarms went off in the ship. Dejer put his helmet again, and ran, letting the Padawan behind. He could recognize from where the alarms were going off, the cargo bay. He checked with Brain when he got something. Brain, it is the cargo bay. Do we have anything of value there? Besides the ATS worth millions of credits? I don't think so. Then it is probably a decoy. I am already near there, so I will go check anyway. 
Get Cell and Dab there too. 3-4 is in the infirmary, keep him there. Find Tech and send him to the weaponry. You and Metal, I want you besides General D at all times, no matter what he says. Also, any free trooper you can find, I want them patrolling five floors up and down from the cargo bay. Yes, sir. Deja ran, and other clones joined him. The cargo bay wasn't too far from where he was, but he was quite sure there would be no trespassers there. Clank. There was a loud sound above Dajer's head. He looked up, but there was only the ceiling. He probably was imagining things. Dajer shook his head and looked forward while giving orders to the clones who were with him. In the ventilation ducts above Dajer. A woman's voice was scolding someone quietly. Idiot. You almost screwed everything. It is not my fault. How did you expect me to pass through those ducts? Not everyone is as slim as you. Those last words were said in a low voice, so the female didn't hear it. There were also some traces of lust on it. Shut up. I swear that I will eliminate you if you mess up. As expected, Dajer didn't find any intruders on the cargo bay. He did find, however, what set off the alarm. A lot of crates had fallen down to the floor, and one of them had crossed the invisible line the alarms had. If it was just that, Dajer might have considered it to be an accident, maybe someone bumped into it, or the ship turned too fast. But on the floor there were also two dead clones, their necks snapped like twigs. Dajer cursed. Trooper, I want a full search on the whole ship. We have trespassers. I repeat, we have trespassers. Two dead soldiers accounted for, every trooper, confirm your position, follow standard procedure. The last sentences were said in his comlink, and transmitted to the whole ship. Clones started to check in, first to their squad leaders, who then passed the information to their sergeants and so on. That way there wouldn't be any chaos, and it was faster. Chapter 92 Squad leaders reported to sergeants. Sergeants reported to lieutenants. Lieutenants reported to captains. And captains reported to danger. One by one, the reports trickled in. Most of them didn't have any problems, but not all. A captain named Vardos called Dajer worried. We have problems. Who is missing? We have lost contact with an entire squad, including the squad leader. Who is the squad leader? Any chance that they are at the canteen or the infirmary and didn't hear? I was at the canteen, and everyone in the infirmary already checked in. Also, the squad missing is under Barrow's command. You know him, sir. He would have answered if he could. Barrow? What was their assignment? They were guarding the elevators of the eleventh floor. Go there right now. Be careful, they have eliminated or captured an entire squad without anyone noticing. I'm on my way. I'm almost there. Vartos, leave your comlink channel open. I want to hear what is happening. The sound of Vardos giving orders and his rapid breathing were the only sounds Dajer heard for a while. Finally, Vardos arrived on the eleventh floor and reported. Dajer was still on his way. I'm here, sir. Go easy, check for allies before firing. All right, typo, blut, with me. The others split in groups of three. Guard the doors and do a throughout sweep. Before long, Dajer arrived on the eleventh floor. Panting, he saw Vardos waiting for him near one of the elevators. Captain, what is the situation? What is the status of the missing squad? The floor is clear sir. No signs of enemies. We did find Fort Squad. They have four dead, their necks twisted the same as Weembo and Gurley on the cargo bay. Barrow and six others are unconscious. Something or someone hit them hard on the head. You didn't find anything. What do we have of important on this floor? Nothing sir. There are just some storage rooms with little to no value. Most of the rooms are dormitories. Vardos stopped in the middle of his sentence. He took a data pad from one of the clones nearby and looked at it for a few seconds. Actually. I did not remember it at the start because it is new, but General D's Padawan was moved here while proper accommodations are made. 
the room he was supposed to have suffered some damage on Mon Kala. That is it. Whoever they are, they are after the Padawan. It is the only possible option. How did they know he would be here? The most logic would be for the intruders to go after him at his normal room. And, if they knew he was staying here, how did they even get this information? They can break into our capital ship, incapacitate an entire squad without making a sound, and are still on the run. We don't even know who they are. They wouldn't come unprepared. But they will come out empty-handed. Ragu is not here. I know. I was with him, and I left him alone. I was stupid. Ragu. Ragu, come in. Come on kid, come on. There was no sound from the other end of the transmission, not even static. That meant that the comm link had been broken, and that the Padawan was in danger. Commander. We have problems. Huge problems. I and Vardos came to the eleventh floor, but there were no signs of trespassers. We think they are after Ragu, but we can't get in contact with him. Commander Keeley was at the other end of the transmission, waiting for news from Dager to know where he should send his men. Do we have any information on his location? Last time I saw him was near the infirmary. Do you want me to seal the area? Do that, then meet me there. The general said he sensed something wrong just before the alarms went off, and left. I will warn him. Captain Vardos, initiate a lockdown, protocol level 3. After giving his orders, Dejer went back all the way, to where he first left the young Jedi. Of course, there was no one, just an empty corridor. Keeley, Dejer, go to Hangar Bay 34. I found the invaders. General. Just let me gather some troops and I will be there. No. Just you two, that is enough. Any more and the pirates will notice us. Besides, I have brain and metal with me already. Pirates. All right, General, we will meet you there soon. Dager, where are you? I am near the infirmary. I will meet you at Section 7, Commander. Be quick. Albeit worried, Dager followed his orders perfectly, and ordered the clones that were with him to stay behind. When he met Commander Keeley, who had also ditched the guards that were with him, neither of them spoke anything. It didn't take long for them to arrive at Hangar Bay 34. General D, Brain and Metal were waiting for them there, hiding behind a lot. Dager couldn't see from what they were hiding, as the Hangar Bay looked totally normal. General. Be quiet. They are close. Commander Keeley and Dager got silent and paid close attention to the Hangar Bay. His eyes sweeping around, it took some time for Dager to understand what the Jedi meant. At the far end of the hangar bay, a connection tunnel had been opened, meaning that there was some ship connected to the Sincerity. Near the entrance of the connection tunnel, a group of shadows was discussing. Focusing more, Dager saw that one of the shadows was carrying someone over his shoulder. Dager was sure that he could take out all the shadows in a matter of seconds since they were with their backs turned to him. And, he had assistance from three other clones. I see them. General, permission to fire? I want to follow them. Let them leave, we go right after. Air. Sir, are you sure this is the best idea? They are taking your Padawan. Nobody kidnaps a Padawan for no reason. They are receiving orders from someone, I want to know who it is. They are going. Come on, and stay close. Chapter 93 The group of five quickly followed the pirates to the connection tunnel. They could hear the pirates talking subtly, and even laughing. Kakik. Dumb clones. All they know is fight. You need brains. Brains and thoughts. Only then can you win. Kakik. Stupid clones. Shut up idiot. I will eliminate you if you speak again. After that, there was silence again. Soon, Dager heard the sound of a door opening and closing. General D waved for them to keep going, and they advanced carefully, blasters ready to fire. When they were a few meters away from the door, General D waved his hand in a right-to-left motion, and the door opened alone. They entered the other ship quietly, but there was no sign of either the pirates or Ragu. 
General D found some stairs leading to the storage room of the ship, and got in. After that, he used the force to move some boxes and crates, creating a space large enough for all of them. Wait here. I will find out how many pirates we are against. Don't make a sound. And no communications by the comlink unless absolutely necessary. Saying that, General D used the force again, and moved the crates back, isolating the clones from the rest of the ship. General D walked with light steps, making no sound. The ship they were was quite big, although nothing compared to the Republic cruisers. It did have, however, the advantage that it was difficult to detect. The ship appeared to be manned by only the two that he saw early. Asides that, there were only cleaning droids. Eventually, the Jedi found the control room of the ship. Sitting with their backs facing him were the two invaders. Pirates. One of them was a tall woman, with white skin and wearing bright orange clothes. The other was a plump man, with red skin and a face looking like a pig. Shimba, detach. Okay, okay. Why do you keep hurrying me? If it wasn't for your pretty face and that body. Did you say anything? Think about your answer, or I might eliminate you like the pig you are. All right. Detaching in three, two, one, now. Detachment complete. They should find about us. Now. The moment the pigman said that, the turrets from the sincerity turned to them and started firing. Large laser bolts almost hit the ship, but the two pirates appeared to be unconcerned. The woman pressed some buttons on the control panel and put her hand above a lever. Inserting coordinates to jump point. Ready to jump. Now. When the woman pulled the lever, the ship found a spot between two cruisers, and jumped to hyperspace. More feeling than knowing, Imagundi left just before the pirates turned to where he was and left the control room. When the crates were moved again, the four clones pointed their blasters, but it was just General D. Lowering their weapons, the clones looked at him expectantly. We are in hyperspace. I already checked my Padawan, although I didn't have the chance to speak with him. Commander Keeley caught Dager's eyes. Both of them knew that if the Jedi was speaking so calmly, then he planned to take ahead his idea of following the pirates. Metal, unaware of the thoughts of his commanders, asked the question most concerning to him. How many enemies are we facing? Here. I saw two pirates, and there were two IG-88 guarding Ragu. But we won't make our move here. Since they are taking my Padawan, they most probably have a buyer for him. We will find out who dares to capture young Jedis. I just hope it's not Count Dooku. That last part was said in a whisper, and none of the clones understood it. Sorry, General. It is nothing. Now try to get some sleep. I will be able to sense with anyone come. The Jedi sat at meditation position, and closed his eyes. However, none of the clones slept, but just closed their eyes and stayed silent. In a planet very distant from the inner core, a medium-sized spaceship landed, blowing up a cloud of dust and sand. As the rear of the ship opened, a group of figures walked out. The woman and the pig face were walking on the front, and behind them were three IG-88 droids, one of them pushing Ragu ahead of him. They were walking to a giant palace that sprung from rocks and sand. A big gate protected the palace from invasions, but at the moment diverse visitors were passing through it, many carrying prisoners or stolen goods. At the gate were many pig men, similar to the pirate, but those had green skin. When the group arrived at the gate, the red-skinned pig man said something in a language that made the others laugh. After that, they were given passage to the inside of the palace. After waiting for a while, the clones and the Jedi left their hiding place. The ship was empty, but they found something interesting in the ship's main computer. Brain hacked into it and found out where in the galaxy they were. General, we are on a small planet called Ta. Tatooine. I don't know exactly where this is, never heard of it. Dajer didn't know the planet, as it seemed Commander Keeley and his brothers also didn't. They turned to General D, and saw in his face a look more serious than ever. General, you know where we are right? Yes, Dager. And it is not good. Tatooine is a small planet, very far from the inner core. 
they don't even accept Republic credits here. It is home to smugglers, bandits, murderers and thieves. But it is even worse than that. Tatooine is under the Hut cartel. The Huts? That is no good. Dager only knew that the Huts were a slimy race of crime leaders, but nothing more than that. On the Clone Wars, they had taken a neutral stance, and neither Republic or Separatist ships could cross their systems. So what we do now, General? We get my Padawan back. If the Huts are capturing young Jedis, then we will show them that the Jedi Order is not afraid of starting a war with them. Chapter 94 So, what is the plan, General? I need to think. But the most important is to find a disguise for you all. The clone armor is quite conspicuous. Most of the scum on that palace probably never saw a clone, but those two pirates we are hunting certainly have. Metal shook his head when he heard General D's words. I don't think they are pirates, General. I think they are bounty hunters. General D lifted his eyebrows. Is there any difference? Bounty hunters are much more deadly. Before I was recruited in Hell Squad, on my first battle, in Geonosis, my platoon and another one were tasked with capturing a small Geonosian leader. Everything was going okay until we fought two bounty hunters that he had hired. At that point, Metal shook his head once more, but this time he seemed sad and angry. That was how many bounty hunters we confronted. They eliminated twenty-four of my brothers. And even then, one of them still managed to run, although he left the Geonosian behind. Silence enveloped the group. Dager had never fought bounty hunters before, and to him, they were just a slightly better version of pirates. But now it didn't seem so. He looked again to the front gate of the palace, where dozens of people were carrying weapons and prisoners. If even half of them were as good as Metal described, then they were in serious trouble. General D. Face got even more serious. We have here a commander, and three clones belonging to a special unit. If we get rid of your armors, or at least disguise them, I believe we can enter there. They aren't checking everyone who goes in. Besides, those creatures are simple-minded. We will do that without fighting, and after we rescue my Padawan we go back. Following General D's plan, the clones smeared dust in their armors, and took off their helmets. After that, they found some pieces of ragged clothes and used it as cloaks. The white armor was covered in dust, so even if a piece of it or another appeared under the cloak, it was unrecognizable. Without their helmets, each clone had different hairstyles and tattoos, so unless someone put them side by side and compared, it would be difficult to recognize them. The Jedi found a red mantle to himself, and by intention or not, this clearly marked him as the leader of the group. After making sure that no one was looking at the ship, they departed, and walked to the palace. The sand was incredibly hot, and Dager was sweating profusely inside his armor. Two suns hanged in the sky, sanding heat wave after heat wave onto them. Dager wondered how the Huts could build a crime empire on such planet. The only one who looked comfortable was General D. When they arrived at the palace gate, they had to enter in a long queue that the bounty hunters from before had skipped. Hours passed, and day turned to night. Dager was tired of waiting in line all day, and it looked like they still had some time to wait. His throat was sore, and he seriously needed a drink. At that moment there was a commotion in front of the gate. The big metal gate started to close, and many of the aliens near to it tried to run inside, only to be beaten back by the guards. That was bad, because if they were locked outside, then who knows what would happen to Ragu. Dager looked at General D, waiting for his orders. The Jedi walked ahead calmly, even though the gate was already half-closed. He got near one of the green-skinned pigmen. You will let us pass. You won't close the gate. The eyes of the pigmen blinked, and then got misty. He made a move to stop the gate, but as soon as he touched the lever that controlled it, electric currents passed through his body, and he fell to the ground twitching. An electronic voice appeared, together with a mechanic eye. Unauthorized. Unauthorized. Any who dare to stop the mighty Jabba's orders will be eliminated. After the pigman was eliminated, the others just kicked its corpse aside, and let the gate close. Nobody tried to go against the guards anymore. 
General D looked quite shocked. He never expected that the owner of the palace, Jabba, would eliminate one of his own men. But after thinking about it, it was quite normal. He couldn't maintain his position as one of the heads of the huts if he was merciful. What do we do now, General? Commander Keeley approached the Jedi and asked quietly. Their path was blocked, and they couldn't let Ragu wait another night. Let's go back for now. We need to find another entry point, and if we stay here it would look suspicious. The group retreated enough so the darkness of the night could cover them, and started circling around the palace. But there were no windows, doors or anything they could use. After half an hour, General D finally lost his patience. He knocked on the walls until he found one thin enough, then used his lightsaber to open a hole through it. The blue lightsaber melted the wall, leaving a bright orange and yellow lava-like substance on the border of the circle. Using the force, he pushed the circular block he had cut and it fell to the inside. The first thing they saw when they looked was a surprised pigman, with the meat of some animal halfway to his mouth. General D did a rapid spin, and the chest of the guard was opened, a blood-red line showing where the lightsaber had cut. That was the first time Dajer saw the general eliminate someone who wasn't a droid. When he saw that the Jedi's expression didn't even twitch, he wanted to say something along the line, for a peacekeeper you eliminate quite decisively, but he got a hold of his mouth. Maybe that was why he liked General D. Both he and Kit Fisto were Jedi, but the first knew when it was necessary to eliminate, while Dajer felt that the last would have tried to knock down the guard, which could have ruined the entire operation. Chapter 95 Being careful not to make noise, Metal and Brain grabbed the dead guard, using all their strength to carry the heavy body. It just barely passed in the hole General D had cut. After that, they lifted the block that was cut off and put it back in place. It wasn't a very good disguise, but thankfully the palace was really dark, so it should be able to trick the guards. The time they took to complete these actions was perfect. The moment they finished, another two guards appeared at the end of the corridor. When they saw the clones, the guards started screaming some incomprehensible stuff. Dajer's grip on his DC-17 tightened, and he prepared to take action. However, the moment he was about to reveal the blaster, a silver figure followed the guards and talked to them, stopping their screams. When the silver person approached, followed by the guards, Dajer saw it was actually a protocol droid. It had an human-shaped figure, but some wires were hanging out of its torso. Respected lords, please pardon those guards. They were afraid you were trying to escape mighty Jabba's palace. You surely are not doing that, are you? General D was the one to answer. Of course not. We were just looking for a friend. Oh. Maybe I can help you. IMF 5, PO 88, a protocol droid. What is the name of your friend? No need. We already found him. We will be on our way to our accommodations. Oh. I wasn't informed of any guests staying in our rooms. Usually my lord prefer that everyone sleep near him. I suppose that by accommodations you mean level 3? Yes, yes. I'm sorry, it's just that it is a great thing to be near Lord Jabba, so we unconsciously referred to it as accommodations. Level 3 is what we meant. The droid seemed as pensive as a droid could be for a moment, but then accepted their shady explanation. Follow me and I will take you to level 3. If you stay here the guards might mistake you for trespassers or fugitives. Of course. The droid sent the guards away, and started to guide them, always talking about the palace and how glorious Jabba was. Lord Jabba is not merciful. Lord Jabba is the mightiest in the galaxy. If you try to go against him, he will. From time to time he would point out some rooms or directions, as if they were visiting some tourist attractions, and not the lair of a crime lord. Dajer suddenly thought that maybe they could take advantage of how talkative the droid was. He walked a little faster to catch up with F5PO88. This is such an impressive palace, as expected of Lord Jabba. However, he must have many enemies that are jealous of him because of that. You are right. The Pikes, the Crimerath, Caldena. But Lord Jabba have special ways of dealing with such scum. Those he considers unimportant he gives to his favorite pet. 
those that he needs, he keeps them very well guarded. That is what that scum deserves for daring to defy Lord Jabba. I'm sure his prisons are packed full of those idiots. I bet it feels amazing to see them receive their punishment. Unfortunately you can't do that. The prisoners are kept on level 13, where no light enters, but anyone who tries to go there has to be authorized by Lord Jabba. I guess such unimportant pirates like us will never have that pleasure. It is really a pity. Well, what about? After talking with the droid a few more minutes, always in a happy manner, Dajer slowed down and let the protocol droid continue on its never-ending monologue. He looked at General D, who nodded at him, recognizing that his plan worked. Brain smiled at him. After quite some time the droid finally left them at a junction, indicating that they should go ahead. Apparently, he was forbidden from entering the room. Of course they didn't go in, but Dajer could see part of the room through the door. There were people sleeping on the floor, one on top of the other. But there was an empty space in the middle of the room, on which a big bed was. Snoring on it was Jabba, who looked like an incredibly big and incredibly fat worm. Two beautiful Twi'leks were with him, chained to the feet of his bed. One of them saw Dajer, who was peeking inside the room, and stretched her hand to him, tears on her face. Dajer almost walked to the room, but Commander Keeley put a hand on his shoulder and shook his head. Dajer looked to the Twi'lek, who now was crying profusely, and walked away with heavy steps. Two hours. That was the time that they took to arrive at level 13. The more they descended, the better guarded the floors were. At start, they had just slipped past the guards, or General D used the force, but they faced their first problem on level 8 or 9. General D took care of those problems with his lightsaber, and from that moment on they had no choice but to keep going until they found Ragu. Of course, they were still trying to do it silently. It would be for the best if no one noticed that they rescue a prisoner until the next morning. But the clock was ticking. Soon it would be dawn, and the palace would wake. The bodies would be found very soon. Dajer had taken out his blaster pistol, and all the clones threw their cloaks away. It hindered their movements, and it wasn't necessary anymore. Their armor, already full of scars before, now had brown patterns of dust, that had been shaped by the contact between cloak and armor. Moving ahead of formation, Brain signaled enemies in front. Dajer peeked over the corner. Two pigmen were snoring on the ground, a bottle of something near them. Dajer walked to one of them, and hit his head with the butt of the pistol. The only change was that the snoring stopped. Then he repeated the action with the other, and glanced at the floor number. General, we are just one floor away. We might just do that without fighting. Chapter 96 Jedi and clones walked down the stairs, heading to the prison. General D was in front, lightsaber ready to dispatch the guards. He was followed by Brain and Metal, both who, for metal discontentment, had small blaster pistols stolen from the guards. Dajer and Commander Keeley were in the back, guarding their rear. There was a quiet noise in the front, as if something moved at a high speed, and one pigman dropped to the ground without his head. The cut-off head dropped to the ground and started bouncing downstairs in a weary and gross manner. None of the group paid much attention to it, as it wasn't the first time they saw it since they started their mission. But who would have expected that at this moment, when they were already near level 13, someone would be using the same path as them? The head hit someone's foot with a squishy sound. Dajer stopped dead on his tracks. The stairs were deadly quiet. Neither they nor their opponent moved. After a few seconds of stalemate, General D took a deep breath and jumped a few steps, aiming his lightsaber for the enemy. He almost hit, but when the blue lightsaber was a few centimeters away it stopped. Pale blue light shined on the face of their enemy, revealing a small Tigrota's face. Ragu! What are you doing here? Master! I'm sorry, I, I was captured. I'm so sorry, I was returning to my room when someone knocked me unconscious. I am so sorry, I. We know you were captured. What I meant was, what are you doing out of your cell? We were coming to get you. How did you escape? This. It wasn't difficult. There were only two guards near my cell, and they were quite easy to manipulate. 
After that, I sneaked past the other guards. General, and. General. It is great that we found you, but we are running out of time. Commander Keeley stoked them, quite unsure about how to call Regu. Theoretically, he was considered a Jedi, so he should be called General. But that made the chain of command rather awkward because General D was the master of Ragu, so his rank was even higher. But he brushed that question apart and got to the important part, which was that they should escape. Keeley is right. Come on Ragu, let's go. General D almost pulled the young Padawan, but found unexpected resistance. He looked at the Padawan intrigued. Master, my lightsaber. I need to take it back. Dajer thought that the Jedi Master would have been at least annoyed or exasperated at the suggestion of losing precious time to look for a weapon. But he wasn't. General D actually looked concerned about the lightsaber. Do you know where it is? That worm, Jabba, kept it with him when I was brought to his presence. I guess it is still with him. Dajer had a bad feeling. Judging by how serious General D was, it looked like he really wanted to go take the lightsaber from Jabba. He couldn't be more right. Without uttering a word, both Master and Padawan started climbing the stairs. The clones looked at each other, not sure if they should say something or not. In the end, they decided it was best not to. The lightsaber seemed to have a very special meaning to both Master and Apprentice, and they already knew how stubborn General D was. Their way back was quiet. The only ones they found were those they had already defeated. Soon they reached level 3, where they found the same people still sleeping. The hut was still twisted on the bed, his fat tail dropping over the edge. The two Twi'leks that Dajer saw before were also sleeping, although they still had some tears on their faces. General D showed the clones the corridor they used the first time, when they had just entered the palace. You go back, wait for me at our exit. I will take back your lightsaber, but things will probably get a little heated. He urged the clones and his padawan, not giving them the chance to complain. It was only when they were a good distance away that they stopped. Knowing that they couldn't go against their orders, Commander Keeley chose the second best option. Dajer, turn around and go back. We will continue, and wait for you and the general at our exit. There is no need to do anything unless General D get in trouble. If needed, then assist him the best you can. Yes, Commander. Dajer immediately turned around and started going back. Behind him, he could still hear Ragu saying he would go too. Keeley, why? Our mission was to come here and rescue you. I can't let you go, otherwise, I will be disobeying General D. Letting me go is disobeying, but letting Dajer go isn't. Come on. For that, Commander Keeley just kept his mouth shut, and didn't answer. Eventually, when Ragu saw that Dajer was already gone, he gave up, and followed Commander Keeley dejectedly. Dajer arrived at level 3 for the third time in a few hours, and saw something that looked simple, but for some reason he would remember that for the rest of his life. General D was facing Jabba the Hutt, who wasn't sleeping anymore. Their faces were centimeters away from each other. Despite that, the Hutt didn't try to call his guards or do anything. In fact, he hasn't spoken a word, neither tried to wake up the dozens of sleeping bounty hunters. The reason for that was the lightsaber that was between his and General D's face. The small eyes of the hut were squinted so hard that they were almost closed, and he was sweating profusely. It was possible to see the fear in his face. Dajer couldn't see General D's face because he had his back turned to him, but he appeared to be talking. Jabba's face twisted, and he used his worm-like tail to grab something behind him. When he presented it, General D used the force to pick up the lightsaber and put it on his belt. After that he said something else, and retreated slowly, always facing the hut. Chapter 97 General D watched the backs of the clones, and nodded to his padawan, who followed them reluctantly. To tell the truth, Imagun D was really worried about his padawan. The boy had just arrived, a fresh apprentice, but was kidnapped by some bounty hunters for reasons that were still unknown. His confidence had suffered a huge blow, and General D knew that if he didn't fix that, the young Padawan could, and would, lose all his fighting spirit and motivation. Because of that, 
When Ragu said he needed to get his lightsaber back, General D readily agreed. He understood how important a lightsaber was to a Jedi. Not the metal part of it, but the true soul and heart of the lightsaber, the kyber crystal, that was the important bit. A broken lightsaber could still be fixed or switched on the condition that the crystal was still intact. General D himself had lost a couple lightsabers during his life. But as the crystal was destroyed, a Jedi could never get another. The connection between a Jedi and his lightsaber was like that, if one side of it disappeared, the other also couldn't exist. A lightsaber was more than a weapon. It was the symbol of a Jedi, the proof that he deserved his position. During their training, the younglings built a strong link with their weapon, a link that couldn't be broken. If that happened, all the pain and sorrow that the crystal and its owner felt would be turned in a strong emotion, rage, hate, madness. That emotion would be driven to the crystal, and it would suffer as if it was a living creature. When the pain was too much, the crystal would either break or change colors. In the first case, the mind of the Jedi would break together with the crystal. In the last, the crystal would turn red, and the oldest enemies of the Jedis would be born. That was how Siths first came into being. So, General D couldn't let that happen to Ragu. Although most probably it wouldn't get to that point, he didn't want to risk anything. He walked slowly in the room, stepping lightly in the spaces between the sleeping pirates and bounty hunters. He saw the red-skinned pigman that captured Ragu leaning on a wall, many empty bottles around him. There was no sign of the woman or the droids, but the palace was big, and they could be anywhere. He didn't want to waste time on them. He soon arrived in front of the big, sleeping, fat figure in the bed. Jabba the Hutt was snoring loudly, mucus dripping from his nose and mouth. General D jumped over the sleeping Trelex, and came face to face with the crime lord. With a quiet, zoom, sound, his blue lightsaber flicked into existence, its tip only millimeters away from Jabba's face. Maybe it was the heat, maybe it was instinct, but the hut woke up without any help from General D. Without opening his small eyes, he used his long tongue to sweep up and swallow the mucus and leftover food on his face. Only after that did he open his eyes, and immediately closed then again when he saw the lightsaber. His lips parted open, about to call the guards when he heard General D's cold voice. You better not do anything. If your guards come, the first to suffer the consequences will be you. The hut froze, looking to the lightsaber, and then to the Jedi, and the lightsaber again. The tip of his tail twitched nervously, and his eyes showed rage. Shuru Woidio Yerik. Tuoit Harmadi Jedi, Wulo Asudi. Fatiwi. Enough. I do not speak your language, but I am sure you can understand mine. So listen carefully, Hut. My name is Imagun D, Jedi Master. The Padawan who you imprisoned was my Padawan. Now, Jabba, try to explain to me why a Hut Lord is kidnapping young Jedi. The Hut said something in his language, and when he saw that General D didn't understand him, he used his small arms to point to somewhere near him. When General D looked over, he saw a protocol droid similar to F5, PO88. No droids. Tell me why, now. The eyes of Jabba showed some internal struggle, but he apparently gave up, and started talking the common language with difficulty. Getro. I not speak well. Hugh Foz. I not know. Tori Jerdy. He was Jedi. Jagui. Bounty hunter bring him, say I. Durave Yuna. Say I pay good. General D didn't believe a word the hut was saying. But it was better to let things flow. He couldn't risk a conflict here. Then why didn't you contact the Republic immediately? I tried. Fura took Katya's. Sunstorm too. Strong. Have to wait. Got you. Well. Then, Jabba, I am sure you won't mind that I take my Padawan back with me. That will free you from a lot of bureaucracy. Yui. Of course. I send someone to get him. No need. Now, Jabba, give me his lightsaber. You don't want him to be ashamed for losing his weapon, right? A dangerous glint flashed in the hut's eyes. After some moments of careful consideration, 
he eventually gave the lightsaber to General D, who caught it using the Force. Before leaving he made sure to warn the Hutt about the consequences of capturing Jedis. Thank you, mighty Jabba. Before I take my leave, I think it is important that we make one thing clear. The Jedi Council won't allow this to happen again. So, when your bounty hunters bring their prey, make sure it is a good idea to accept it. I would hate to see you in such unfortunate circumstances again. Ignoring the rage on Jabba's face, General D retreated slowly, always with his lightsaber pointed to his opponent. Jabba could do nothing more than swear quietly. General D wasn't surprised to find danger waiting for him. He knew how the troops under him thought, and already expected something like that. So, he only nodded to Dager and started running. Not much later, both of them heard the angry screams of Jabba the Hutt, and started running faster. It wouldn't take long until the whole palace started chasing them. Chapter 98 After the small conversation that General D and the crime lord had, Dager suspected that the situation at hand would get heated pretty soon. His suspicions were confirmed when the Jedi just nodded at him and immediately started to run. Not much later, guttural screams could be heard from Jabba's chamber. In their way, General D explained his talk with Jabba quickly and concisely, never stopping running. There was something that he said that bothered Dager, but he wasn't able to pinpoint what it was. He was lost on his thoughts, but not enough that he wouldn't pay attention to their path. So, when a guard appeared, Dager instantly fired his pistol. Even though he was running, it was difficult to miss the large frame of the pigman, and his laser opened and cauterized a hole on the left leg of the guard. The guard fell down, screaming loud enough to startle the Blixus on Scarif. It was a sorry image, but Dager showed no mercy. When they passed by the guard, Dager fired a round in his forehead, stopping his pain once and for all. In Dager's mind, an enemy eliminated was an enemy less. Showing mercy to an enemy was the same as putting his brothers and himself in danger. His way of thinking was both unique and normal at the same time. Aside from clones, only pirates and bandits would be so merciless. It was unique because for most, wounded equals to out of the fight. To the clones, however, fighting despite injuries was just normal. It wasn't uncommon for a clone to die because he insisted on fighting with injuries that should have kept him to the bed. But his thinking was also normal because there were millions of clones in the galaxy that thought just like him. If anyone heard that, or saw what happened, they would call Dager crazy or murderer. General D's reaction wasn't that exaggerated, but he still frowned hard. Why did you do that? General? When we were in Mon Cala, before you were sent down, I told all the clones that you couldn't treat living beings the same you treat the separatists' droids. Remember? Dager remembered. Just before he and the two regiments from the 303rd were transported to Mon Cala, General D made a small speech. He said that the clankers from the CIS were one thing, but if they ever fought the Quarans, then they couldn't do what Dager just did. Of course he didn't tell the clones that they couldn't eliminate their enemies, otherwise he would have gone against all the fundamentals of a war. General, with all due respect, now is not the time to have pity. When you were going against the guards to rescue Ragu, you eliminated them because there was no other option, and because you needed to do that to rescue your Padawan. Now I am doing my mission, which is to make sure we get out of here safely. Subtly, Dager had thrown to General D the blame. Of course he didn't mean to do that in a bad way, but he felt, he knew, that with the Jedi tried to stop the clones from doing what they were created for, all their respect for him would be lost. In a way, Dager said what he said to show General D what attitude he should take. It was a very arrogant thing for a subordinate, or a soldier, or a clone to say, and Dager was making a gamble. Either the general would understand what he was saying, or he wouldn't and Dager would be heavily punished. His gamble paid off. Or so it seemed, because the Jedi said nothing else. Soon, they arrived at the hole that General D had cut, and found Brain waiting for them with half of his body stuck inside and the other half outside. Let's go. We already saw the guards at the front gate running in. It won't be long before they arrive. Dager and General D passed through the hole and saw Brain, Metal, Commander Keeley and Ragu waiting. 
With a single command from General D, the group started running towards the bounty hunters' ship. It was at that moment that things went really wrong. From the darkness of the sand dunes, five metal cables shot out, wrapping around the legs of Dajer, Brain, Commander Keeley and Ragu. One of them was aimed at General D, but he dodged just in time. However, the others who weren't so fast all fell face first in the rough sand of Tatooine. Deja rolled and spat the sand that entered his mouth. While looking carefully at the four figures approaching, he tried to untie the cables around his ankles. A feminine voice full of malice came out of the darkness. I wouldn't do that if I were you, sweetie. Deja ignored the woman and continued to untie the cables with one hand while holding his DC-17 on the other. Well, I warned you. Blue streaks zapped in the cable, coming out of the darkness all the way to Dajer. Instantly, he felt incredible pain, as electricity hit every part of his body starting from his legs. His body twisted, and he screamed in pain. After the woman turned off the power, Dajer was just barely conscious, everything on his body aching and his vision clouded. You, stop! Ragu, Brain and Metal yelled at the same time. General D turned on his lightsaber, and made a signal for the clones, ordering them to stay quiet. Rarara. Step by step, the curvy figure of a woman walked out of the dark, followed by three IG-88s and a Nikto, the same species as General D. Sweetheart, don't you know it is rude to ask that so bluntly? You will never find a woman interested in you, if you keep doing so. I have neither time nor will to joke with you, bounty hunter. I will ask again. Who are you, and why did you kidnap my Padawan? Now, you are not funny. Listen, Jedi. You wanted my name, Aura Singh it is. Now the reason why I captured your young Padawan. Rarara. Of course it is because of money. Chapter 99 Aura Singh was a famous bounty hunter, known by her cruelty and efficiency. For the years she had been around, she also received the unofficial nickname of Jedi Killer. Nobody knew why she was so focused on killing Jedis, but normally, if the job involved murdering one of the peacekeepers, she would accept without even asking about the payment. Aura had a personal reason for hating the Jedi so much. But more important than that, she found killing them especially enjoyable. When Dajer saw the bright orange clothes that she was wearing, his mind finally clicked. Before, when General D had told him about what happened inside Jabba's room, he felt that something was missing. That something was the bounty hunter. The protocol droid they met said there was no one on other rooms, and everyone had to be together with Jabba. So where was the bounty hunter? Now he knew. Even though his whole body was numb, his mind was still working. However, besides shooting, he couldn't think of any way to get out of their predicament. Meanwhile, General D and the bounty hunter were sizing up each other. Aura Singh, you already received your reward from that hut, didn't you? So why keep chasing us? Confronting a Jedi can only end badly for you, winning or losing. Rarara. You misunderstood me, Jedi. Jabba hired me to capture that youngling for a good sum of money, but after that my job with him was over. The reason why I am after you involves no money. It is completely personal. What have I done to you? Or is it not me, but the Jedi Order as a whole? Singh got deadly serious. Apparently General D had added salt to an injury, and her face was now full of hate. You are right, it is not just you but your kind. The powerful and invincible Jedi Knights, fighting for the freedom of the galaxy. You really fight well when the one who employs you is the Chancellor or the Hippocrates from the Senate. But when a little girl needed your help, not one of you moved to rescue her. The way that Singh said that sounded like she was telling a story about someone else, but Dajer felt the truth was different. He was quite sure the bounty hunter was talking about something that happened to her a long time ago, way before the clones were created. Aura, I understand your rage, but there are only 10,000 Jedis in the galaxy. We can't save everyone, but we do our best. Killing us will only make things worse for many other little girls just like yo. Just like the one on your story. In response to General D's pledge, Singh laughed. She and her droids approached, and Dajer saw General D make eye contact with Ragu. 
They seemed to have come to an understanding, but what could they do in this situation? Aura, if you don't stop now, I will have no other choice but bringing you to a Republic prison. General D made a motion of turning on his lightsaber, and at that instant everyone's attention was focused on his hand. Taking advantage of the millisecond that General D had bought to him, Ragu jumped high. Even with his legs tied, he still reached a height of five meters in the air, and at the same time did a backflip. The end of his stunt brought him just behind one of the IG-88 assassin droids. This droid was also the one who was holding the cables that tied him. Ragu landed on his feet, and used the force to push the droid five meters away, at the same time making him drop his weapons. General D then threw Ragu's lightsaber to him. The Padawan caught it in the air, and in a fluid motion turned it on, and cut the cables on his legs. It was the first time Dager saw Ragu's lightsaber. Different from General D, he had a pale green lightsaber, almost yellow or maybe white. It was also smaller than the one from his master, but it seemed to fit better with the small frame of Ragu. Having got his lightsaber back, Ragu jumped once more, not as high as before, but just enough so he could slice open the head of the nearest IG-88. You! Singh certainly didn't expect what happened, but she showed her instincts as a bounty hunter. She neither stood still, nor went after Ragu. What she did was press the cables, sending more electricity through it. Dager, Commander Keeley and Brain all started screaming in pain, and were out of the fight for good, or at least until they were cut free. Then, Singh turned to General D, and at the same time her partners, the Nikto and 2IG-88, faced Ragu. It was clearly a trained maneuver, and one they had executed many times. Amidst his pain, Dager thought why Aura Singh was with a Nikto and not the red-skinned pigman. The bounty hunter was firing her blaster wildly, but General D deflected each and every laser. He was able to do that against an army of droids, so one person wasn't difficult. He slowly approached her, and although Singh tried to run, she was surprised when Metal appeared behind her and held her arms. With a swift motion, General D cut the barrels of her pistols, and Metal kicked her at the back of her knee, making her grunt in pain and fall to the ground. When she got up, his lightsaber was at her neck. Almost at the same time there was a shout of pain. The Nikto that was fighting Ragu had dropped to the ground as well, his hands holding where previously it was his left leg. His two companions, the assassin droids, were pieces on the ground. Metal picked up the control on Singh's pocket and crushed it, freeing Dager and the others from the cables. The battle which had started with them as the losing side was turned around and won so quickly that Dager was surprised. When Ragu helped him up, Dager accepted gladly. The Padawan had won his respect, or at least a part of it. Chapter 100 Aura Singh, for your crimes against the Republic and the Jedi Order, you and your partner will be taken to jail. You will receive a fair trial. While turning off his lightsaber, General D uttered those words. Of course, all he received from Singh was a face full of disdain. While Brain, Dager and Commander Keeley were recovering, Metal chained Singh, who struggled a lot. Aside from Singh, the other bounty hunter behaved quite well. The fact that he was missing a leg might have something to do with that. Dager got up, his whole body numb. He rubbed his arms, trying to make the numbness go away, but it only got worse. Commander Keeley and Brain had done the same, and suffered a similar result. General D went to talk with his Padawan, and at the same time pushed the Nikto in the direction of Dager. Put them on the ship, and prepare to leave after this small battle it won't be long before Jabba's guards find us. Yes, sir. Dager half pushed half carried the Nikto, while Metal did the same to Aura Singh. Both bounty hunters grunted, but with their hands and foot tied, there was little they could do. Or so Dager thought. When they were a small distance away from the ship, Aura Singh's legs, which should have been firmly tied, somehow got free, and she arched her back and kicked Metal in the head. Metal wasn't wearing his helmet, so when the tough boots of Singh hit his head he got nauseous, and his vision doubled. Singh started running away, her hands still tied. Metal. Damn it. Dager pushed the Nikto to the ground, just in case he tried to run too, and chased after Singh. The long legs of the bounty hunter meant her steps took her farther, 
and Deja was still feeling the effects of being electrocuted. So when he saw Singh getting farther and farther away, what he did was stop and take out his DC-17. Singh! Stop or I will shoot. You asked for it. Deja first tried to convince her, but the answer he got was some hand gesture that probably meant no good. With no other option, and a little bit of pleasure, Deja aimed his pistol. His first shoot was evaded with a jump, even though Singh didn't look back to see from where it came. His second shot lifted the sand next to her feet. The third laser hit the target, and Singh fell to the ground holding her left calf. Now prepared to her tricks, Deja wasn't in a hurry to secure her again. Only after making sure she wasn't faking and that she had no weapons did he lift her up. Seeing the burning rage on the eyes of Singh, Deja couldn't help but question her. Why did you do that? You should have known that I would shoot you. Rarara. Little Cloney, my sweet, so you can talk, not only bark. He would have no answer from her. Noticing that, Deja gripped the back of her neck, and forced her to stay up, even though she grimaced in pain. Since the bounty hunter wasn't going to say anything important, Deja only had to do his job, and take her back. They weren't too far from the ship, and when the duo got back the clones were still loading the Nikto that Deja had left behind. Metal was sitting in the cargo ramp, using a piece of his old cloak to wrap his head. How bad is it, Metal? Nothing much sir. Just another tattoo, right? Good to see that you don't mind. Now, take her inside. She can't run anymore, but be careful anyway. She is a dangerous one. You bet I am. Rarararara. Yes, sir. Come on, bounty hunter. Brain, General D and Commander Keeley had already boarded the ship. The only ones still outside were Ragu and Dajer, who was waiting for the former. While the Padawan looked at Jabba's palace, Dajer just stood guard dutifully. Dajer, we are ready to go. General D said to you and General Ragu get in. All right, Commander. When Commander Keeley ringed Dajer, he went ahead and called the Padawan. General, General D says it is time to go. We would better get going. There is no need to call me General, Dajer. I did nothing to deserve that title. Let's go. Dajer followed Ragu to the inside, and soon the ramp closed and the ship got off. It was only when the two suns appeared in the sky that Jabba called off the pursuit. Deep Space General, I've been trying to contact the fleet, but the distance is too much. If they haven't moved from our last position, then we might be able to get a recorded message to them, but not a transmission. That is all we need. Thank you, Brain. Just doing my job. General D started recording the hologram, explaining what happened and where they should meet. Deja wasn't paying much attention, until General D said something totally unexpected in the last sentence. I will meet you at Sector 76. Commander Keeley also noticed it, as did Brain, who was in the command center of the ship. The one who stepped out to ask was obviously the one with the higher rank, Commander Keeley. General. Did you say Sector 76? If I am not wrong, that is almost in the inner ring. That area is entirely under Republic control. What will we do there? Keeley, how long have been since the 303rd was deployed? 102 days, General. We are approaching the four months mark. If you remember, that is when we are given a period of rest. General D was right. According to the decisions made by the Senate, if the Clone Wars were to last more than four months, then all the legions that took part on it since the first battle would have two weeks of rest before being thrown back in the battlefield. Meanwhile, new and fresh legions would step out to take their place. Of course, if they were in the middle of a battle they would have to wait, but luckily that wasn't the case for the 303rd. Chapter 101 Deja went to check on their captives, who were, at the moment, being guarded by metal, and Ragu was keeping him company. Their hijacked ship didn't have any kind of prison, or cell block, so they had to make do with what they had at hand, and locked Singh and the Nikto in the same storage room the clones had used. Metal was still using his dusty armor, and it was only when Dajer saw it that he realized that neither of the clones had cleaned theirs. He had to find a moment to wipe it, 
and also tell do others to do the same. Metal was also wearing his helmet, and his beloved Z-6 was leaning on the wall just beside him. It wasn't a blaster good for guard duty, as it took some time to charge, and it also didn't have stun mode, so Metal also had Brain's DC-15S with him. The clone made a salute to Dager when he passed, straightening his back. His head injury was probably still hurting pretty badly, but he didn't make a sound. Sitting on the floor, with his legs crossed and eyes closed was Regu. Since Commander Keeley had started calling him General, Dager and the others had followed suit. For the first few times Regu corrected them, but after noticing that it was useless, he only gave an exasperated look. It was the same now, when Dager greeted him. General. Are you sure you don't want to go rest? Metal and I can take care of that scum. I feel no need to sleep at the moment. In fact, staying here is quite good for my training. I don't get it, General. I'm training my senses. We Jedi have ways of sensing danger, and I feel an incredible amount of it from there. The Padawan stretched his index finger and pointed it to the storage room. When Dager approached the glass window, he saw the penetrating eyes of Aura Singh. She and the other bounty hunter were tied together, back to back, in the middle of the room. The Nikto was sleeping, and his leg, or what was left of it, was wrapped in bandages. After they got on the ship Brain had taken care of it under General D's orders, and given him some sleep drugs. Aura Singh, however, was awake, staring back at Dager with palpable hostility. After five seconds, Dager understood what Regu meant. He was sure that if the bounty hunter got her hands on any of them, she would eliminate them cruelly. Taking his eyes off Singh, Dager stood besides Metal, and told him and Ragu about the news. Their reactions were different. Metal was curious and happy, but Ragu looked pensive and disappointed. Dager noticed that, but it wasn't his place to say anything. And for you, bounty hunters, a nice little prison cell is your next stop. Dager couldn't help but taunt Singh. There was something about the woman that worried him. She was facing a lifelong jail time, and yet there were times she laughed and smiled. He wasn't sure if Singh heard him or not, but her stare intensified. The following two days passed in a blink. The group had stopped at some other planets to refuel, and were about to make the final jump to Sector 76. Dager was on guard duty himself. Usually, as an officer, he wouldn't need to do that, but they had a limited contingent, and metal and brain needed rest. Commander Keeley was the one controlling the ship, and although the Starcraft was small, Dager wasn't sure on where the Jedis were. Dager looked through the window, and saw both prisoners awake, and talking to each other. He didn't understand everything, but apparently they were discussing about a reward from one job. There was a slight tremor and Dager knew the ship was in hyperspace. He turned to look at one of the windows, but heard a noise behind him. Centimeters away from Dager's face was Aura Singh. She had somehow freed herself from her handcuffs, and smashed the door panel with it, opening the door. Dager wondered how the bounty hunter could release her ties over and over again, no matter how well they detained her. Singh grabbed Dager's head, and bashed her knee on his stomach. Dager felt something rising on his insides, and had to hold back not to throw up. But Singh wasn't over yet, and when Dager curled up her elbow crashed down on the back of his head, and his vision went dark. But even then Dager didn't give up. Since Singh had made him fall to the ground, Dager grabbed her ankles, and twisted it hard. You. Clone. Idiot. The wound on her calf opened again, and bright red blood started oozing out. Unable to bear the pain, Singh fell over Dager. He twisted his body, and they switched positions, now she was under him. Using both hands to grab her head, Dager bashed it in the ground, and when the bounty hunter got dizzy he locked his right arm around her neck, and his left on top of her head. Applying pressure, Dager could see Singh's face turning red and then acquiring a slight purple color. Her nails scratched his armor in his helmet, but she could do nothing more than that. Her legs were kicking the air to no avail, but her movement started to decrease until she turned stiff. Very slowly, Dager decreased the strength on his arms, so Singh wouldn't die, but he made sure to keep his lock on her firmly. It was only after confirming that she was unconscious that he remembered the Nikto. 
Looking over his shoulder, Dajer saw that the half-legless bounty hunter was up, rummaging through the boxes, looking for something to use against Dajer. Dajer let his left arm leave Singh's neck and pulled out his DC-17. Halt! This blaster doesn't have stun mode. Defeated, the Nikto dropped the power tool he was holding, and sat on the floor. Commander! Singh tried to escape. I restrained her, but I would appreciate some help. I am sending brain. Singh was still unconscious, but maybe this was a blessing for her. That way she didn't have to see the whole Republic fleet that was waiting for her. A group of ARC 170s flew near the ship. All of them were painted with the colors of the 303rd Attack Legion. General D, this is Steel Leader. We will escort you to the Sincerity. Is there anything we need to do? Hello, Rosal. Yes, please. Prepare a well-guarded cell. Chapter 102 The bounty hunters' ship wasn't small by any means, but when the doors on top of the Sincerity opened, and the ship passed through, the difference was quite big. Waiting for General D, Ragu, and the clones to disembark was a full platoon. General D hadn't really explained why Aura Singh needed so many guards, so Commander Keeley had to step up and expose her deeds. All in all, Singh had captured a Padawan, eliminated at least six clones and made two attempts to escape. Taking all of those in account, although it seemed like stupidity for her to try to run in a Republic cruiser, Dajer felt it was good to be prepared. The clones lined up at the sides, first saluting General D and his apprentice, then later Commander Keeley and Dajer. In the end, Aura Singh and her Nikto accomplice were pushed out of the ship by brain and metal, and received by the lieutenant in command of the platoon. Dajer, take Singh to the prison level, and then meet me at the command bridge. We have a report to make, and General D want to discuss about our time out. Yes, Commander. Lieutenant, let's go. Sir, permission to go to our quarters? Permission granted. Also, brain, metal, scrap that dirty out of your armor. Being followed by the lieutenant and ten clones, Dajer took the group through a maze of corridors that were well known to him. Unlike the time on the ship, Singh spent the entire course without saying a word. Dajer hoped that the truth, that she was going to prison for real, had found her way inside her mind. Or maybe it was just another one of the many personalities that the bounty hunter had. The prison cells if a Venator-class cruiser were very simple. A room with a bed and that was all the furniture. On one corner was the bathroom, which had transparent glass walls until the prisoners entered it, turning the walls in a dull gray for seven minutes. If the prisoner spent any more than that, or took any object that the scanners believed to be dangerous and prohibited, or tried to remove something, the walls would become transparent again, and a guard would be called for inspection. Under the watchful eyes of Dajer, Singh was put in one of such cells, and the orange ray shield sealed the entrance. General D had especially ordered that two guards should be guarding the cell at all times. The first thing Singh did after being locked was stare at Dajer, and say venomous words. Sweetheart, what is your name? I would like to remember the clone who arrested me. For when I come out. You won't come out. There is no need to know a clone's name. Dajer, Commander Keeley, Admiral Dow, General D and Ragu were having a meeting in the command bridge. Dajer had come here right after delivering Aura Singh, so he didn't have the time to clean himself or his armor. Commander Keeley was the same. After greeting the Admiral, who was livid for not being warned, Dajer rested his hands on the hologram table. The meeting was an informal one, and he didn't have to worry so much, but he still kept his posture. As usual, General D was the one to open the meeting. Our next stop will be on the heart of the Republic, the planet of Coruscant. The normal period of rest that a Legion receives is two weeks every four months, but due to the unexpected strength the Separatists showed, this period was cut in half. For all legions. Dajer let out an audible sigh. As a clone who passed every moment of his life side by side with his brothers, he knew the clone army was tired. Battle after battle had worn out even the most battle-thirsty of the men. For the last few months, we have fought in many corners of the galaxy. From Geonosis to Ren Var and Mon Kala, the 303rd won many battles, and lost many members. 
Keely, during this week we will receive new troops. I want you to organize them, and make sure they are ready when we depart. If what we have fought until now means anything, then we are likely to be thrown back in battle as soon as possible. Dager, you are, of course, to assist him. Admiral, I believe you would like to meet your family, right? Yes, that would be great, sir. Then just make sure to leave the fleet in good hands. Thank you, sir. Ragu, you and I will return to the Jedi Temple. After our last few days, I believe it is good for us both to train our senses. Master Yoda can help with that. Yes, Master. That is all, then. Keely, Dager, we will be arriving at Coruscant after another jump. After that, Singh will be handed to the Coruscant guards, and this matter will be officially out of our hands. Make the arrangements for the disembark. Dager, you are on it. Yes, Commander. Um. General, may I speak with you? Come over here. Dager followed General D to the end of the command bridge, from where they could see the blue and white streaks of light from hyperspace. What is it, Dager? General, I have heard some rumors and questions from not just one clone, but many of the men. And not only ours, but also from the scuba troopers on Mon Cala. I wanted to confirm with you. What kind of rumors? Well. Word is that the Republic Army is going to change. Since the Clone Wars is going to take much longer than previously expected, some officers are saying that a reorganization is going to happen. Just today Barrow talked to me about it. He asked if the legions are really going to change. Oh. I see it. I don't know who told the soldiers about it, but it is true. As a result of the previous battles, the Senate is voting a bill, and it is almost sure to be approved. From the moment the Senate agrees on it, a new kind of armor is going to be introduced to the clones. New recruits will come with it from Kamino, and for those soldiers who are already on the battlefield, the armor is going to be changed little by little. And. About the. Rest of the rumors. Chapter 103. What about. The other half of the rumors. What other half? It is quite weird. The officers were saying that each legion is going to receive an identity. That would be better discussed with Keeley, rather than me. He was directly involved in said rumors. Find him when you can. Now, Dager, if that is all, your men are waiting. Thank you, General. Unfortunately, Dager didn't have the chance to talk with Commander Keeley. The logistics of a disembark like the one they would do were almost as difficult and complex as the ones for an invasion. First of all, money. Clones didn't receive payment or salary, but all their expenses were covered by the Republic, within a certain range, of course. Dager had to make sure all the clones had what they needed. Obviously, when he said, he needed, he meant the officers under him needed. Advantages of being a sub-commander. Second and most important, Dager had to oversee the transfer of the wounded. The infirmary on the sincerity was as good as the one on a battleship could be, but it wasn't enough. They had limited supplies, so there were some moments after the more heated battles that the 303rd had to choose between leaving the minor wounds untreated or leave the severely wounded untreated. Minor wounds such as scratches or cuts wouldn't affect the overall strength of the clones or of the army, but Dager knew by experience how uncomfortable it was. Dager decided to see the injured personally. He couldn't go do something else without knowing how his brothers were. The fleet arrived above Coruscant without much fuss. Looking at the planet for the first time, Dager was as impressed as anyone else. Coruscant was a big planet, but even then, the capital of the Republic was turned into one massive city. There was no green or blue on the planet, only black, brown and orange. The lights could be seen from space no matter where you were, and the planet never slept. Coruscant was divided into many different levels, including the underground ones, where the scum of the city lived. Nevertheless, Dager wasn't expected to go there. The headquarters of the clone army was in one of the few unused areas of the planet, and every bar or entertainment center the clones needed was near there. As an officer, Dager knew the real reason why the soldiers were stationed away from the more bustling parts of the city. Four months had passed since the start of what the Senate first called a small and quickly solved conflict. 
Although there were no open riots yet, the higher-ups were worried that if clones were allowed to walk on the city freely, problems would arise. At start, most of the population, and senators, were siding with the Republic decision of waging war against the Separatist, and building a huge army of clones. But now some senators, mostly from the neutral factions, were inciting the population to speak against it. Taking that reason in consideration, right before the 303rd disembarked, Commander Keeley called for a speech. He and Dager stayed in front of the troopers, but in the end the only one to speak was Commander Keeley. 303rd Attack Legion, listen up. For the last four months, we have fought from one planet to another. Now, it is time to let our brothers from other legions step up for a while. You have one week, but remember to follow the rules. Any trooper who is found out of our headquarters will suffer punishment. There was an annoyed murmur between the clones. They weren't dumb, and didn't like being restricted to an area. But that wasn't what angered them the most. The reason for the murmur was the spam of their leave but discipline was ingrained in their genetic code, and the buzz was silenced by the officers in a few seconds. The Republic needs us, brothers. Stick to the rules, obey your officers, and before long we will be back on the battlefield. Am I clear? Commander Keeley turned around and started going down the big ramps that opened under the sincerity. Dager and Hell Squad made up half of the first line of troopers to set their foot on Coruscant. As he had decided before, Dager sent Hell Squad together with the main clone force, and followed the group that was going to the medical installations. The 303rd wasn't the only legion who had a hard time out in the galaxy. In the medical installations of Coruscant, thousands of clones from different legions filled up the dormitories and rooms. Dager even saw some familiar faces. Monk, for instance, and Commander Cody, both of which had just returned from battle. Monk was only accompanying his troops, but Commander Cody had a nasty wound on his face. He and the 212th were on some unnamed moon fighting the clankers when an ATE blew up and the shrapnel almost took his eye out. I am glad to see that you are okay, Commander Cody. Thanks, Dager. Keeley said you faced some problems with some bounty hunters. Commander Keeley was also there. But to tell the truth, it was General D and his Padawan who did most of the work. Most of the time me, the commander, brain and metal were just tagging along. Commander Cody just nodded. Clones had no need to be too humble between themselves, and Commander Cody knew that Dager wasn't giving his general all the credit out of humility. Well, commanders, I see you around. I need a good night of sleep to recover from all that dust of Tatooine. All right, Dager. I will have to stay here a bit more because of my injury. You should check out the Revanter. It is the best and only place for us while we are on leave I will see you there. Thanks for the advice, Commander. Commander Cody, Commander Monk. After saying his farewells to the clone commanders, Dager left the medical installations, but before anything, he went to the headquarters of the 303rd to have a bath. That was a luxury the clones didn't have in the middle of battles, and he had come all the way from Tatooine to Coruscant without stopping by his quarters. Chapter 104 Most of the clones felt the same way as Dager, and when he arrived at the barracks destined to the 303rd he saw most of his brothers sleeping. Only a few had gone to explore the surrounding bars, most of them being those who were idle before they arrived at Coruscant. After taking a much-deserved bath, Dager dropped at his bed without trading words with anyone. Maybe because he was too tired, that was the first time in months that he slept without having the usual nightmares. Dager woke up with Cell tapping his shoulder. Um. What is it? Wah. It took some time for him to fully wake up, but after washing his face he became smart enough to understand what Cell wanted. Sir, Hell Squad requesting permission to go to Revanter. You are in leave, Cell. Unless you are about to do something really stupid or really important, there is no need to request permission. But since you woke me, I will go too. That is good. Barrow and Frit already went there, and they say it is awesome. Besides, everything is on the Republic. There was one time when Dab and I were cadets that our squad got the chance to go to a bar during a visit to the moon of Kamino. We want to see how it is here. All right, all right. 
you are behaving like you are a cadet again. Cell laughed freely, not ashamed at all. After all, although they joked about it, they had been in life and death situations one after another. No matter how good they were, the chances of they dying on some random planet weren't small. I assume everyone is coming. Yeah. Then, Hell Squad, let's get going. There was a happy hurrah. Amongst Hell Squad, and they boarded a transport that would take them to the Revanter. They had all traded their armors for the loose brown cloths that represented the 303rd. Dager at first was in doubt between using his old, soldier rank clothes or the new, almost commander like clothes. In the end, he decided for the old ones. Clones had discipline on their blood, and if they knew he was an officer, they wouldn't fully enjoy themselves. The transport arrived quickly, and contrary to what Dager thought previously, what waited for them was a bustling area of the city. The majority of the people he saw were clones, but there were also Mon Calamarians, Trileks, Nyctos, Tigrutas, Celestians, and dozens of other alien species that Dager didn't recognize. The Revanter was pretty easy to find, and Hell Squad only had to follow the stream of clones. Many of the men of the 303rd Attack Legion were there, but Dager also recognized the uniforms of the Scuba Troopers, the 212th Attack Battalion, the 327th Star Corps and the 41st Elite Corps. Those were basically all the legions that were able to leave the battlefield that was the Outer Rim. Hell Squad also met a good number of Coruscant Guard Troopers, wearing their red-striped armor. As they approached the Revanter, the music got louder and louder, and the noise of laughs drifted towards them. Soon, Dajer saw clones carrying bottles and glasses, and some of them were so drunk they couldn't even walk normally. Dajer frowned when he saw some of the 303rd members amongst them. Sir, should I go? No need, brain. We are on leave, and the men are stressed. Just make sure none of them break the rules, or they will be dealt with as Commander Keeley said, all right? And I hope I don't see Hell Squad amidst them, or you will face my punishment. Okay, Cell. Why did you line me up, sir? Do I look like I would do something like that? I am more serious than Dab and 3-4. Cell put one arm around the shoulders of each of the clones he mentioned, and both 3-4 and Dab immediately pushed him, making him trip. Ha 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 ha. Okay, okay. Let's get something to eat and drink, boys. The inside of the bar was even bigger than Dager thought, easily able to accommodate hundreds of clones. Hell Squad went to the counter, and ordered a couple of drinks. Hey! A sharp voice called for Dager. When he looked up he saw a clone with no armor waving to him. It took a while for him to remember who he was. Dager grabbed his drink and nodded to Hell Squad, to indicate he was going. Lieutenant Thayer. I haven't seen you since Geonosis. Unless you move to the Coruscant Guard, it will be a while before we can meet again. After Geonosis I received a promotion, and I have been on Coruscant since then. Congratulations, then. Wow. That was one hell of a fight, wasn't it? It sure was. Now, come on. I want to introduce some brothers to you. Actually, my squad is over there. It is all right, they will do fine. And, I wasn't the only one to rise, was I? You should meet the other officers, Subcommander Dager. Okay then. Boys, behave yourselves while I'm away. I don't want General D complaining on my ear. Ye Ray. Dager shook his head. His words had passed straight by his men without they capturing a single one of them. But he couldn't complain, since he also wasn't being formal. If he was in duty, there was no way he could have said what he just said. He followed Fire to the so-called officer's room, a room upstairs where they could sit and talk. Meanwhile, Dager was thinking about how things had changed in just four months. When he first met Thayer, he was a lieutenant and Dager was just a soldier. But Thayer received his promotion to the Coruscant Guard, although his rank stayed the same, and Dager performed many meritorious deeds, enough for him to become a sub-commander. In a way, Thayer, who was out of the battles for a long time, was much safer than Dager, who fought in the front lines. But in another, unless Coruscant was attacked, Thayer would never have the chance to battle again. Throwing away the unnecessary thoughts in his head, 
Dajer passed through the door that Thyre had opened, and faced the twenty or so clones on the room. Chapter 105 There were about twenty clones inside the room. Since all of them were officers, that meant they represented the majority of the legions not on a battlefield at the moment. Thyre excitedly sat down, and immediately started talking with another clone before getting up again. He went to Dajer, and put his arm around his shoulder before talking. Brothers, this is Dajer, sub-commander of the 303rd Attack Legion and leader of Hell Squad. Dajer, Commander Monk said you already met. Dajer nodded to Monk, who was sitting on a couch at the far end of the room. Standing next to him was Sheeta, his sub-commander. Just like his commander, Sheeta was a quiet clone. Dajer didn't hear he speak more than a dozen words in Mon Kala. Dajer, this is Commander Gree, and Sub-Commander Philo from the 41st Elite Corps. They just came back from Felucia. This time the clones referred to were sitting near Dajer. Commander Gree had two strands of hair following a horizontal line on his head, and wore a dark green uniform. From what Dajer knew, the 41st Elite Corps was a legion trained to fight in the jungle and forest, so the color of their legion was also a deep dark green. Commander Gree wasn't alone, and aside from his sub-commander, he also had two other officers with him. Welcome, Dajer. It is a shame that Keeley can't be with us. I remember we used to be on the same block when we were cadets. I am sure Commander Keeley would like to be here, but General D left some orders for him, so. Keeley was always like that, always rushing to do what he could as soon as possible. He and General Imagun D are very alike, from what I heard. Well, don't let me interrupt you, Thyre, keep going. This is the fourth time I am hearing this introduction today. Ha ha ha. The last sentence was said in a way that only Dajer and the clones next to Commander Gree heard him. Unaware that his brothers were talking about him, Thyre kept on his excited mood. Over there are Commander Bly and his men, who have also just come from Felucia. He and Commander Gree have been there since the start of the war. How are you doing, Dajer? The 303rd moved a lot since Geonosis. I bet you got the chance to fight in quite a few different places. We sure did. It wasn't easy, though. The one who spoke amicably was the first clone with long hair that Dajer had ever met. The soldiers didn't usually choose such haircut, because it could be a bother in the battle. Commander Bly had tied his hair in a big chump above his head, so it probably stuck there when he put his helmet. Bly was the commander of the 327th Star Corps, another elite legion of the Grand Army of the Republic. Actually, most of the legions out in the galaxy, including the 303rd, were considered elite legions, at least for now. The reason for that was because they were the only legions with fighting experience. With more legions entering into play, many unknown factors would be added to that classification. After all that, Dajer had gotten to know not only the commanders presented above, but also a clone captain and a sergeant named Rex and Apple respectively. Both of them were from a new legion, called 501st. The legion was crossing the galaxy from one end, Kamino, to the other, Dantuin. Dajer also met the leading commander of the Coruscant Guard, a stern clone that went by the name Fox. After all presentations were up, the high-ranking commanders of the clone army all sat around a table, discussing battles, telling stories. They had all started the same, but fought different battles. Dajer discovered that he was, surprisingly, the one with the most experiences amongst them. Fox and Thyre had only fought on Geonosis, and then were moved to Coruscant. Rex and Apo were new, so they hadn't experienced any battle yet, and just listened through the entire night. Bly and Gree both entered in a lot of battles, but they were all on the same planet. Monk and the scuba troopers only fought in aquatic planets. The 303rd, on the other hand, was the legion that moved the most through the galaxy. They didn't have a fixed specialty, so the leaders of the Grand Army of the Republic basically directed them to where they were needed the most. Before Dajer noticed, many hours had passed, and the nightlife of Coruscant gave place to the workers of the early day. During the course of the night, the meeting had followed a sort of routine, starting with the battles and then remembering the brothers who had fallen. Every time that happened, there would be a moment of silence before someone changed the topic. 
It was in one of those moments that the reorganization of the army was brought up by none other than the newcomer Rex. Commander Fox, you are closer to the decisions of the Senate and of the Republic than we are, and will be. Before the 501st was deployed, Lama Su almost held us back. Something about a change in the army. Rex, you don't need to be so cautious here. Old boy Fox isn't actually the one who knows the most about such topic. It is the 41st Elite Corps commander that is most familiar with the rumors. Commander Bly answered the question that was left in the air, and at the same time pulled Commander Gree in the conversation. Bly, if you weren't going to answer the question, why push it to me? See? Even Fox is laughing. I think the only time I saw that happen was when we were cadets, and even now I am not sure if he wasn't sneezing. Burua. Ha 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 ha. The clones had gotten to know each other enough, and drank enough, that they laughed without restraint. Bly almost spilled his drink, and Dager had a hard time containing his laugh. And, also, don't act like you know nothing about that. You, I, Fox, Keeley, Bakara, Cody, Monk and Wolf were the ones that pushed this preposition forward. The 41st is only testing it first. Dager was lost. He knew what they were talking about, but many new details had been added at once. The commanders that Gree quoted were the most important of the Republic, and they all had moved together to convince the higher-ups.